Book Fourteen, Chapter Nineteen of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fourteen, Chapter Nineteen. What Russian, reading the account of the last part of the campaign of eighteen twelve, has not experienced an uncomfortable feeling of regret, dissatisfaction, and perplexity? Who has not asked himself how it is that the French were not all captured or destroyed when our three armies surrounded them in superior numbers, when the disordered French, hungry and freezing, surrendered in crowds, and when, as the historians relate, the aim of the Russians was to stop the French, to cut them off, and capture them all? How was it that the Russian army, which, when numerically weaker than the French had given battle at Borodino, did not achieve its purpose when it had surrounded the French on three sides, and when its aim was to capture them. Can the French be so enormously superior to us that when we had surrounded them with superior forces we could not beat them? How could that happen? History, or what is called by that name, replying to these questions says that this occurred because Kutuzov and Tormasov and Chichagov and this man and that man did not execute such and such maneuvers. But why did they not execute those maneuvers? And why if they were guilty of not carrying out a prearranged plan were they not tried and punished? But even if we admitted that Kutuzov, Chichagov and others were the cause of the Russian failures, it is still incomprehensible why, the position of the Russian army being what it was at Krasno and at the Berezina, in both cases we had superior forces. The French army, with its marshals, kings, and emperor, was not captured, if that was what the Russians aimed at. The explanation of this strange fact given by Russian military historians, to the effect that Kutuzov hindered an attack, is unfounded. For we know that we could not restrain the troops from attacking at Vyazma and Tarutino. Why was the Russian army, which with inferior forces had withstood the enemy in full strength at Borodino, defeated at Krasno and the Berezina by the disorganized crowds of the French when it was numerically superior? If the aim of the Russians consisted in cutting off and capturing Napoleon and his marshals, and that aim was not merely frustrated, but all attempts to attain it were most shamefully baffled, then this last period of the campaign is quite rightly considered by the French to be a series of victories, and quite wrongly considered victorious by Russian historians. The Russian military historians, in so far as they submit to claims of logic, must admit that conclusion, and in spite of their lyrical rhapsodies about valor, devotion, and so forth, must reluctantly admit that the French retreat from Moscow was a series of victories for Napoleon and defeats for Kutuzov. But putting national vanity entirely aside, one feels that such a conclusion involves a contradiction, since the series of French victories brought the French complete destruction, while the series of Russian defeats led to the total destruction of their enemy and the liberation of their country. The source of this contradiction lies in the fact that the historian studying the events from the letters of the sovereigns and the generals, from memoirs, reports, projects, and so forth, have attributed to this last period of the War of 1812 an aim that never existed, namely that of cutting off and capturing Napoleon with his marshals and his army. There never was or could have been such an aim, for it would have been senseless and its attainment quite impossible. It would have been senseless, first because Napoleon's disorganized army was flying from Russia with all possible speed that is to say, was doing just what every Russian desired. So what was the use of performing various operations on the French who were running away as fast as they possibly could? Secondly, it would have been senseless to block the passage of men whose whole energy was directed to flight. Thirdly, it would have been senseless to sacrifice one's own troops in order to destroy the French army which, without external interference, was destroying itself at such a rate that though its path was not blocked, it could not carry across the frontier more than it actually did in December, namely a hundredth part of the original army. Fourthly, it would have been senseless to wish to take captive the emperor, kings, and dukes, 
whose capture would have been in the highest degree embarrassing for the Russians, as the most adroit diplomatists of the time, Joseph de Maitre and others, recognized. Still more senseless would have been the wish to capture army corps of the French, when our own army had melted away to half before reaching Krasno, and a whole division would have been needed to convoy the corps of prisoners, and when our men were not always getting full rations, and the prisoners already taken were perishing of hunger. All the profound plans about cutting off and capturing Napoleon and his army were like the plan of a market gardener, who, when driving out of his garden a cow that had trampled down the beds he had planted, should run to the gate and hit the cow on the head. The only thing to be said in excuse of that gardener would be that he was very angry. But not even that could be said for those who drew up this project, for it was not they who had suffered from the trampled beds. But besides the fact that cutting off Napoleon with his army would have been senseless, it was impossible. It was impossible, first because, as experience shows that a three-mile movement of columns on a battlefield never coincides with the plans, the probability of Chichagov, Kutuzov, and Wittgenstein effecting a junction on time at an appointed place was so remote as to be tantamount to impossibility, as in fact thought Kutuzov, who, when he received the plan, remarked that diversions planned over great distances do not yield the desired results. Secondly, it was impossible, because to paralyze the momentum with which Napoleon's army was retiring, incomparably greater forces than the Russians possessed would have been required. Thirdly, it was impossible, because the military term to cut off has no meaning. One can cut off a slice of bread, but not an army. To cut off an army, to bar its road, is quite impossible, for there is always plenty of room to avoid capture, and there is the night when nothing can be seen, as the military scientists might convince themselves by the example of Krasno and of the Berezina. It is only possible to capture prisoners if they agree to be captured, just as it is only possible to catch a swallow if it settles on one's hand. Men can only be taken prisoners if they surrender according to the rules of strategy and tactics, as the Germans did. But the French troops quite rightly did not consider that this suited them, since death by hunger and cold awaited them in flight or captivity alike. Fourthly, and chiefly, it was impossible, because never since the world began has a war been fought under such conditions as those that obtained in 1812, and the Russian army, in its pursuit of the French, strained its strength to the utmost and could not have done more without destroying itself. During the movement of the Russian army from Tarantino to Krasno, it lost fifty thousand sick or stragglers, that is, a number equal to the population of a large provincial town. Half the men fell out of the army without a battle. And it is of this period of the campaign, when the army lacked boots and sheepskin coats, was short of provisions and without vodka, and was camping out at night for months in the snow with fifteen degrees of frost, when there were only seven or eight hours of daylight and the rest was night in which the influence of discipline cannot be maintained, when men were taken into that region of death where discipline fails, not for a few hours only as in a battle, but for months where they were every moment fighting death from hunger and cold, when half the army perished in a single month. It is of this period of the campaign that the historians tell us how Milorodovich should have made a flank march to such and such a place, Tormasov to another place, and Chichagov should have crossed, more than knee-deep in snow, to somewhere else, and how so-and-so routed and cut off the French, and so on and so on. The Russians, half of whom died, did all that could and should have been done to attain an end worthy of the nation, and they were not to blame because other Russians, sitting in warm rooms, proposed that they should do what was impossible. All that strange contradiction, now difficult to understand, between the facts and the historical accounts, only arises because the historians dealing with the matter have written the history of the beautiful words and sentiments of various generals, and not the history of the events. To them the words of Milorodovich seem very interesting, and so do their surmises and the rewards this or that general received. But the question of those fifty thousand men who were left in hospitals and in graves does not even interest them, for it does not come within the range of their investigation. 
Yet one need only discard the study of the reports and general plans, and consider the movement of those hundreds of thousands of men who took a direct part in the events, and all the questions that seemed insoluble easily and simply receive an immediate and certain solution. The aim of cutting off Napoleon and his army never existed except in the imaginations of a dozen people. It could not exist because it was senseless and unattainable. The people had a single aim, to free their land from invasion. That aim was attained in the first place of itself, as the French ran away, and so it was only necessary not to stop their flight. Secondly, it was attained by the guerrilla warfare which was destroying the French, and thirdly, by the fact that a large Russian army was following the French, ready to use its strength in case their movement stopped. The Russian army had to act like a whip to a running animal, and the experienced driver knew it was better to hold the whip raised as a menace than to strike the running animal on the head. End of Book 14, Chapter 19book 15 chapter 1 of war and peace volume 4 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 15 1812 13 chapter 1 when seeing a dying animal a man feels a sense of horror substance similar to his own is perishing before his eyes but when it is a beloved and intimate human being that is dying, besides this horror at the extinction of life, there is a severance, a spiritual wound, which, like a physical wound, is sometimes fatal and sometimes heals, but always aches and shrinks at any external irritating touch. After Prince Andrew's death, Natasha and Princess Mary alike felt this. Drooping in spirit and closing their eyes before the menacing cloud of death that overhung them, they dared not look life in the face. They carefully guarded their open wounds from any rough and painful contact. Everything—a carriage passing rapidly in the street, a summons to dinner, the maid's inquiry what dress to prepare, or worse still, any word of insincere or feeble sympathy, seemed an insult, painfully irritated the wound, interrupted that necessary quiet in which they both tried to listen to the stern and dreadful choir that still resounded in their imagination, and hindered their gazing into those mysterious limitless vistas that for an instant had opened out before them. Only when alone together were they free from such outrage and pain. They spoke little even to one another, and when they did it was of very unimportant matters. Both avoided any allusion to the future. To admit the possibility of a future seemed to them to insult his memory. Still more carefully did they avoid anything relating to him who was dead. It seemed to them that what they had lived through and experienced could not be expressed in words, and that any reference to the details of his life infringed the majesty and sacredness of the mystery that had been accomplished before their eyes. Continued abstention from speech and constant avoidance of everything that might lead up to the subject, this halting on all sides at the boundary of what they might not mention, brought before their minds with still greater purity and clearness what they were both feeling. But pure and complete sorrow is as impossible as pure and complete joy. Princess Mary, in her position as absolute and independent arbiter of her own fate, and guardian and instructor of her nephew, was the first to be called back to life from that realm of sorrow in which she had dwelt for the first fortnight. She received letters from her relations to which she had to reply. The room in which little Nicholas had been put was damp and he began to cough. Alpatich came to Yaroslavl with reports on the state of their affairs, and with advice and suggestions that they should return to Moscow to the house on Vojevenka Street, which had remained uninjured and needed only slight repairs. Life did not stand still, and it was necessary to live. Hard as it was for Princess Mary to emerge from the realm of secluded contemplation in which she had lived till then, and sorry and almost ashamed as she felt to leave Natasha alone, yet the cares of life demanded her attention, and she involuntarily yielded to them. 
she went through the accounts with Alpatich, conferred with de Salle about her nephew, and gave orders and made preparations for the journey to Moscow. Natasha remained alone, and from the time Princess Mary began making preparations for departure, held aloof from her too. Princess Mary asked the Countess to let Natasha go with her to Moscow, and both parents gladly accepted this offer, for they saw their daughter losing strength every day, and thought that a change of scene and the advice of Moscow doctors would be good for her. "'I am not going anywhere,' Natasha replied when this was proposed to her. "'Do please just leave me alone,' and she ran out of the room, with difficulty refraining from tears of vexation and irritation rather than of sorrow. After she felt herself deserted by Princess Mary and alone in her grief, Natasha spent most of the time in her room by herself, sitting huddled up, feet and all, in the corner of the sofa, tearing and twisting something with her slender, nervous fingers, and gazing intently and fixedly at whatever her eyes chanced to fall on. This solitude exhausted and tormented her, but she was in absolute need of it. As soon as anyone entered, she got up quickly, changed her position and expression, and picked up a book or some sewing, evidently waiting impatiently for the intruder to go. She felt all the time as if she might at any moment penetrate that on which, with a terrible questioning too great for her strength, her spiritual gaze was fixed. One day toward the end of December, Natasha, pale and thin, dressed in a black woolen gown, her plaited hair negligently twisted into a knot, was crouched feet and all in the corner of her sofa, nervously crumpling and smoothing out the end of her sash while she looked at a corner of the door. She was gazing in the direction in which she had gone, to the other side of life, and that other side of life in which she had never before thought and which had formerly seemed to her so far away and improbable, was now nearer and more akin and more comprehensible than this side of life, where everything was either emptiness and desolation or suffering and indignity. She was gazing where she knew him to be, but she could not imagine him otherwise than as he had been there. She now saw him again as he had been at Metisci, at Troitsa, and at Yaroslavl. She saw his face, heard his voice, repeated his words and her own, and sometimes devised other words they might have spoken. There he is lying back in an armchair in his velvet cloak, leaning his head on his thin pale hand. His chest is dreadfully hollow and his shoulders raised. His lips are firmly closed, his eyes glitter, and a wrinkle comes and goes on his pale forehead. One of his legs twitches just perceptibly but rapidly. Natasha knows that he is struggling with terrible pain. What is that pain like? Why does he have that pain? What does he feel? How does it hurt him? thought Natasha. He noticed her watching him, raised his eyes, and began to speak seriously. One thing would be terrible, said he, to bind oneself forever to a suffering man. It would be continual torture. And he looked searchingly at her. Natasha, as usual, answered before she had time to think what she would say. She said, This can't go on. It won't. You will get well, quite well. She now saw him from the commencement of that scene, and relived what she had then felt. She recalled his long, sad, and severe look at those words, and understood the meaning of the rebuke and despair in that protracted gaze. I agreed, Natasha now said to herself, that it would be dreadful if he always continued to suffer. I said it then only because it would have been dreadful for him, but he understood it differently. He thought it would be dreadful for me. He then still wished to live and feared death and I said it so awkwardly and stupidly, I did not say what I meant. I thought quite differently. Had I said what I thought, I should have said, even if he had to go on dying, to die continually before my eyes, I should have been happy compared with what I am now. Now there is nothing, nobody. Did he know that? No, he did not and never will know it and now it will never, never be possible to put it right." And now he again seemed to be saying the same words to her, 
Only in her imagination Natasha this time gave him a different answer. She stopped him and said, "'Terrible for you, but not for me. You know that for me there is nothing in life but you, and to suffer with you is the greatest happiness for me.' and he took her hand and pressed it as he had pressed it that terrible evening four days before his death. And in her imagination she said other tender and loving words which she might have said then but only now spoke. "'I love thee, thee, I love, love,' she said, convulsively pressing her hands and setting her teeth with a desperate effort. She was overcome by sweet sorrow and tears were already rising in her eyes. Then she suddenly asked herself to whom she was saying this. Again everything was shrouded in hard, dry perplexity, and again with a strained frown she peered toward the world where he was. And now, now it seemed to her she was penetrating the mystery. But at the instant when it seemed that the incomprehensible was revealing itself to her, a loud rattle of the door-handle struck painfully on her ears. Dunyasha, her maid, entered the room quickly and abruptly with a frightened look on her face and showing no concern for her mistress. "'Come to your papa at once, please,' said she with a strange, excited look. "'A misfortune. About Peter Ilinich. A letter,' she finished with a sob. End of Book Fifteen Chapter One Book Fifteen, Chapter Two, of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fifteen, Chapter Two. Besides a feeling of aloofness from everybody, Natasha was feeling a special estrangement from the members of her own family. All of them. Her father, mother, and Sonia were so near to her, so familiar, so commonplace, that all their words and feelings seemed an insult to the world in which she had been living of late, and she felt not merely indifferent to them, but regarded them with hostility. She heard Dunyasha's words about Peter Ilinich and a misfortune, but did not grasp them. "'What misfortune? What misfortune can happen to them? They just live their own old, quiet and commonplace life.' thought Natasha. As she entered the ballroom her father was hurriedly coming out of her mother's room. His face was puckered up and wet with tears. He had evidently run out of that room to give vent to the sobs that were choking him. When he saw Natasha he waved his arms despairingly and burst into convulsively painful sobs that distorted his soft round face. Pe Petya! Go! Go! She is calling! and weeping like a child and quickly shuffling on his feeble legs to a chair, he almost fell into it, covering his face with his hands. Suddenly an electric shock seemed to run through Natasha's whole being. Terrible anguish struck her heart. She felt a dreadful ache as if something was being torn inside her and she were dying. But the pain was immediately followed by a feeling of release from the oppressive constraint that had prevented her taking part in life. The sight of her father, the terribly wild cries of her mother that she heard through the door, made her immediately forget herself and her own grief. She ran to her father, but he feebly waved his arm, pointing to her mother's door. Princess Mary, pale and with quivering chin, came out from that room and taking Natasha by the arm said something to her. Natasha neither saw nor heard her. She went in with rapid steps, pausing at the door for an instant as if struggling with herself, and then ran to her mother. The Countess was lying in an armchair, in a strange and awkward position, stretching out and beating her head against the wall. Sonia and the maids were holding her arms. "'Natasha! Natasha!' cried the Countess. "'It's not true! It's not true! He's lying! Natasha!' she shrieked, pushing those around her away. Go away, all of you! It's not true! Killed! Ha, ha, ha! It's not true!" Natasha put one knee on the armchair, stooped over her mother, embraced her, and with unexpected strength raised her, turned her face toward herself, and clung to her. "'Mummy! Darling! I am here, my dearest mummy!' 
she kept on whispering, not pausing an instant. She did not let go of her mother, but struggled tenderly with her, demanded a pillow and hot water, and unfastened and tore open her mother's dress. "'My dearest darling! Mummy! My precious!' She whispered incessantly, kissing her head, her hands, her face, and feeling her own irrepressible and streaming tears tickling her nose and cheeks. The Countess pressed her daughter's hand, closed her eyes, and became quiet for a moment. Suddenly she sat up with unaccustomed swiftness, glanced vacantly around her, and seeing Natasha, began to press her daughter's head with all her strength. Then she turned toward her daughter's face, which was wincing with pain, and gazed long at it. "'Natasha, you love me,' she said in a soft, trustful whisper. "'Natasha, you would not deceive me. You'll tell me the whole truth.' Natasha looked at her with eyes full of tears, and in her look there was nothing but love and an entreaty for forgiveness. "'My darling mummy,' she repeated, straining all the power of her love to find some way of taking on herself the excess of grief that crushed her mother. And again, in a futile struggle with reality, her mother, refusing to believe that she could live when her beloved boy was killed in the bloom of life, escaped from reality into a world of delirium. Natasha could not remember how that day passed, nor that night, nor the next day and night. She did not sleep and did not leave her mother. Her persevering and patient love seemed completely to surround the Countess every moment, not explaining or consoling, but recalling her to life. During the third night the Countess kept very quiet for a few minutes and Natasha rested her head on the arm of her chair and closed her eyes, but opened them again on hearing the bedstead creak. The Countess was sitting up in bed and speaking softly. "'How glad I am you have come. You are tired. Won't you have some tea?' Natasha went up to her. "'You have improved in looks and grown more manly,' continued the Countess, taking her daughter's hand. Mama. What are you saying? Natasha, he is no more, no more." And embracing her daughter, the Countess began to weep for the first time. End of Book Fifteen, Chapter Two Book Fifteen, Chapter Three of War and Peace, Volume Four by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Omer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 15, Chapter 3 Princess Mary postponed her departure. Sonia and the Count tried to replace Natasha, but could not. They saw that she alone was able to restrain her mother from unreasoning despair. For three weeks Natasha remained constantly at her mother's side, sleeping on a lounge chair in her room making her eat and drink, and talking to her incessantly because the mere sound of her tender, caressing tones soothed her mother. The mother's wounded spirit could not heal. Petya's death had torn from her half her life. When the news of Petya's death had come, she had been a fresh and vigorous woman of fifty, but a month later she left her room a listless old woman taking no interest in life. But the same blow that almost killed the Countess the second blow restored Natasha to life. A spiritual wound produced by a rending of the spiritual body is like a physical wound, and strange as it may seem, just as a deep wound may heal and its edges join, physical and spiritual wounds alike can yet heal completely only as the result of a vital force from within. Natasha's wound healed in that way. She thought her life was ended but her love for her mother unexpectedly showed her that the essence of life, love, was still active within her. Love awoke, and so did life. Prince Andrew's last days had bound Princess Mary and Natasha together. This new sorrow brought them still closer to one another. Princess Mary put off her departure, and for three weeks looked after Natasha as if she had been a sick child. The last weeks passed in her mother's bedroom had strained Natasha's physical strength. One afternoon, noticing Natasha shivering with fever, 
Princess Mary took her to her own room and made her lie down on the bed. Natasha lay down, but when Princess Mary had drawn the blinds and was going away, she called her back. "'I don't want to sleep, Mary. Sit by me a little. You are tired. Try to sleep. No, no. Why did you bring me away? She will be asking for me. She is much better. She spoke so well today,' said Princess Mary. Natasha lay on the bed, and in the semi-darkness of the room scanned Princess Mary's face. "'Is she like him?' thought Natasha. "'Yes, like and yet not alike. But she is quite original, strange, new and unknown. And she loves me. What is in her heart? All that is good. But how? What is her mind like? What does she think about me? Yes, she is splendid. Mary, she said timidly, drawing Princess Mary's hand to herself, Mary, you mustn't think me wicked. No, Mary, darling, how I love you. Let us be quite, quite friends. And Natasha, embracing her, began kissing her face and hands, making Princess Mary feel shy but happy by this demonstration of her feelings. From that day a tender and passionate friendship, such as exists only between women, was established between Princess Mary and Natasha. They were continually kissing and saying tender things to one another, and spent most of their time together. When one went out the other became restless and hastened to rejoin her. Together they felt more in harmony with one another than either of them felt with herself when alone. A feeling stronger than friendship sprang up between them an exclusive feeling of life being possible only in each other's presence. Sometimes they were silent for hours. Sometimes, after they were already in bed, they would begin talking and go on till morning. They spoke most of what was long past. Princess Mary spoke of her childhood, of her mother, her father, and her daydreams. And Natasha, who, with a passive lack of understanding, had formerly turned away from that life of devotion, submission, and the poetry of Christian self-sacrifice, now feeling herself bound to Princess Mary by affection, learned to love her past too, and to understand a side of life previously incomprehensible to her. She did not think of applying submission and self-abnegation to her own life, for she was accustomed to seek other joys but she understood and loved in another those previously incomprehensible virtues. For Princess Mary, listening to Natasha's tales of childhood and early youth, there also opened out a new and hitherto uncomprehended side of life, belief in life and its enjoyment. Just as before, they never mentioned him so as not to lower, as they thought, their exalted feelings by words but this silence about him had the effect of making them gradually begin to forget him without being conscious of it. Natasha had grown thin and pale and physically so weak that they all talked about her health and this pleased her. But sometimes she was suddenly overcome by fear, not only of death but of sickness, weakness, and loss of good looks, and involuntarily she examined her bare arm carefully, surprised at its thinness, and in the morning noticed her drawn and, as it seemed to her, piteous face in her glass. It seemed to her that things must be so, and yet it was dreadfully sad. One day she went quickly upstairs and found herself out of breath. Unconsciously she immediately invented a reason for going down, and then, testing her strength, ran upstairs again, observing the result. Another time, when she called Dunyasha, her voice trembled, so she called again, though she could hear Dunyasha coming, called her in the deep chest tones in which she had been wont to sing, and listened attentively to herself. She did not know, and would not have believed it, but beneath the layer of slime that covered her soul and seemed to her impenetrable, delicate young shoots of grass were already sprouting which, taking root, would so cover with their living verdure the grief that weighed her down, that it would soon no longer be seen or noticed. The wound had begun to heal from within. At the end of January Princess Mary left for Moscow, and the Count insisted on Natasha's going with her to consult the doctors. 
End of Book 15, Chapter 3《Book Fifteen, Chapter Four, of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Book Fifteen, Chapter Four After the encounter at Vyazma, where Kutuzov had been unable to hold back his troops in their anxiety to overwhelm and cut off the enemy, and so on, the farther movement of the fleeing French and of the Russians who pursued them, continued as far as Krasno without a battle. The flight was so rapid that the Russian army pursuing the French could not keep up with them. Cavalry and artillery horses broke down, and the information received of the movements of the French was never reliable. The men in the Russian army were so worn out by this continuous marching at the rate of twenty-seven miles a day that they could not go any faster. To realize the degree of exhaustion of the Russian army, it is only necessary to grasp clearly the meaning of the fact that, while not losing more than five thousand killed and wounded after Tarotino, and less than a hundred prisoners, the Russian army which left that place a hundred thousand strong reached Krasno with only fifty thousand. The rapidity of the Russian pursuit was just as destructive to our army as the flight of the French was to theirs. The only difference was that the Russian army moved voluntarily, with no such threat of destruction as hung over the French, and that the sick Frenchmen were left behind in enemy hands while the sick Russians left behind were among their own people. The chief cause of the wastage of Napoleon's army was the rapidity of its movement, and a convincing proof of this is the corresponding decrease of the Russian army. Kutuzov, as far as was in his power, Instead of trying to check the movement of the French as was desired in Petersburg and by the Russian army generals, directed his whole activity here, as he had done at Tarotino and Vyazma, to hastening it on while easing the movement of our army. But besides this, since the exhaustion and enormous diminution of the army caused by the rapidity of the advance had become evident, another reason for slackening the pace and delaying presented itself to Kutuzov. The aim of the Russian army was to pursue the French. The road the French would take was unknown, and so the closer our troops trod on their heels the greater distance they had to cover. Only by following at some distance could one cut across the zigzag path of the French. All the artful maneuvers suggested by our generals meant fresh movements of the army and a lengthening of its marches, whereas the only reasonable aim was to shorten those marches. To that end, Kutuzov's activity was directed during the whole campaign from Moscow to Vilna, not casually or intermittently, but so consistently that he never once deviated from it. Kutuzov felt and knew, not by reasoning or science, but with the whole of his Russian being, what every Russian soldier felt, that the French were beaten, that the enemy was flying, and must be driven out. But at the same time, he, like the soldiers, realized all the hardship of this march, the rapidity of which was unparalleled for such a time of the year. But to the generals, especially the foreign ones in the Russian army, who wished to distinguish themselves, to astonish somebody, and for some reason to capture a king or a duke, it seemed that now, when any battle must be horrible and senseless, was the very time to fight and conquer somebody. Kutuzov merely shrugged his shoulders when one after another they presented projects of maneuvers to be made with those soldiers, ill-shod, insufficiently clad, and half-starved, who within a month and without fighting a battle had dwindled to half their number, and who at the best if the flight continued would have to go a greater distance than they had already traversed, before they reached the frontier. This longing to distinguish themselves, to maneuver, to overthrow, and to cut off showed itself particularly whenever the Russians stumbled on the French army. So it was at Krasno, where they expected to find one of three French columns, and stumbled instead on Napoleon himself with sixteen thousand men. Despite all Kutuzov's efforts to avoid that ruinous encounter and to preserve his troops, the massacre of the broken mob of French soldiers by worn-out Russians continued at Krasno for three days. 
Toll wrote a disposition. The first column will march to so-and-so, etc. And as usual, nothing happened in accord with the disposition. Prince Eugène of Württemberg fired from a hill over the French crowds that were running past, and demanded reinforcements which did not arrive. The French, avoiding the Russians, dispersed and hid themselves in the forest by night, making their way round as best they could, and continued their flight. Miloradovich, who said he did not want to know anything about the commissariat affairs of his detachment, and could never be found when he was wanted, that chevalier sans pieu à sans reproach, knight without fear and without reproach, as he styled himself, who was fond of parties with the French, sent envoys demanding their surrender, wasted time, and did not do what he was ordered to do. "'I give you that column, lads,' he said, riding up to the troops and pointing out the French to the cavalry. And the cavalry, with spurs and sabres urging on horses that could scarcely move, trotted with much effort to the column presented to them, that is to say, to a crowd of Frenchmen, stark with cold, frost-bitten and starving, and the column that had been presented to them threw down its arms and surrendered as it had long been anxious to do. At Krasno they took twenty-six thousand prisoners, several hundred cannon, and a stick called a marshal staff, and disputed as to who had distinguished himself and were pleased with their achievement, though they much regretted not having taken Napoleon, or at least a marshal or a hero of some sort, and reproached one another and especially Kutuzov for having failed to do so. These men, carried away by their passions, were but blind tools of the most melancholy law of necessity, but considered themselves heroes and imagined that they were accomplishing a most noble and honorable deed. They blamed Kutuzov and said that from the very beginning of the campaign he had prevented their vanquishing Napoleon, that he thought of nothing but satisfying his passions and would not advance from the linen factories because he was comfortable there, that at Krasno he checked the advance because on learning that Napoleon was there he had quite lost his head, and that it was probable that he had an understanding with Napoleon and had been bribed by him and so on and so on. Not only did his contemporaries, carried away by their passions, talk in this way, but posterity and history have acclaimed Napoleon as grand, while Kutuzov is described by foreigners as a crafty, dissolute, weak old courtier, and by Russians as something indefinite, a sort of puppet useful only because he had a Russian name. End of Book 15, Chapter 4《Book Fifteen, Chapter Five, of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Book Fifteen, Chapter Five. In eighteen twelve and eighteen thirteen, Kutuzov was openly accused of blundering. The Emperor was dissatisfied with him and in a history recently written by order of the highest authorities, it is said that Kutuzov was a cunning court liar, frightened of the name of Napoleon, and that by his blunders at Krasno and the Berezina he deprived the Russian army of the glory of complete victory over the French. History of the Year 1812 The Character of Kutuzov and Reflections on the Unsatisfactory Results of the Battles of Krasno by Bogdanovich such is the fate not of great men, grand homme, whom the Russian mind does not acknowledge, but of those rare and always solitary individuals, who, discerning the will of Providence, submit their personal will to it. The hatred and contempt of the crowd punish such men for discerning the higher laws. For Russian historians, strange and terrible to say, Napoleon, that most insignificant tool of history who never anywhere, even in exile, showed human dignity. Napoleon is the object of adulation and enthusiasm. He is grand. But Kutuzov, the man who, from the beginning to the end of his activity in 1812, never once swerving by word or deed from Borodino to Vilna, presented an example exceptional in history of self-sacrifice, and a present consciousness of the future importance of what was happening, 
Kutuzov seems to them something indefinite and pitiful, and when speaking of him and of the year 1812 they always seem a little ashamed. And yet it is difficult to imagine an historical character whose activity was so unswervingly directed to a single aim, and it would be difficult to imagine any aim more worthy or more consonant with the will of the whole people. Still more difficult would it be to find an instance in the history of the aim of an historical personage being so completely accomplished as that to which all Kutuzov's efforts were directed in 1812. Kutuzov never talked of forty centuries looking down from the pyramids, of the sacrifices he offered for the fatherland, or of what he intended to accomplish or had accomplished. In general he said nothing about himself adopted no pose, always appeared to be the simplest and most ordinary of men, and said the simplest and most ordinary things. He wrote letters to his daughters and to Madame de Stael, read novels, liked the society of pretty women, jested with generals, officers, and soldiers, and never contradicted those who tried to prove anything to him. When Count Rostopchin at the Yuza Bridge galloped up to Kutuzov with personal reproaches for having caused the destruction of Moscow, and said, "'How was it you promised not to abandon Moscow without a battle?' Kutuzov replied, "'And I shall not abandon Moscow without a battle,' though Moscow was then already abandoned. When Erekcheyev, coming to him from the Emperor, said that Romolov ought to be appointed chief of the artillery, Kutuzov replied, "'Yes. I was just saying so myself, though a moment before he had said quite the contrary. What did it matter to him, who then alone amid a senseless crowd understood the whole tremendous significance of what was happening, what did it matter to him whether Rostopchin attributed the calamities of Moscow to him or to himself? Still less could it matter to him who was appointed chief of the artillery. Not merely in these cases, but continually, did that old man, who by experience of life had reached the conviction that thoughts and the words serving as their expression are not what move people, use quite meaningless words that happen to enter his head. But that man, so heedless of his words, did not once during the whole time of his activity utter one word inconsistent with the single aim toward which he moved throughout the whole war. Obviously, in spite of himself, in very diverse circumstances, he repeatedly expressed his real thoughts with the bitter conviction that he would not be understood. Beginning with the Battle of Borodino, from which time his disagreement with those about him began, he alone said that the Battle of Borodino was a victory, and repeated this both verbally and in his dispatches and reports up to the time of his death. He alone said that the loss of Moscow was not the loss of Russia. In reply to Lauriston's proposal of peace, he said, There can be no peace, for such is the people's will. He alone, during the retreat of the French, said that all our maneuvers are useless, everything is being accomplished of itself better than we could desire, that the enemy must be offered a golden bridge that neither the Tarantino, the Vyazma, nor the Krasno battles were necessary, that we must keep some force to reach the frontier with, and that he would not sacrifice a single Russian for ten Frenchmen. And this courtier, as he is described to us, who lies to Erekcheyev to please the Emperor, he alone, incurring thereby the Emperor's displeasure, said in Vilna that, to carry the war beyond the frontier is useless and harmful. Nor do words alone prove that only he understood the meaning of the events. His actions, without the smallest deviation, were all directed to one and the same threefold end. One, to brace all his strength for conflict with the French. Two, to defeat them. And three, to drive them out of Russia minimizing as far as possible the sufferings of our people and of our army. This procrastinator Kutuzov, whose motto was patience and time, this enemy of decisive action, gave battle at Borodino, investing the preparations for it with unparalleled solemnity. 
this Kutuzov, who, before the Battle of Austerlitz began, said that it would be lost, he alone, in contradiction to everyone else, declared till his death that Borodino was a victory, despite the assurance of generals that the battle was lost and despite the fact that for an army to have to retire after winning a battle was unprecedented. He alone, during the whole retreat, insisted that battles, which were useless then, should not be fought, and that a new war should not be begun nor the frontiers of Russia crossed. It is easy now to understand the significance of these events, if only we abstain from attributing to the activity of the mass aims that existed only in the heads of a dozen individuals, for the events and results now lie before us. But how did that old man, alone in opposition to the general opinion, so truly discern the importance of the people's view of the events that in all his activity he was never once untrue to it? The source of that extraordinary power of penetrating the meaning of the events then occurring lay in the national feeling which he possessed in full purity and strength. Only the recognition of the fact that he possessed this feeling caused the people in so strange a manner, contrary to the Tsar's wish to select him, an old man in disfavor, to be their representative in the national war. And only that feeling placed him on the highest human pedestal, from which he, the commander-in-chief, devoted all his powers, not to slaying and destroying men, but to saving and showing pity on them. That simple, modest, and therefore truly great figure could not be cast in the false mold of a European hero, the supposed ruler of men that history has invented. To a lackey no man can be great, for a lackey has his own conception of greatness. End of Book 15, Chapter 5book 15 chapter 6 of war and peace volume 4 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 15 chapter 6 the 5th of november was the first day of what is called the battle of krasno toward evening after much disputing and many mistakes made by generals who did not go to their proper places and after adjutants had been sent about with counter-orders, when it had become plain that the enemy was everywhere in flight, and that there could and would be no battle, Kutuzov left Krasno and went to Dobro, whither his headquarters had that day been transferred. The day was clear and frosty. Kutuzov rode to Dobro on his plump little white horse, followed by an enormous suite of discontented generals who whispered among themselves behind his back. All along the road, groups of French prisoners captured that day, there were seven thousand of them, were crowding to warm themselves at campfires. Near Dobro, an immense crowd of tattered prisoners, buzzing with talk and wrapped and bandaged in anything they had been able to get hold of, were standing in the road beside a long row of unharnessed French guns. At the approach of the commander-in-chief, the buzz of talk ceased and all eyes were fixed on Kutuzov who, wearing a white cap with a red band and a padded overcoat that bulged on his round shoulders, moved slowly along the road on his white horse. One of the generals was reporting to him where the guns and prisoners had been captured. Kutuzov seemed preoccupied and did not listen to what the general was saying. He screwed up his eyes with a dissatisfied look as he gazed attentively and fixedly at these prisoners, who presented a specially wretched appearance. Most of them were disfigured by frost-bitten noses and cheeks, and nearly all had red, swollen, and festering eyes. One group of the French stood close to the road, and two of them, one of whom had his face covered with sores, were tearing a piece of raw flesh with their hands. There was something horrible and bestial in the fleeting glance they threw at the riders, and in the malevolent expression with which, after a glance at Kutuzov, the soldier with the sores immediately turned away and went on with what he was doing. Kutuzov looked long and intently at these two soldiers. He puckered his face, screwed up his eyes, and pensively swayed his head. 
At another spot he noticed a Russian soldier laughingly patting a Frenchman on the shoulder, saying something to him in a friendly manner, and Kutuzov, with the same expression on his face, again swayed his head. "'What were you saying?' he asked the general, who, continuing his report, directed the commander-in-chief's attention to some standards captured from the French, and standing in front of the Preobrazhensk regiment. "'Ah, the standards!' said Kutuzov, evidently detaching himself with difficulty from the thoughts that preoccupied him. He looked about him absently. Thousands of eyes were looking at him from all sides, awaiting a word from him. He stopped in front of the Preobrazhensk regiment, sighed deeply, and closed his eyes. One of his suite beckoned to the soldiers carrying the standards to advance and surround the commander-in-chief with them. Kutuzov was silent for a few seconds and then, submitting with evident reluctance to the duty imposed by his position, raised his head and began to speak. A throng of officers surrounded him. He looked attentively around at the circle of officers, recognizing several of them. "'I thank you all,' he said, addressing the soldiers and then again the officers. In the stillness around him his slowly uttered words were distinctly heard. I thank you all for your hard and faithful service. The victory is complete, and Russia will not forget you. Honor to you forever." He paused and looked around. "'Lower its head! Lower it!' he said to a soldier, who had accidentally lowered the French eagle he was holding before the Preobrazhensk standards. "'Lower! Lower! That's it! Hurrah, lads!' he added addressing the men with a rapid movement of his chin. Hurrah! roared thousands of voices. While the soldiers were shouting, Kutuzov leaned forward in his saddle and bowed his head, and his eye lit up with a mild and apparently ironic gleam. "'You see, brothers,' said he when the shouts had ceased, and all at once his voice and the expression of his face changed. It was no longer the commander-in-chief speaking, but an ordinary old man who wanted to tell his comrades something very important. There was a stir among the throng of officers and in the ranks of the soldiers, who moved that they might hear better what he was going to say. "'You see, brothers, I know it's hard for you, but it can't be helped. Bear up. It won't be for long now.' We'll see our visitors off, and then we'll rest. The Tsar won't forget your service. It is hard for you, but still you are at home, while they—you see what they have come to," said he, pointing to the prisoners. Worse off than our poorest beggars. While they were strong, we didn't spare ourselves, but now we may even pity them. They are human beings, too. Isn't it so, lads?" He looked around, and in the direct, respectful, wondering gaze fixed upon him, he read sympathy with what he had said. His face grew brighter and brighter with an old man's mild smile, which drew the corners of his lips and eyes into a cluster of wrinkles. He ceased speaking and bowed his head as if in perplexity. But, after all, who asked them here? Serves them right, the bloody bastards!" he cried, suddenly lifting his head. In flourishing his whip he rode off at a gallop for the first time during the whole campaign, and left the broken ranks of the soldiers laughing joyfully and shouting hurrah. Kutuzov's words were hardly understood by the troops. No one could have repeated the field marshal's address begun solemnly and then changing into an old man's simple-hearted talk. But the hearty sincerity of that speech, the feeling of majestic triumph combined with pity for the foe and consciousness of the justice of our cause, exactly expressed by that old man's good-natured expletives, was not merely understood but lay in the soul of every soldier and found expression in their joyous and long-sustained shouts. Afterwards, when one of the generals addressed Kutuzov, asking whether he wished his college to be sent for, Kutuzov, in answering, unexpectedly gave a sob, being evidently greatly moved.
End of Book 15, Chapter 6book 15 chapter 7 of war and peace volume 4 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 15 chapter 7 when the troops reached their night's halting place on the 8th of november the last day of the krasno battles it was already growing dusk all day it had been calm and frosty with occasional lightly falling snow, and toward evening it began to clear. Through the falling snow a purple-black and starry sky showed itself and the frost grew keener. An infantry regiment which had left Heretino three thousand strong, but now numbered only nine hundred, was one of the first to arrive that night at its halting place, a village on the high road. The quartermasters who met the regiment announced that all the huts were full of sick and dead Frenchmen, cavalrymen, and members of the staff. There was only one hut available for the regimental commander. The commander rode up to his hut. The regiment passed through the village and stacked its arms in front of the last huts. Like some huge many-limbed animal, the regiment began to prepare its lair and its food. One part of it dispersed and waded knee-deep through the snow into a birch forest to the right of the village, and immediately the sound of axes and swords, the crashing of branches, and merry voices could be heard from there. Another section amid the regimental wagons and horses which were standing in a group were busy getting out cauldrons and rye biscuit, and feeding the horses. A third section scattered through the village arranging quarters for the staff officers, carrying out the French corpses that were in the huts, and dragging away boards, dry wood, and thatch from the roofs for the campfires, or wattle fences to serve for shelter. Some fifteen men with merry shouts were shaking down the high wattle wall of a shed, the roof of which had already been removed. "'Now then, all together, shove!' cried the voices, and the huge surface of the wall, sprinkled with snow and creaking with frost, was seen swaying in the gloom of the night. The lower stakes cracked more and more, and at last the wall fell, and with it the men who had been pushing it. Loud coarse laughter and joyous shouts ensued. "'Now then, catch hold in twos! Hand up the lever! That's it! Where are you shoving to? Now, all together! But wait a moment, boys! With a song!' All stood silent, and a soft, pleasant, velvety voice began to sing. At the end of the third verse, as the last note died away, twenty voices roared out at once, "'Oo, oo, oo, oo! That's it! All together! Heave away, boys!' But despite their united efforts, the wattle hardly moved, and in the silence that followed the heavy breathing of the men was audible. "'Here, you of the Sixth Company!' Devils that you are, lend a hand, will you? You may want us one of these days." Some twenty men of the Sixth Company, who were on their way into the village, joined the haulers, and the wattle wall, which was about thirty-five feet long and seven feet high, moved forward along the village street swaying, pressing upon and cutting the shoulders of the gasping men. "'Get along! Falling? What are you stopping for? There, now! Mary's senseless words of abuse flowed freely. "'What are you up to?' suddenly came the authoritative voice of a sergeant-major who came upon the men who were hauling their burden. "'There are gentry here. The general himself is in that hut, and you foul-mouthed devils, you brutes! I'll give it to you!' shouted he, hitting the first man who came in his way a swinging blow on the back. "'Can't you make less noise?' The men became silent. The soldier who had been struck groaned and wiped his face, which had been scratched till it bled by his falling against the wattle. "'There! How that devil hits out! He's made my face all bloody!' said he in a frightened whisper when the sergeant-major had passed on. "'Don't you like it?' said a laughing voice, and moderating their tones the men moved forward. When they were out of the village they began talking again as loud as before, 
interlarding their talk with the same aimless expletives. In the hut which the men had passed, the chief officers had gathered and were in animated talk over their tea about the events of the day and the maneuvers suggested for tomorrow. It was proposed to make a flank march to the left, cut off the vice King Marat, and capture him. By the time the soldiers had dragged the wattle fence to its place, the campfires were blazing on all sides ready for cooking, the wood crackled, the snow was melting, and black shadows of soldiers flitted to and fro all over the occupied space where the snow had been trodden down. Axes and choppers were plied all around. Everything was done without any orders being given. Stores of wood were brought for the night, shelters were rigged up for the officers, cauldrons were being boiled, and muskets and accoutrements put in order. The wattle wall the men had brought was set up in a semicircle by the Eighth Company as a shelter from the north, propped up by musket rests, and a campfire was built before it. They beat the tattoo, called the roll, had supper, and settled down round the fires for the night. Some repairing their footgear, some smoking pipes, some stripping themselves naked to steam the lice out of their shirts. End of Book Fifteen, Chapter Seven. Book Fifteen, Chapter Eight, of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fifteen, Chapter Eight. One would have thought that, under the almost incredibly wretched conditions the Russian soldiers were in at that time, lacking warm boots and sheepskin coats, without a roof over their heads, in the snow with eighteen degrees of frost, and without even full rations the commissariat did not always keep up with the troops they would have presented a very sad and depressing spectacle. On the contrary, the army had never, under the best material conditions, presented a more cheerful and animated aspect. This was because all who began to grow depressed or who lost strength were sifted out of the army day by day. All the physically or morally weak had long since been left behind, and only the flower of the army physically and mentally remained. More men collected behind the wattle fence of the Eighth Company than anywhere else. Two sergeants major were sitting with them, and their campfire blazed brighter than others. For leave to sit by their waddle, they demanded contributions of fuel. "'Hey, Mikheyev! What has become of you, you son of a bitch? Are you lost, or have the wolves eaten you? Fetch some more wood!' shouted a red-haired and red-faced man, screwing up his eyes and blinking because of the smoke, but not moving back from the fire. "'And you, Jackdaw, go and fetch some wood!' said he to another soldier. This red-haired man was neither a sergeant nor a corporal, but being robust he ordered about those weaker than himself. The soldier they called Jackdaw, a thin little fellow with a sharp nose, rose obediently and was about to go, but at that instant there came into the light of the fire the slender, handsome figure of a young soldier carrying a load of wood. "'Bring it here. That's fine.' They split up the wood pressed it down on the fire, blew at it with their mouths, and fanned it with the skirts of their greatcoats, making the flames hiss and crackle. The men drew nearer and lit their pipes. The handsome young soldier, who had brought the wood, setting his arms akimbo, began stamping his cold feet rapidly and deftly on the spot where he stood. "'Mother, the dew is cold but clear. It's well that I'm a musketeer,' he sang, pretending to hiccough after each syllable. "'Look out! Your soles will fly off!' shouted the red-haired man, noticing that the sole of the dancer's boot was hanging loose. "'What a fellow you are for dancing!' The dancer stopped, pulled off the loose piece of leather, and threw it on the fire. "'Right enough, friend,' said he, and having sat down, took out of his knapsack a scrap of blue French cloth and wrapped it round his foot. "'It's the steam that spoils them,' he added, stretching out his feet toward the fire." they'll soon be issuing us new ones. They say that when we finished hammering them, we're to receive double kits. And that son of a bitch Petrov has lagged behind after all, it seems," said one sergeant major. I've had an eye on him this long while, said the other. 
Well, he's a poor sort of soldier. But in the third company they say nine men were missing yesterday. Yes, it's all very well, but when a man's feet are frozen, how can he walk? Eh, don't talk nonsense, said a sergeant major. Do you want to be doing the same? said an old soldier, turning reproachfully to the man who had spoken of frozen feet. Well, you know, said the sharp-nosed man they called Jackdaw, in a squeaky and unsteady voice, raising himself at the other side of the fire. A plump man gets thin, but for a thin one it's death. Take me now. I've got no strength left," he added, with sudden resolution turning to the sergeant-major. Tell them to send me to hospital. I'm aching all over. Anyway, I shan't be able to keep up. That'll do, that'll do," replied the sergeant-major quietly. The soldier said no more, and the talk went on. What a lot of those Frenchies were taken today! And the fact is that not one of them had what you might call real boots on," said a soldier, starting a new theme. They were no more than make-believes. The Cossacks have taken their boots. They were clearing the hut for the colonel and carried them out. It was pitiful to see them, boys," put in the dancer. As they turned them over, one seemed still alive, and would you believe it, he jabbered something in their lingo. But they're a clean folk, lads," the first man went on. He was white, as white as birch-bark, and some of them are such fine fellows you might think they were nobles. Well, what do you think? They make soldiers of all classes there. But they don't understand our talk at all," said the dancer with a puzzled smile. I asked him whose subject he was, and he jabbered in his own way. A queer lot. But it's strange, friends," continued the man who had wondered at their whiteness. The peasants at Mogès were saying that, when they began burying the dead, where the battle was, you know, well, those dead had been lying there for nearly a month, and says the peasant, they lie as white as paper, clean, and not as much smell as a puff of powder smoke." "'Was it from the cold?' asked someone. "'You're a clever fellow. From the cold, indeed. Why, it was hot. If it had been from the cold, ours would not have rotted either. But, he says, go up to ours, and they are all rotten and maggoty. So, he says, we tie our faces up with kerchiefs and turn our heads away as we drag them off. We can hardly do it. But theirs, he says, are white as paper, and not so much smell as a whiff of gunpowder." All were silent. "'It must be from their food,' said the sergeant-major. They used to gobble the same food as the gentry." No one contradicted him. That peasant near Mozhaisk, where the battle was, said the men were all called up from ten villages around, and they carted for twenty days and still didn't finish carting the dead away. And as for the wolves, he says, that was a real battle, said an old soldier. It's the only one worth remembering. But since that, it's only been tormenting folk. And do you know, Daddy, the day before yesterday we ran at them, and my word, they didn't let us get near before they just threw down their muskets and went on their knees. Pardon, they say. That's only one case. They say Platov took Polian himself twice, but he didn't know the right charm. He catches him and catches him. No good. He turns into a bird in his hands and flies away. And there's no way of killing him either. You're a first-class liar, Kisilev, when I come to look at you. Liar, indeed. It's the real truth. If he fell into my hands, when I'd caught him, I'd bury him in the ground with an aspen stake to fix him down. What a lot of men he's ruined! Well, anyhow, we're going to end it. He won't come here again," remarked the old soldier, yawning. The conversation flagged, and the soldiers began settling down to sleep. Look at the stars. It's wonderful how they shine. You would think the women had spread out their linen said one of the men, gazing with admiration at the Milky Way. That's a sign of a good harvest next year. We shall want some more wood. You warm your back and your belly gets frozen. That's queer. Oh, Lord! 
What are you pushing for? Is the fire only for you? Look how he's sprawling!" In the silence that ensued, the snoring of those who had fallen asleep could be heard. Others turned over and warmed themselves, now and again exchanging a few words. From a campfire a hundred paces off came a sound of general merry laughter. "'Hark at them roaring there in the fifth company,' said one of the soldiers. "'And what a lot of them there are!' One of the men got up and went over to the fifth company. "'They're having such fun,' said he, coming back. Two Frenchies have turned up. One's quite frozen, and the other's an awful swaggerer. He's singing songs. Oh, I'll go across and have a look." And several of the men went over to the fifth company. End of Book Fifteen, Chapter Eight Book Fifteen, Chapter Nine of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fifteen, Chapter Nine. The fifth company was bivouacking at the very edge of the forest. A huge campfire was blazing brightly in the midst of the snow, lighting up the branches of trees heavy with hoarfrost. About midnight, they heard the sound of steps in the snow of the forest and the crackling of dry branches. "'A bear, lads,' said one of the men. They all raised their heads to listen, and out of the forest into the bright firelight stepped two strangely clad human figures clinging to one another. These were two Frenchmen who had been hiding in the forest. They came up to the fire, hoarsely uttering something in a language our soldiers did not understand. One was taller than the other. He wore an officer's hat and seemed quite exhausted. On approaching the fire, he had been going to sit down, but fell. The other, a short, sturdy soldier with a shawl tied round his head, was stronger. He raised his companion and said something, pointing to his mouth. The soldier surrounded the Frenchman, spread a greatcoat on the ground for the sick man, and brought some buckwheat porridge and vodka for both of them. The exhausted French officer was Rambal, and the man with his head wrapped in the shawl was Morel, his orderly. When Morel had drunk some vodka and finished his bowl of porridge, he suddenly became unnaturally merry and chattered incessantly to the soldiers, who could not understand him. Rambal refused food and, resting his head on his elbow, lay silent beside the campfire, looking at the Russian soldiers with red and vacant eyes. Occasionally he emitted a long-drawn groan and then again became silent. Morel, pointing to his shoulders, tried to impress on the soldiers the fact that Rambal was an officer and ought to be warmed. A Russian officer, who had come up to the fire, sent to ask his colonel whether he would not take a French officer into his hut to warm him, and when the messenger returned and said that the colonel wished the officer to be brought to him, Rambal was told to go. He rose and tried to walk, but staggered and would have fallen had not a soldier standing by held him up. "'You won't do it again, eh?' said one of the soldiers, winking and turning mockingly to Rambal. "'Oh, you fool! Why talk rubbish, lout that you are! A real peasant!' came rebukes from all sides addressed to the jesting soldier. They surrounded Rambal, lifted him on the crossed arms of two soldiers, and carried him to the hut. Rambal put his arms around their necks while they carried him and began wailing plaintively. "'Oh, you fine fellows! My kind, kind friends!' These are men! Oh, my brave, kind friends!" And he leaned his head against the shoulder of one of the men like a child. Meanwhile Morel was sitting in the best place by the fire, surrounded by the soldiers. Morel, a short, sturdy Frenchman with inflamed and streaming eyes, was wearing a woman's cloak and had a shawl tied woman-fashion round his head over his cap. He was evidently tipsy, and was singing a French song in a hoarse, broken voice with an arm thrown round the nearest soldier. The soldiers simply held their sides as they watched him. "'Now then, now then, teach us how it goes. I'll soon pick it up. How is it?' said the man, a singer and a wag, whom Morel was embracing. "'Vive Riquat! Vive ce roi valiant!' sang Morel, winking. "'Ce diable à quoi!' Long live Henry the Fourth, that valiant king, that rowdy devil. 
Viva Rika! Vif Suru Varu! Sedya Blayaka! repeated the soldier, flourishing his arms and really catching the tune. Bravo! Ha ha ha! rose their rough, joyous laughter from all sides. Morel, wrinkling up his face, laughed too. Well, go on, go on! Que le triple talon de bois de bat et d'être un galant! who had a triple talent for drinking, for fighting, and for being a gallant old boy. It goes smoothly, too. Well now, Zalateyev. Que... Zalateyev brought out with effort. Que... eh... 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 he drawled, laboriously pursing his lips. Le trip ta la de de ba et de trava gala, he sang. Fine! Just like the Frenchy. Ho, oh, ho, ho! Do you want some more to eat? Give him some porridge. It takes a long time to get filled up after starving. They gave him some more porridge, and Morel with a laugh set to work on his third bowl. All the young soldiers smiled gaily as they watched him. The older men, who thought it undignified to amuse themselves with such nonsense, continued to lie at the opposite side of the fire, but one would occasionally raise himself on an elbow and glance at Morel with a smile. They are men, too," said one of them, as he wrapped himself up in his coat. Even wormwood grows on its own root. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how starry it is! Tremendous! That means a hard frost! They all grew silent. The stars, as if knowing that no one was looking at them, began to disport themselves in the dark sky, now flaring up, now vanishing, now trembling. They were busy whispering something gladsome and mysterious to one another. End of Book 15, Chapter 9。Book 15, Chapter 10 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 15, Chapter 10 the French army melted away at the uniform rate of a mathematical progression, and that crossing of the Berezina, about which so much has been written, was only one intermediate stage in its destruction, and not at all the decisive episode of the campaign. If so much has been and still is written about the Berezina, on the French side this is only because at the broken bridge across that river the calamities their army had been previously enduring were suddenly concentrated at one moment into a tragic spectacle that remained in every memory, and on the Russian side, merely because in Petersburg, far from the seat of war, a plan, again one of fuels, had been devised to catch Napoleon in a strategic trap at the Berezina River. Everyone assured himself that all would happen according to plan and therefore insisted that it was just the crossing of the Berezina that destroyed the French army. In reality, the results of the crossing were much less disastrous to the French, in guns and men lost, than Krasno had been, as the figures show. The sole importance of the crossing of the Berezina lies in the fact that it plainly and indubitably proved the fallacy of all the plans for cutting off the enemy's retreat and the soundness of the only possible line of action, the one Kutuzov and the general mass of the army demanded, namely, simply to follow the enemy up. The French crowd fled at a continually increasing speed, and all its energy was directed to reaching its goal. It fled like a wounded animal, and it was impossible to block its path. This was shown not so much by the arrangements it made for crossing, as by what took place at the bridges. When the bridges broke down, unarmed soldiers, people from Moscow, and women with children who were with the French transport, all carried on by vis inertia, pressed forward into boats and into the ice-covered water and did not surrender. That impulse was reasonable. The condition of fugitives and of pursuers was equally bad. As long as they remained with their own people, each might hope for help from his fellows and the definite place he held among them. But those who surrendered, while remaining in the same pitiful plight, would be on a lower level to claim a share in the necessities of life. 
the French did not need to be informed of the fact that half the prisoners, with whom the Russians did not know what to do, perished of cold and hunger despite their captor's desire to save them. They felt that it could not be otherwise. The most compassionate Russian commanders, those favorable to the French, and even the Frenchmen in the Russian service, could do nothing for the prisoners. The French perished from the conditions to which the Russian army was itself exposed. It was impossible to take bread and clothes from our hungry and indispensable soldiers to give to the French, who, though not harmful or hated or guilty, were simply unnecessary. Some Russians even did that, but they were exceptions. Certain destruction lay behind the French, but in front there was hope. Their ships had been burned, there was no salvation save in collective flight, and on that the whole strength of the French was concentrated. The farther they fled, the more wretched became the plight of the remnant, especially after the Berezina, on which, in consequence of the Petersburg plan, special hopes had been placed by the Russians, and the keener grew the passions of the Russian commanders who blamed one another and Kutuzov most of all. Anticipation that the failure of the petersburg berezina plan would be attributed to Kutuzov led to dissatisfaction, contempt and ridicule more and more strongly expressed. The ridicule and contempt were, of course, expressed in a respectful form, making it impossible for him to ask wherein he was to blame. They did not talk seriously to him. When reporting to him or asking for his sanction, they appeared to be fulfilling a regrettable formality, but they winked behind his back and tried to mislead him at every turn. Because they could not understand him, all these people assumed that it was useless to talk to the old man, that he would never grasp the profundity of their plans, that he would answer with his phrases, which they thought were mere phrases, about a golden bridge, about the impossibility of crossing the frontier with a crowd of tattered Damalians and so forth. They had heard all that before. And all he said, that it was necessary to await provisions or that the men had no boots, was so simple, while what they proposed was so complicated and clever, that it was evident that he was old and stupid, and that they, though not in power, were commanders of genius. After the junction with the army of the brilliant admiral and Petersburg hero Wittgenstein, this mood and the gossip of the staff reached their maximum. Kutuzov saw this and merely sighed and shrugged his shoulders. Only once, after the affair of the Berezina, did he get angry and write to Benningsen, who reported separately to the emperor, the following letter. On account of your spells of ill health, Will Your Excellency please be so good as to set off for Kaluga on receipt of this, and there await further commands and appointments from His Imperial Majesty?" But after Benningsen's departure, the Grand Duke Tsarevich Konstantin Pavlovich joined the army. He had taken part in the beginning of the campaign, but had subsequently been removed from the army by Kutuzov. Now having come to the army, he informed Kutuzov of the Emperor's displeasure at the poor success of our forces and the slowness of their advance. The Emperor intended to join the army personally in a few days' time. The old man, experienced in court as well as in military affairs, the same Kutuzov, who in August had been chosen commander-in-chief against the sovereign's wishes, and who had removed the Grand Duke and heir apparent from the army, who on his own authority and contrary to the Emperor's will had decided on the abandonment of Moscow, now realized at once that his day was over, that his part was played, and that the power he was supposed to hold was no longer his. And he understood this not merely from the attitude of the court. He saw on the one hand that the military business in which he had played his part was ended and felt his mission was accomplished and at the same time he began to be conscious of the physical weariness of his aged body and of the necessity of physical rest. On the twenty-ninth of November Kutuzov entered Vilna, his dear Vilna as he called it. Twice during his career Kutuzov had been governor of Vilna. In that wealthy town which had not been injured, he found old friends and associations, 
besides the comforts of life of which he had so long been deprived. And he suddenly turned from the cares of army and state, and as far as the passions that seethed around him allowed, immersed himself in the quiet life to which he had formerly been accustomed, as if all that was taking place and all that had still to be done in the realm of history did not concern him at all. Chichagov, one of the most zealous cutters-off and breakers-up, who at first wanted to effect a diversion in Greece and then in Warsaw, but never wished to go where he was sent. Chichagov, noted for the boldness with which he spoke to the Emperor, and who considered Kutuzov to be under an obligation to him because when he was sent to make peace with Turkey in 1811 independently of Kutuzov, and found that peace had already been concluded, he admitted to the Emperor that the merit of securing that peace was really Kutuzov's. This Chichagov was the first to meet Kutuzov at the castle where the latter was to stay. In undressed naval uniform, with a dirk and holding his cap under his arm, he handed Kutuzov a garrison report and the keys of the town. The contemptuously respectful attitude of the youngest man to the old man in his dotage was expressed in the highest degree by the behavior of Chichagov, who knew of the accusations that were being directed against Kutuzov. When speaking to Chichagov, Kutuzov incidentally mentioned that the vehicles packed with China that had been captured from him at Borisov had been recovered and would be restored to him. You mean to imply that I have nothing to eat out of? On the contrary, I can supply you with everything, even if you want to give dinner parties," warmly replied Chichagov, who tried by every word he spoke to prove his own rectitude, and therefore imagined Kutuzov to be animated by the same desire. Kutuzov, shrugging his shoulders, replied with his subtle, penetrating smile, I meant merely to say what I said. Contrary to the Emperor's wish, Kutuzov detained the greater part of the army at Vilna. Those about him said that he became extraordinarily slack and physically feeble during his stay in that town. He attended to army affairs reluctantly, left everything to his generals, and while awaiting the Emperor's arrival led a dissipated life. Having left Petersburg on the 7th of December with his suite, Count Tolstoy, Prince Volkonsky, Arakcheyev and others, the Emperor reached Vilna on the eleventh, and in his travelling sleigh drove straight to the castle. In spite of the severe frost, some hundred generals and staff officers in full parade uniform stood in front of the castle, as well as a guard of honour of the Semenov regiment. A courier who galloped to the castle in advance, in a troika with three foam-flecked horses, shouted, Coming! and Konovnitsyn rushed into the vestibule to inform Kutuzov, who was waiting in the hall-porter's little lodge. A minute later the old man's large stout figure in full-dress uniform, his chest covered with orders and a scarf drawn round his stomach, waddled out into the porch. He put on his hat with its peaks to the sides, and holding his gloves in his hand and walking with an effort sideways down the steps to the level of the street, took in his hand the report he had prepared for the Emperor. It was running to and fro and whispering. Another troika flew furiously up, and then all eyes were turned on an approaching sleigh in which the figures of the Emperor and Volkonsky could already be descried. From the habit of fifty years all this had a physically agitating effect on the old general. He carefully and hastily felt himself all over, readjusted his hat, and pulling himself together, drew himself up, and at the very moment when the Emperor, having alighted from the sleigh, lifted his eyes to him, handed him the report and began speaking in his smooth, ingratiating voice. The Emperor, with a rapid glance, scanned Kutuzov from head to foot, frowned for an instant, but immediately mastering himself, went up to the old man, extended his arms, and embraced him. And this embrace, too, owing to a long-standing impression related to his innermost feelings, had its usual effect on Kutuzov, and he gave a sob. The Emperor greeted the officers and the Semenov guard, and again pressing the old man's hand went with him into the castle. When alone with the field marshal, the Emperor expressed his dissatisfaction at the slowness of the pursuit and at the mistakes made at Krasno and the Berezina, and informed him of his intentions for a future campaign abroad. Kutuzov made no rejoinder or remark. 
the same submissive, expressionless look with which he had listened to the Emperor's commands on the field of Austerlitz seven years before, settled on his face now. When Kutuzov came out of the study and with lowered head was crossing the ballroom with his heavy waddling gait, he was arrested by someone's voice saying, "'Your Serene Highness!' Kutuzov raised his head and looked for a long while into the eyes of Count Tolstoy, who stood before him holding a silver salver on which lay a small object. Kutuzov seemed not to understand what was expected of him. Suddenly he seemed to remember. A scarcely perceptible smile flashed across his puffy face, and bowing low and respectfully he took the object that lay on the salver. It was the Order of St. George of the First Class. End of Book 15, Chapter 10Book 15, Chapter 11, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 15, Chapter 11 Next day the field marshal gave a dinner and ball which the Emperor honored by his presence. Kutuzov had received the Order of St. George of the First Class, and the Emperor showed him the highest honors but everyone knew of the imperial dissatisfaction with him. The proprieties were observed, and the emperor was the first to set that example, but everybody understood that the old man was blameworthy and good for nothing. When Kutuzov, conforming to a custom of Catherine's day, ordered the standards that had been captured to be lowered at the emperor's feet on his entering the ballroom, the emperor made a wry face and muttered something in which some people caught the words, the old comedian. The Emperor's displeasure with Kutuzov was specially increased at Vilna by the fact that Kutuzov evidently could not or would not understand the importance of the coming campaign. When on the following morning the Emperor said to the officers assembled about him, "'You have not only saved Russia, you have saved Europe!' They all understood that the war was not ended. Kutuzov alone would not see this and openly expressed his opinion that no fresh war could improve the position or add to the glory of Russia, but could only spoil and lower the glorious position that Russia had gained. He tried to prove to the Emperor the impossibility of levying fresh troops, spoke of the hardships already endured by the people, of the possibility of failure and so forth. This being the Field Marshal's frame of mind, he was naturally regarded as merely a hindrance and obstacle to the impending war. To avoid unpleasant encounters with the old man, the natural method was to do what had been done with him at Austerlitz and with Barclay at the beginning of the Russian campaign, to transfer the authority to the Emperor himself, thus cutting the ground from under the Commander-in-Chief's feet without upsetting the old man by informing him of the change. With this object, his staff was gradually reconstructed and its real strength removed and transferred to the Emperor. Tol, Konovnitsyn, and Ermolov received fresh appointments. Everyone spoke loudly of the Field Marshal's great weakness and failing health. His health had to be bad for his place to be taken away and given to another. And, in fact, his health was poor. So naturally, simply and gradually, just as he had come from Turkey to the Treasury in Petersburg to recruit the militia, and then to the army when he was needed there, now, when his part was played out, Kutuzov's place was taken by a new and necessary performer. The War of 1812, besides its national significance dear to every Russian heart, was now to assume another, a European significance. The movement of peoples from west to east was to be succeeded by a movement of peoples from east to west, and for this fresh war another leader was necessary, having qualities and views differing from Kutuzov's and animated by different motives. Alexander I was as necessary for the movement of the peoples from east to west and for the refixing of national frontiers as Kutuzov had been for the salvation and glory of Russia. Kutuzov did not understand what Europe, the balance of power, or Napoleon meant. He could not understand it. For the representative of the Russian people, 
after the enemy had been destroyed and Russia had been liberated and raised to the summit of her glory, there was nothing left to do as a Russian. Nothing remained for the representative of the national war but to die, and Kutuzov died. End of Book 15, Chapter 11book 15 chapter 12 of war and peace volume 4 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 15 chapter 12 as generally happens pierre did not feel the full effects of the physical privation and strain he had suffered as prisoner until after they were over after his liberation, he reached Orel, and on the third day there, when preparing to go to Kiev, he fell ill and was laid up for three months. He had what the doctors termed bilious fever. But despite the fact that the doctors treated him, bled him, and gave him medicines to drink, he recovered. Scarcely any impression was left on Pierre's mind by all that happened to him from the time of his rescue till his illness. He remembered only the dull gray weather, now rainy and now snowy, internal physical distress, and pains in his feet and side. He remembered a general impression of the misfortunes and sufferings of people, and of being worried by the curiosity of officers and generals who questioned him. He also remembered his difficulty in procuring a conveyance and horses, and above all he remembered his incapacity to think and feel all that time. On the day of his rescue he had seen the body of Petya Rostov. That same day he had learned that Prince Andrew, after surviving the Battle of Borodino for more than a month, had recently died in the Rostov's house at Yaroslavl. And Denisov, who told him this news, also mentioned Elaine's death, supposing that Pierre had heard of it long before. All this at the time seemed merely strange to Pierre. He felt he could not grasp its significance. Just then he was only anxious to get away as quickly as possible from places where people were killing one another, to some peaceful refuge where he could recover himself, rest, and think over all the strange new facts he had learned. But on reaching Orel he immediately fell ill. When he came to himself after his illness, he saw in attendance on him two of his servants, Terenti and Vaska, who had come from Moscow and also his cousin, the eldest princess, who had been living on his estate at Alets and hearing of his rescue and illness had come to look after him. It was only gradually during his convalescence that Pierre lost the impressions he had become accustomed to during the last few months, and got used to the idea that no one would oblige him to go anywhere tomorrow, that no one would deprive him of his warm bed, and that he would be sure to get his dinner, tea, and supper but for a long time in his dreams he still saw himself in the conditions of captivity. In the same way, little by little, he came to understand the news he had been told after his rescue, about the death of Prince Andrew, the death of his wife, and the destruction of the French. A joyous feeling of freedom, that complete inalienable freedom natural to man which he had first experienced at the first halt outside Moscow, filled Pierre's soul during his convalescence. He was surprised to find that this inner freedom, which was independent of external conditions, now had, as it were, an additional setting of external liberty. He was alone in a strange town without acquaintances. No one demanded anything of him or sent him anywhere. He had all he wanted. The thought of his wife, which had been a continual torment to him, was no longer there, since she was no more. "'Oh, how good! How splendid!' said he to himself, when a cleanly laid table was moved up to him with savory beef tea, or when he lay down for the night on a soft clean bed, or when he remembered that the French had gone and that his wife was no more. "'Oh, how good! How splendid!' And, by old habit, he asked himself the question, Well, and what then? What am I going to do? And he immediately gave himself the answer, Well, I shall live. 
Ah, how splendid! The very question that had formerly tormented him, the thing he had continually sought to find, the aim of life, no longer existed for him now. That search for the aim of life had not merely disappeared temporarily, he felt that it no longer existed for him and could not present itself again. And this very absence of an aim gave him the complete, joyous sense of freedom which constituted his happiness at this time. He could not see an aim, for he now had faith, not faith in any kind of rule or words or ideas, but faith in an ever-living, ever-manifest God. Formerly he had sought Him in aims he set himself. That search for an aim had been simply a search for God, and suddenly, in his captivity, he had learned not by words or reasoning but by direct feeling what his nurse had told him long ago, that God is here and everywhere. In his captivity he had learned that in Karateyev God was greater, more infinite and unfathomable than in the architect of the universe recognized by the Freemasons. He felt like a man who, after straining his eyes to see into the far distance, finds what he sought at his very feet. All his life he had looked over the heads of the men around him, when he should have merely looked in front of him without straining his eyes. In the past he had never been able to find that great, inscrutable, infinite something. He had only felt that it must exist somewhere and had looked for it. In everything near and comprehensible he had seen only what was limited, petty, commonplace, and senseless. He had equipped himself with a mental telescope and looked into remote space, where petty worldliness hiding itself in misty distance had seemed to him great and infinite merely because it was not clearly seen. And such had European life, politics, Freemasonry, philosophy, and philanthropy seemed to him. But even then, at moments of weakness as he had accounted them, his mind had penetrated to those distances and he had there seen the same pettiness, worldliness, and senselessness. Now, however, he had learned to see the great, eternal, and infinite in everything, and therefore, to see it and enjoy its contemplation, he naturally threw away the telescope through which he had till now gazed over men's heads, and gladly regarded the ever-changing, eternally great, unfathomable, and infinite life around him. And the closer he looked, the more tranquil and happy he became. That dreadful question, what for, which had formerly destroyed all his mental edifices, no longer existed for him. To that question, what for, a simple answer was now always ready in his soul. Because there is a God, that God without whose will not one hair falls from a man's head. End of Book 15, Chapter 12book 15 chapter 13 of war and peace volume 4 by leo tolstoy translated by umar maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 15 chapter 13 in external ways pierre had hardly changed at all in appearance he was just what he used to be as before he was absent-minded and seemed occupied not with what was before his eyes, but with something special of his own. The difference between his former and present self was that formerly, when he did not grasp what lay before him or was said to him, he had puckered his forehead painfully as a vainly seeking to distinguish something at a distance. At present he still forgot what was said to him and still did not see what was before his eyes but he now looked with a scarcely perceptible and seemingly ironic smile at what was before him and listened to what was said, though evidently seeing and hearing something quite different. Formerly he had appeared to be a kind-hearted but unhappy man, and so people had been inclined to avoid him. Now a smile at the joy of life always played round his lips and sympathy for others shone in his eyes with a questioning look as to whether they were as contented as he was, and people felt pleased by his presence. Previously he had talked a great deal, 
grew excited when he talked, and seldom listened. Now he was seldom carried away in conversation and knew how to listen so that people readily told him their most intimate secrets. The princess, who had never liked Pierre and had been particularly hostile to him since she had felt herself under obligations to him after the old count's death, now after staying a short time in Orel, where she had come intending to show Pierre that, in spite of his ingratitude, she considered it her duty to nurse him, felt to her surprise and vexation that she had become fond of him. Pierre did not in any way seek her approval. He merely studied her with interest. Formerly she had felt that he regarded her with indifference and irony, and so had shrunk into herself, as she did with others, and had shown him only the combative side of her nature but now he seemed to be trying to understand the most intimate places of her heart, and, mistrustfully at first, but afterwards gratefully, she let him see the hidden, kindly sides of her character. The most cunning man could not have crept into her confidence more successfully, evoking memories of the best times of her youth and showing sympathy with them. Yet Pierre's cunning consisted simply in finding pleasure in drawing out the human qualities of the embittered, hard, and in her own way, proud princess. "'Yes, he is a very, very kind man, when he is not under influence of bad people, but of people such as myself,' thought she. His servants, too, Tarenti and Vasca, in their own way noticed the change that had taken place in Pierre. They considered that he had become much simpler. Tarenti, when he had helped him undress and wished him good night, often lingered with his master's boots in his hands and clothes over his arm to see whether he would not start a talk. And Pierre, noticing that Tarenti wanted a chat, generally kept him there. Well, tell me, now how did you get food? he would ask. And Tarenti would begin talking of the destruction of Moscow and of the old count, and would stand for a long time holding the clothes and talking, or sometimes listening to Pierre's stories, and then would go out into the hall with a pleasant sense of intimacy with his master and affection for him. The doctor who attended Pierre and visited him every day, though he considered it his duty as a doctor to pose as a man whose every moment was of value to suffering humanity, would sit for hours with Pierre telling him his favorite anecdotes and his observations on the characters of his patients in general, and especially of the ladies. "'It's a pleasure to talk to a man like that. He is not like our provincials,' he would say. There were several prisoners from the French army in Orel, and the doctor brought one of them, a young Italian, to see Pierre. This officer began visiting Pierre, and the princess used to make fun of the tenderness the Italian expressed for him. The Italian seemed happy only when he could come to see Pierre, talk with him, tell him about his past, his life at home, and his love, and pour out to him his indignation against the French and especially against Napoleon. "'If all Russians are in the least like you, it is sacrilege to fight such a nation,' he said to Pierre. "'You who have suffered so from the French do not even feel animosity toward them.' Pierre had evoked the passionate affection of the Italian merely by evoking the best side of his nature and taking a pleasure in so doing. During the last days of Pierre's stay in Orel, his old Masonic acquaintance, Count Wilarski, who had introduced him to the lodge in 1807, came to see him. Wilarski was married to a Russian heiress who had a large estate in Orel province, and he occupied a temporary post in the commissary department in that town. Hearing that Bezukhov was in Orel, Wilarski, though they had never been intimate, came to him with the professions of friendship and intimacy that people who meet in a desert generally express for one another. Wilarski felt dull in Orel and was pleased to meet a man of his own circle, and, as he supposed, of similar interests. But to his surprise, Wilarski soon noticed that Pierre had lagged much behind the times and had sunk, as he expressed it to himself, into apathy and egotism. "'You are letting yourself go, my dear fellow,' he said. But for all that Willarski found it pleasanter now than it had been formerly to be with Pierre, and came to see him every day. To Pierre, as he looked at and listened to Willarski, 
it seemed strange to think that he had been like that himself but a short time before. Willarski was a married man with a family, busy with his family affairs, his wife's affairs, and his official duties. He regarded all these occupations as hindrances to life, and considered that they were all contemptible because their aim was the welfare of himself and his family. Military, administrative, political, and Masonic interests continually absorbed his attention. And Pierre, without trying to change the other's views and without condemning him, but with the quiet, joyful, and amused smile now habitual to him, was interested in this strange though very familiar phenomenon. There was a new feature in Pierre's relations with Willarski, with the princess, with the doctor, and with all the people he now met which gained for him the general good will. This was his acknowledgment of the impossibility of changing a man's convictions by words, and his recognition of the possibility of everyone thinking, feeling, and seeing things each from his own point of view. This legitimate peculiarity of each individual, which used to excite and irritate Pierre, now became a basis of the sympathy he felt for and the interest he took in other people. The difference, and sometimes complete contradiction, between men's opinions and their lives, and between one man and another, pleased him and drew from him an amused and gentle smile. In practical matters Pierre unexpectedly felt within himself a center of gravity he had previously lacked. Formerly, all pecuniary questions, especially requests for money to which, as an extremely wealthy man, he was very exposed, produced in him a state of hopeless agitation and perplexity. To give or not to give? he had asked himself. I have it and he needs it. But someone else needs it still more. Who needs it most? And perhaps they are both impostors. In the old days, he had been unable to find a way out of all these surmises, and had given to all who asked as long as he had anything to give. Formerly, he had been in a similar state of perplexity with regard to every question concerning his property, when one person advised one thing and another something else. Now to his surprise he found that he no longer felt either doubt or perplexity about these questions. There was now within him a judge who by some rule unknown to him decided what should or should not be done. He was as indifferent as heretofore to money matters, but now he felt certain of what ought and what ought not to be done. The first time he had recourse to his new judge was when a French prisoner, a colonel, came to him, and after talking a great deal about his exploits, concluded by making what amounted to a demand that Pierre should give him four thousand francs to send to his wife and children. Pierre refused without the least difficulty or effort, and was afterwards surprised how simple and easy had been what used to appear so insurmountably difficult. At the same time that he refused the colonel's demand, he made up his mind that he must have recourse to artifice when leaving Orel, to induce the Italian officer to accept some money of which he was evidently in need. A further proof to Pierre of his own more settled outlook on practical matters was furnished by his decision with regard to his wife's debts and to the rebuilding of his houses in and near Moscow. His head steward came to him at Orel and Pierre reckoned up with him his diminished income. The burning of Moscow had cost him, according to the head steward's calculation, about two million roubles. To console Pierre for these losses, the head steward gave him an estimate showing that despite these losses his income would not be diminished, but would even be increased if he refused to pay his wife's debts, which he was under no obligation to meet, and did not rebuild his Moscow house and the country house on his Moscow estate which had cost him eighty thousand roubles a year and brought in nothing. "'Yes, of course that's true,' said Pierre with a cheerful smile. "'I don't need all that at all. By being ruined I have become much richer.' But in January Savelich came from Moscow and gave him an account of the state of things there, and spoke of the estimate an architect had made of the cost of rebuilding the town and country houses speaking of this as of a settled matter. About the same time he received letters from Prince Vasily and other Petersburg acquaintances speaking of his wife's debts. 
and Pierre decided that the steward's proposals which had so pleased him were wrong, and that he must go to Petersburg and settle his wife's affairs and must rebuild in Moscow. Why this was necessary, he did not know, but he knew for certain that it was necessary. His income would be reduced by three-fourths, but he felt it must be done. Wolarsky was going to Moscow, and they agreed to travel together. During the whole time of his convalescence in Orel, Pierre had experienced a feeling of joy, freedom, and life. But when, during his journey, he found himself in the open world and saw hundreds of new faces, that feeling was intensified. Throughout his journey he felt like a schoolboy on holiday. Everyone, the stagecoach driver, the post-house overseers, the peasants on the roads and in the villages, had a new significance for him. The presence and remarks of Willarsky, who continually deplored the ignorance and poverty of Russia and its backwardness compared with Europe, only heightened Pierre's pleasure. Where Willarsky saw deadness, Pierre saw an extraordinary strength and vitality, the strength which, in that vast space amid the snows, maintained the life of this original, peculiar, and unique people. He did not contradict Willarsky, and even seemed to agree with him an apparent agreement being the simplest way to avoid discussions that could lead to nothing, and he smiled joyfully as he listened to him. End of Book 15, Chapter 13《Book Fifteen, Chapter Fourteen, Of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Book Fifteen, Chapter Fourteen. It would be difficult to explain why and whither ants whose heap has been destroyed are hurrying. Some from the heap dragging bits of rubbish, larvae, and corpses; others back to the heap or why they jostle, overtake one another, and fight. And it would be equally difficult to explain what caused the Russians, after the departure of the French, to throng to the place that had formerly been Moscow. But when we watch the ants round their ruined heap, the tenacity, energy, and immense number of the delving insects prove that despite the destruction of the heap, something indestructible which, though intangible, is the real strength of the colony still exists. And similarly, though in Moscow in the month of October there was no government and no churches, shrines, riches, or houses, it was still the Moscow it had been in August. All was destroyed except something intangible yet powerful and indestructible. The motives of those who thronged from all sides to Moscow after it had been cleared of the enemy were most diverse and personal, and at first, for the most part, savage and brutal. One motive only they all had in common, a desire to get to the place that had been called Moscow to apply their activities there. Within a week Moscow already had fifteen thousand inhabitants, in a fortnight twenty-five thousand, and so on. By the autumn of 1813 the number, ever increasing and increasing, exceeded what it had been in 1812. The first Russians to enter Moscow were the Cossacks of Vinzinkoro's detachment, peasants from the adjacent villages, and residents who had fled from Moscow and had been hiding in its vicinity. The Russians who entered Moscow, finding it plundered, plundered it in their turn. They continued what the French had begun. Trains of peasant carts came to Moscow to carry off to the villages what had been abandoned in the ruined houses and the streets. The Cossacks carried off what they could to their camps and the householders seized all they could find in other houses and moved it to their own, pretending that it was their property. But the first plunderers were followed by a second and a third contingent, and with increasing numbers plundering became more and more difficult and assumed more definite forms. The French found Moscow abandoned but with all the organizations of regular life, with diverse branches of commerce and craftsmanship, with luxury and governmental and religious institutions. These forms were lifeless, but still existed. There were bazaars, shops, warehouses, market stalls, granaries, for the most part still stocked with goods, and there were factories and workshops, palaces and wealthy houses filled with luxuries, 
hospitals, prisons, government offices, churches, and cathedrals. The longer the French remained, the more these forms of town life perished, until finally all was merged into one confused, lifeless scene of plunder. The more the plundering by the French continued, the more both the wealth of Moscow and the strength of its plunderers was destroyed. But plundering by the Russians, with which the reoccupation of the city began, had an opposite effect. The longer it continued, and the greater the number of people taking part in it, the more rapidly was the wealth of the city and its regular life restored. Besides the plunderers, very various people, some drawn by curiosity, some by official duties, some by self-interest, house owners, clergy, officials of all kinds, tradesmen, artisans, and peasants, streamed into Moscow as blood flows to the heart. Within a week, the peasants who came with empty carts to carry off plunder were stopped by the authorities and made to cart the corpses out of the town. Other peasants, having heard of their comrades' discomfiture, came to town bringing rye, oats, and hay, and beat down on one another's prices to below what they had been in former days. Gangs of carpenters hoping for high pay arrived in Moscow every day, and on all sides logs were being hewn, new houses built, and old charred ones repaired. Tradesmen began trading in booths. Cookshops and taverns were opened in partially burned houses. The clergy resumed the services in many churches that had not been burned. Donors contributed church property that had been stolen. Government clerks set up their baize-covered tables and their pigeonholes of documents in small rooms. The higher authorities and the police organized the distribution of goods left behind by the French. The owners of houses in which much property had been left brought there from other houses complained of the injustice of taking everything to the faceted palace in the Kremlin. Others insisted that as the French had gathered things from different houses into this or that house, it would be unfair to allow its owner to keep all that was found there. They abused the police and bribed them, made out estimates at ten times their value for government stores that had perished in the fire, and demanded relief. And Count Rostopchin wrote proclamations. End of Book 15, Chapter 14《Book Fifteen, Chapter Fifteen of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fifteen, Chapter Fifteen. At the end of January, Pierre went to Moscow and stayed in an annex of his house which had not been burned. He called on Count Rostopchin and on some acquaintances who were back in Moscow and he intended to leave for Petersburg two days later. Everybody was celebrating the victory, everything was bubbling with life in the ruined but reviving city. Everyone was pleased to see Pierre, everyone wished to meet him, and everyone questioned him about what he had seen. Pierre felt particularly well disposed toward them all, but was now instinctively on his guard for fear of binding himself in any way. To all questions put to him, whether important or quite trifling, such as, where would he live? Was he going to rebuild? When was he going to Petersburg, and would he mind taking a parcel for someone? He replied, yes, perhaps, or, I think so, and so on. He had heard that the Rostovs were at Kostroma, but the thought of Natasha seldom occurred to him. If it did, it was only as a pleasant memory of the distant past. He felt himself not only free from social obligations, but also from that feeling which it seemed to him he had aroused in himself. On the third day after his arrival, he heard from the Drubetskoys that Princess Mary was in Moscow. The death, sufferings, and last days of Prince Andrew had often occupied Pierre's thoughts, and now recurred to him with fresh vividness. Having heard at dinner that Princess Mary was in Moscow and living in her house, which had not been burned, in Vojavenka Street, he drove that same evening to see her. On his way to the house, Pierre kept thinking of Prince Andrew, of their friendship, of his various meetings with him, and especially of the last one at Borodino. 
Is it possible that he died in the bitter frame of mind he was then in? Is it possible that the meaning of life was not disclosed to him before he died? thought Pierre. He recalled Karatev and his death, and involuntarily began to compare these two men, so different and yet so similar, in that they had both lived and both died, and in the love he felt for both of them. Pierre drove up to the house of the old prince in a most serious mood. The house had escaped the fire. It showed signs of damage, but its general aspect was unchanged. The old footman, who met Pierre with a stern face, as if wishing to make the visitor feel that the absence of the old prince had not disturbed the order of things in the house, informed him that the princess had gone to her own apartments, and that she received on Sundays. "'Announce me. Perhaps she will see me,' said Pierre. "'Yes, sir,' said the man. "'Please step into the portrait gallery.' A few minutes later the footman returned with de Salle, who brought word from the princess that she would be very glad to see Pierre if he would excuse her want of ceremony and come upstairs to her apartment. In a rather low room lit by one candle sat the princess, and with her another person dressed in black. Pierre remembered that the princess always had lady companions, but who they were and what they were like he never knew or remembered. This must be one of her companions, he thought, glancing at the lady in the black dress. The princess rose quickly to meet him and held out her hand. Yes, she said looking at his altered face after he had kissed her hand. So this is how we meet again. He spoke of you even at the very last, she went on, turning her eyes from Pierre to her companion with a shyness that surprised him for an instant. I was so glad to hear of your safety. It was the first piece of good news we had received for a long time. Again the princess glanced round at her companion, with even more uneasiness in her manner, and was about to add something, but Pierre interrupted her. "'Just imagine, I knew nothing about him,' said he. "'I thought he had been killed. All I know I heard at second hand from others. I only know that he fell in with the Rostovs. What a strange coincidence!' Pierre spoke rapidly and with animation. He glanced once at the companion's face, saw her attentive and kindly gaze fixed on him, and as often happens when one is talking, felt somehow that this companion in the black dress was a good, kind, excellent creature who would not hinder his conversing freely with Princess Mary. But when he mentioned the Rostovs, Princess Mary's face expressed still greater embarrassment. She again glanced rapidly from Pierre's face to that of the lady in the black dress and said, do you really not recognize her?" Pierre looked again at the companion's pale, delicate face with its black eyes and peculiar mouth, and something near to him, long forgotten and more than sweet, looked at him from those attentive eyes. But no, it can't be, he thought. This stern, thin, pale face looks so much older. It cannot be she. It merely reminds me of her. But at that moment Princess Mary said, Natasha. And with difficulty, effort, and stress, like the opening of a door grown rusty on its hinges, a smile appeared on the face with the attentive eyes, and from that opening door came a breath of fragrance which suffused Pierre with a happiness he had long forgotten, and of which he had not even been thinking, especially at that moment. It suffused him, seized him, and enveloped him completely. When she smiled, doubt was no longer possible. It was Natasha, and he loved her. At that moment Pierre involuntarily betrayed to her, to Princess Mary, and above all to himself, a secret of which he himself had been unaware. He flushed joyfully, yet with painful distress. He tried to hide his agitation. But the more he tried to hide it, the more clearly, clearer than any words could have done, did he betray to himself, to her, and to Princess Mary, that he loved her. No, it's only the unexpectedness of it, thought Pierre. But as soon as he tried to continue the conversation he had begun with Princess Mary, he again glanced at Natasha, 
and a still deeper flush suffused his face and a still stronger agitation of mingled joy and fear seized his soul. He became confused in his speech and stopped in the middle of what he was saying. Pierre had failed to notice Natasha because he did not at all expect to see her there, but he had failed to recognize her because the change in her since he last saw her was immense. She had grown thin and pale, but that was not what made her unrecognizable. She was unrecognizable at the moment he entered because on that face, whose eyes had always shone with a suppressed smile of the joy of life, now when he first entered and glanced at her, there was not the least shadow of a smile. Only her eyes were kindly attentive and sadly interrogative. Pierre's confusion was not reflected by any confusion on Natasha's part, but only by the pleasure that just perceptibly lit up her whole face. End of Book Fifteen, Chapter Fifteen Book Fifteen, Chapter Sixteen of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fifteen, Chapter Sixteen. She has come to stay with me said Princess Mary. The Count and Countess will be here in a few days. The Countess is in a dreadful state. But it was necessary for Natasha herself to see a doctor. They insisted on her coming with me. Yes, is there a family free from sorrow now? said Pierre, addressing Natasha. You know, it happened the very day we were rescued. I saw him. What a delightful boy he was! Natasha looked at him, and by way of answer to his words her eyes widened and lit up. "'What can one say or think of as a consolation?' said Pierre. "'Nothing. Why had such a splendid boy, so full of life, to die?' "'Yes, in these days it would be hard to live without faith,' remarked Princess Mary. "'Yes, yes, that is really true,' Pierre hastily interrupted her. Why is it true? Natasha asked, looking attentively into Pierre's eyes. How can you ask why? said Princess Mary. The thought alone of what awaits. Natasha, without waiting for Princess Mary to finish, again looked inquiringly at Pierre. And because, Pierre continued, only one who believed that there is a God ruling us can bear a loss such as hers and yours. Natasha had already opened her mouth to speak, but suddenly stopped. Pierre hurriedly turned away from her and again addressed Princess Mary, asking about his friend's last days. Pierre's confusion had now almost vanished, but at the same time he felt that his freedom had also completely gone. He felt that there was now a judge of his every word and action, whose judgment mattered more to him than that of all the rest of the world. As he spoke now, he was considering what impression his words would make on Natasha. He did not purposely say things to please her, but whatever he was saying he regarded from her standpoint. Princess Mary, reluctantly as is usual in such cases, began telling of the condition in which she had found Prince Andrew. But Pierre's face quivering with emotion, his questions and his eager restless expression, gradually compelled her to go into details which she feared to recall for her own sake. "'Yes, yes, and so,' Pierre kept saying as he leaned toward her with his whole body, and eagerly listened to her story. "'Yes, yes, so he grew tranquil and softened. With all his soul he had always sought one thing, to be perfectly good, so he could not be afraid of death. The faults he had if he had any, were not of his making. So he did soften. What a happy thing that he saw you again," he added, suddenly turning to Natasha and looking at her with eyes full of tears. Natasha's face twitched. She frowned and lowered her eyes for a moment. She hesitated for an instant whether to speak or not. Yes, that was happiness, 
she then said in her quiet voice with its deep chest notes. For me it certainly was happiness. She paused. And he... he... he said he was wishing for it at the very moment I entered the room. Natasha's voice broke. She blushed, pressed her clasped hands on her knees, and then, controlling herself with an evident effort, lifted her head and began to speak rapidly. We knew nothing of it when we started from Moscow. I did not dare to ask him about it. Then suddenly Sonia told me he was traveling with us. I had no idea and could not imagine what state he was in. All I wanted was to see him and be with him," she said, trembling and breathing quickly. And not letting them interrupt her, she went on to tell what she had never yet mentioned to anyone, all she had lived through during those three weeks of their journey and life at Yaroslavl. Pierre listened to her with lips parted and eyes fixed upon her full of tears. As he listened, he did not think of Prince Andrew, nor of death, nor of what she was telling. He listened to her and felt only pity for her, for what she was suffering now while she was speaking. Princess Mary, frowning in her effort to hold back her tears, sat beside Natasha and heard for the first time the story of those last days of her brother's and Natasha's love. Evidently Natasha needed to tell that painful yet joyful tale. She spoke mingling most trifling details with the intimate secrets of her soul, and it seemed as if she could never finish. Several times she repeated the same thing twice. DeSalle's voice was heard outside the door asking whether little Nicholas might come in to say good night. "'Well, that's all, everything,' said Natasha. She got up quickly, just as Nicholas entered almost ran to the door which was hidden by curtains, struck her head against it, and rushed from the room with a moan, either of pain or sorrow. Pierre gazed at the door through which she had disappeared and did not understand why he suddenly felt all alone in the world. Princess Mary roused him from his abstraction by drawing his attention to her nephew who had entered the room. At that moment of emotional tenderness, young Nicholas' face, which resembled his father's, affected Pierre so much that when he had kissed the boy he got up quickly, took out his handkerchief, and went to the window. He wished to take leave of Princess Mary, but she would not let him go. "'No, Natasha and I sometimes don't go to sleep till after two, so please don't go. I will order supper. Go downstairs. We will come immediately.' Before Pierre left the room, Princess Mary told him, This is the first time she has talked of him like that. End of Book 15, Chapter 16「Book 15, Chapter 17 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 15, Chapter 17 Pierre was shown into the large, brightly lit dining room. A few minutes later he heard footsteps and Princess Mary entered with Natasha. Natasha was calm, though a severe and grave expression had again settled on her face. They all three of them now experienced that feeling of awkwardness which usually follows after a serious and heartfelt talk. It is impossible to go back to the same conversation, to talk of trifles is awkward, and yet the desire to speak is there and silence seems like affectation. They went silently to the table. The footman drew back the chairs and pushed them up again. Pierre unfolded his cold table napkin and, resolving to break the silence, looked at Natasha and at Princess Mary. They had evidently both formed the same resolution. The eyes of both shone with satisfaction and a confession that besides sorrow life also has joy. "'Do you take vodka, Count?' asked Princess Mary, and those words suddenly banished the shadows of the past. "'Now tell us about yourself,' said she. "'One hears such improbable wonders about you.' 
Yes, replied Pierre, with the smile of mild irony now habitual to him. They even tell me wonders I myself never dreamed of. Mary Abramovna invited me to her house and kept telling me what had happened, or ought to have happened to me. Stepan Stepanitch also instructed me how I ought to tell of my experiences. In general, I have noticed that it is very easy to be an interesting man. I am an interesting man now. People invite me out and tell me all about myself." Natasha smiled and was on the point of speaking. "'We have been told,' Princess Mary interrupted her, "'that you lost two millions in Moscow. Is that true?' "'But I am three times as rich as before,' returned Pierre. Though the position was now altered by his decision to pay his wife's debts and to rebuild his houses, Pierre still maintained that he had become three times as rich as before. "'What I have certainly gained is freedom,' he began seriously, but did not continue, noticing that this theme was too egotistic. "'And are you building?' "'Yes, Savelich says I must.' "'Tell me, you did not know of the Countess' death when you decided to remain in Moscow?' asked Princess Mary, and immediately blushed, noticing that her question, following his mention of freedom, ascribed to his words a meaning he had perhaps not intended. "'No,' answered Pierre, evidently not considering awkward the meaning Princess Mary had given to his words. "'I heard of it in Orel, and you cannot imagine how it shocked me. We were not an exemplary couple.' he added quickly, glancing at Natasha and noticing on her face curiosity as to how he would speak of his wife. But her death shocked me terribly. When two people quarrel, they are always both in fault, and one's own guilt suddenly becomes terribly serious when the other is no longer alive. And then such a death, without friends and without consolation. I am very, very sorry for her," he concluded and was pleased to notice a look of glad approval on Natasha's face. "'Yes, and so you are once more an eligible bachelor,' said Princess Mary. Pierre suddenly flushed crimson, and for a long time tried not to look at Natasha. When he ventured to glance her way again, her face was cold, stern, and he fancied even contemptuous. "'And did you really see and speak to Napoleon, as we have been told?' said Princess Mary. Pierre laughed. No, not once. Everybody seems to imagine that being taken prisoner means being Napoleon's guest. Not only did I never see him, but I heard nothing about him. I was in much lower company. Supper was over, and Pierre, who at first declined to speak about his captivity, was gradually led on to do so. But it's true that you remained in Moscow to kill Napoleon? Natasha asked with a slight smile. "'I guessed it then, when we met at the Sukarev Tower, do you remember?' Pierre admitted that it was true, and from that was gradually led by Princess Mary's questions, and especially by Natasha's, into giving a detailed account of his adventures. At first he spoke with the amused and mild irony now customary with him toward everybody, and especially toward himself but when he came to describe the horrors and sufferings he had witnessed, he was unconsciously carried away and began speaking with the suppressed emotion of a man re-experiencing in recollection strong impressions he has lived through. Princess Mary, with a gentle smile, looked now at Pierre and now at Natasha. In the whole narrative she saw only Pierre and his goodness. Natasha, leaning on her elbow, the expression of her face constantly changing with the narrative, watched Pierre with an attention that never wandered, evidently herself experiencing all that he described. Not only her look, but her exclamations and the brief question she put showed Pierre that she understood just what he wished to convey. It was clear that she understood not only what he said, but also what he wished to, but could not express in words. The account Pierre gave of the incident with the child and the woman for protecting whom he was arrested was this. It was an awful sight. Children abandoned, some in the flames. One was snatched out before my eyes. And there were women who had their things snatched off and their earrings torn out. 
he flushed and grew confused. Then a patrol arrived, and all the men, all those who are not looting, that is, were arrested, and I among them. I am sure you're not telling us everything. I am sure you did something, said Natasha, and pausing added, something fine. Pierre continued. When he spoke of the execution, he wanted to pass over the horrible details, but Natasha insisted that he should not omit anything. Pierre began to tell about Karatayev, but paused. By this time he had risen from the table and was pacing the room, Natasha following him with her eyes. Then he added, No, you can't understand what I learned from that illiterate man, that simple fellow. Yes, yes, go on, said Natasha. Where is he? They killed him almost before my eyes. And Pierre, his voice trembling continually, went on to tell of the last days of their retreat, of Karatayev's illness and his death. He told of his adventures as he had never yet recalled them. He now, as it were, saw a new meaning in all he had gone through. Now that he was telling it all to Natasha, he experienced that pleasure which a man has when women listen to him. Not clever women, who, when listening, either try to remember what they hear to enrich their minds, and when opportunity offers to retell it, or wish to adopt it to some thought of their own, and promptly contribute their own clever comments prepared in their little mental workshop, but the pleasure given by real women gifted with a capacity to select and absorb the very best a man shows of himself. Natasha, without knowing it, was all attention. She did not lose a word no single quiver in Pierre's voice, no look, no twitch of a muscle in his face, nor a single gesture. She caught the unfinished word in its flight and took it straight into her open heart, divining the secret meaning of all Pierre's mental travail. Princess Mary understood his story and sympathized with him, but she now saw something else that absorbed all her attention she saw the possibility of love and happiness between Natasha and Pierre, and the first thought of this filled her heart with gladness. It was three o'clock in the morning. The footmen came in with sad and stern faces to change the candles, but no one noticed them. Pierre finished his story. Natasha continued to look at him intently, with bright, attentive, and animated eyes, as if trying to understand something more which he had, perhaps, left untold. Pierre, in shamefaced and happy confusion, glanced occasionally at her, and tried to think what to say next to introduce a fresh subject. Princess Mary was silent. It occurred to none of them that it was three o'clock and time to go to bed. "'People speak of misfortunes and sufferings,' remarked Pierre. "'But if, at this moment, I were asked, Would you rather be what you were before you were taken prisoner, or go through all this again? Then, for heaven's sake, let me again have captivity and horseflesh. We imagine that, when we are thrown out of our usual ruts, all is lost, but it is only then that what is new and good begins. While there is life, there is happiness. There is much, much before us. I say this to you he added, turning to Natasha. "'Yes, yes,' she said, answering something quite different. "'I too should wish nothing but to relive it all from the beginning.' Pierre looked intently at her. "'Yes, and nothing more,' said Natasha. "'It's not true, not true,' cried Pierre. "'I am not to blame for being alive and wishing to live, nor you either.' Suddenly Natasha bent her head, covered her face with her hands, and began to cry. "'What is it, Natasha?' said Princess Mary. "'Nothing, nothing.' She smiled at Pierre through her tears. "'Good night. It is time for bed.' Pierre rose and took his leave. Princess Mary and Natasha met as usual in the bedroom. They talked of what Pierre had told them. Princess Mary did not express her opinion of Pierre, nor did Natasha speak of him. "'Well, good night, Mary,' said Natasha. "'Do you know, 
I am often afraid that, by not speaking of him, she met Prince Andrew, for fear of not doing justice to our feelings, we forget him. Princess Mary sighed deeply, and thereby acknowledged the justice of Natasha's remark, but she did not express agreement in words. "'Is it possible to forget?' said she. "'It did me so much good to tell all about it today. It was hard and painful, but good, very good,' said Natasha. "'I am sure he really loved him. That is why I told him. Was it all right?' she added, suddenly blushing. "'To tell Pierre? Oh, yes! What a splendid man he is!' said Princess Mary. "'Do you know, Mary?' Natasha suddenly said with a mischievous smile such as Princess Mary had not seen on her face for a long time. "'He has somehow grown so clean, smooth, and fresh, as if he had just come out of a Russian bath. Do you understand? Out of a moral bath. Isn't it true?' Yes, replied Princess Mary, he has greatly improved. With a short coat and his hair cropped, just as if, well, just as if he had come straight from the bath, Papa used to. I understand why he, Prince Andrew, liked no one so much as him, said Princess Mary. Yes, and yet he is quite different. They say men are friends when they are quite different. That must be true. Really, he is quite unlike him in everything. Yes, but he's wonderful. Well, good night, said Natasha. And the same mischievous smile lingered for a long time on her face as if it had been forgotten there. End of Book Fifteen, Chapter Seventeen Book Fifteen, Chapter Eighteen, of War and Peace, Volume Four, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Fifteen, Chapter Eighteen. It was a long time before Pierre could fall asleep that night. He paced up and down his room, now turning his thoughts on a difficult problem and frowning now suddenly shrugging his shoulders and wincing, and now smiling happily. He was thinking of Prince Andrew, of Natasha, and of their love, at one moment jealous of her past, then reproaching himself for that feeling. It was already six in the morning, and he still paced up and down the room. "'Well, what's to be done if it cannot be avoided? What's to be done? Evidently it has to be so,' said he to himself and hastily undressing he got into bed, happy and agitated but free from hesitation or indecision. Strange and impossible as such happiness seems, I must do everything that she and I may be man and wife," he told himself. A few days previously Pierre had decided to go to Petersburg on the Friday. When he awoke on the Thursday, Savelich came to ask him about packing for the journey. What? To Petersburg? What is Petersburg? Who is there in Petersburg?" he asked involuntarily, though only to himself. Oh, yes, long ago before this happened, I did for some reason mean to go to Petersburg, he reflected. Why? But perhaps I shall go. What a good fellow he is, and how attentive, and how he remembers everything, he thought, looking at Savelich's old face. And what a pleasant smile he has! "'Well, Savelich, do you still not wish to accept your freedom?' Pierre asked him. "'What's the good of freedom to me, Your Excellency? We lived under the late Count, the kingdom of heaven be his, and we have lived under you too without ever being wronged.' "'And your children?' "'The children will live just the same. With such masters one can live.' "'But what about my heirs?' said Pierre. Supposing I suddenly marry, it might happen," he added with an involuntary smile. If I may take the liberty, Your Excellency, it would be a good thing. How easy he thinks it, thought Pierre. He doesn't know how terrible it is and how dangerous. Too soon or too late, it is terrible. 
So what are your orders? Are you starting tomorrow? asked Savelich. No, I'll put it off for a bit. I'll tell you later. You must forgive the trouble I have put you to, said Pierre, and seeing Savelich smile, he thought, but how strange it is that he should not know that now there is no Petersburg for me, and that that must be settled first of all. But probably he knows it well enough and is only pretending. Shall I have a talk with him and see what he thinks? Pierre reflected. No, another time. At breakfast, Pierre told the princess, his cousin, that he had been to see Princess Mary the day before and had there met. Whom do you think? Natasha Rostova. The princess seemed to see nothing more extraordinary in that than if he had seen Anna Semenovna. Do you know her? I have seen the princess, she replied. I heard that they were arranging a match for her with young Rostov. It would be a very good thing for the Rostovs. They are said to be utterly ruined. No, I mean, do you know Natasha Rostova? I heard about that affair of hers at the time. It was a great pity. No, she either doesn't understand or is pretending, thought Pierre. Better not say anything to her, either. The princess, too, had prepared provisions for Pierre's journey. How kind they all are, thought Pierre. What is surprising is that they should trouble about these things now when it can no longer be of interest to them. And all for me. On the same day the chief of police came to Pierre, inviting him to send a representative to the faceted palace to recover things that were to be returned to their owners that day. And this man, too, thought Pierre, looking into the face of the chief of police. What a fine, good-looking officer, and how kind! Fancy bothering about such trifles now! And they actually say he is not honest and takes bribes! What nonsense! Besides, why shouldn't he take bribes? That's the way he was brought up, and everybody does it. But what a kind, pleasant face, and how he smiles as he looks at me. Pierre went to Princess Mary's to dinner. As he drove through the streets past the houses that had been burned down, he was surprised by the beauty of those ruins. The picturesqueness of the chimney stacks and tumble-down walls of the burned-out quarters of the town, stretching out and concealing one another, reminded him of the Rhine and the Colosseum. The cabmen he met and their passengers, the carpenters cutting the timber for new houses with axes, the women hawkers and the shopkeepers, all looked at him with cheerful beaming eyes that seemed to say, Ah, there he is. Let's see what will come of it. At the entrance to Princess Mary's house, Pierre felt doubtful whether he had really been there the night before, and really seen Natasha and talked to her. Perhaps I imagined it. Perhaps I shall go in and find no one there. But he had hardly entered the room before he felt her presence with his whole being by the loss of his sense of freedom. She was in the same black dress with soft folds and her hair was done the same way as the day before, but she was quite different. Had she been like this when he entered the day before, he could not for a moment have failed to recognize her. She was as he had known her almost as a child, and later on as Prince Andrew's fiancée. A bright, questioning light shone in her eyes and on her face was a friendly and strangely roguish expression. Pierre dined with them and would have spent the whole evening there, but Princess Mary was going to Vespers and Pierre left the house with her. Next day he came early, dined and stayed the whole evening. Though Princess Mary and Natasha were evidently glad to see their visitor, and though all Pierre's interest was now centered in that house, by the evening they had talked over everything and the conversation passed from one trivial topic to another and repeatedly broke off. He stayed so long that Princess Mary and Natasha exchanged glances, evidently wondering when he would go. Pierre noticed this but could not go. He felt uneasy and embarrassed, but sat on because he simply could not get up and take his leave. Princess Mary, foreseeing no end to this, rose first, and complaining of a headache began to say good night. So, you are going to Petersburg tomorrow? she asked. No, I am not going, Pierre replied hastily, in a surprised tone and as though offended. 
Yes. No. To Petersburg? Tomorrow, but I won't say good-bye yet. I will call round in case you have any commissions for me," said he, standing before Princess Mary and turning red, but not taking his departure. Natasha gave him her hand and went out. Princess Mary, on the other hand, instead of going away, sank into an armchair and looked sternly and intently at him with her deep, radiant eyes. The weariness she had plainly shown before had now quite passed off. With a deep and long-drawn sigh, she seemed to be prepared for a lengthy talk. When Natasha left the room, Pierre's confusion and awkwardness immediately vanished and were replaced by eager excitement. He quickly moved an armchair toward Princess Mary. "'Yes, I wanted to tell you,' said he, answering her look as if she had spoken. "'Princess, help me. What am I to do? Can I hope? Princess, my dear friend, listen.' I know it all. I know I am not worthy of her. I know it's impossible to speak of it now. But I want to be a brother to her. No, not that. I don't. I can't." He paused and rubbed his face and eyes with his hands. "'Well,' he went on with an evident effort at self-control and coherence, "'I don't know when I began to love her but I have loved her and her alone all my life, and I love her so that I cannot imagine life without her. I cannot propose to her at present, but the thought that perhaps she might some day be my wife, and that I may be missing that possibility, that possibility is terrible. Tell me, can I hope? Tell me what I am to do, dear princess," he added after a pause, and touched her hand as she did not reply. I am thinking of what you have told me," answered Princess Mary. This is what I will say. You are right that to speak to her of love at present— Princess Mary stopped. She was going to say that to speak of love was impossible, but she stopped because she had seen by the sudden change in Natasha two days before that she would not only not be hurt if Pierre spoke of his love, but that it was the very thing she wished for. To speak to her now wouldn't do," said the princess all the same. "'But what am I to do?' "'Leave it to me,' said Princess Mary. "'I know.' Pierre was looking into Princess Mary's eyes. "'Well, well,' he said. "'I know that she loves—will love you,' Princess Mary corrected herself. Before her words were out, Pierre had sprung up and with a frightened expression seized Princess Mary's hand. "'What makes you think so? You think I may hope? You think—' "'Yes, I think so,' said Princess Mary with a smile. "'Write to her parents and leave it to me. I will tell her when I can. I wish it to happen, and my heart tells me it will. No, it cannot be. How happy I am!' But it can't be. How happy I am! No, it can't be!" Pierre kept saying as he kissed Princess Mary's hands. "'Go to Petersburg. That will be best. And I will write to you,' she said. "'To Petersburg? Go there?' "'Very well. I'll go. But I may come again tomorrow?' Next day Pierre came to say good-bye. Natasha was less animated than she had been the day before, but that day, as he looked at her, Pierre sometimes felt as if he was vanishing and that neither he nor she existed any longer, that nothing existed but happiness. "'Is it possible? No, it can't be,' he told himself at every look, gesture, and word that filled his soul with joy. When on saying good-bye he took her thin, slender hand, he could not help holding it a little longer in his own. Is it possible that this hand, that face, those eyes, all this treasure of feminine charm so strange to me now, is it possible that it will one day be mine forever, as familiar to me as I am to myself? No, that's impossible. Goodbye, Count, she said aloud. I shall look forward very much to your return," she added in a whisper. And these simple words, 
her look and the expression on her face which accompanied them, formed for two months the subject of inexhaustible memories, interpretations, and happy meditations for Pierre. "'I shall look forward very much to your return. Yes, yes, how did she say it? Yes, I shall look forward very much to your return. Oh, how happy I am! What is happening to me? How happy I am!' said Pierre to himself. End of Book 15, Chapter 18book 15 chapter 19 of war and peace volume 4 by leo tolstoy translated by elmer maud this librivox recording is in the public domain book 15 chapter 19 there was nothing in pierre's soul now at all like what had troubled it during his courtship of elaine he did not repeat to himself with a sickening feeling of shame the words he had spoken or say Oh, why did I not say that? And whatever made me say Javouem? On the contrary, he now repeated in imagination every word that he or Natasha had spoken, and pictured every detail of her face and smile, and did not wish to diminish or add anything, but only to repeat it again and again. There was now not a shadow of doubt in his mind as to whether what he had undertaken was right or wrong. Only one terrible doubt sometimes crossed his mind. Wasn't it all a dream? Isn't Princess Mary mistaken? Am I not too conceited and self-confident? I believe all this. And suddenly Princess Mary will tell her, and she will be sure to smile and say, How strange! He must be deluding himself. Doesn't he know that he is a man, just a man, while I... I am something altogether different and higher? That was the only doubt often troubling Pierre. He did not now make any plans. The happiness before him appeared so inconceivable that if only he could attain it, it would be the end of all things. Everything ended with that. A joyful, unexpected frenzy of which he had thought himself incapable possessed him. The whole meaning of life, not for him alone, but for the whole world, seemed to him centered in his love and the possibility of being loved by her. At times everybody seemed to him to be occupied with one thing only, his future happiness. Sometimes it seemed to him that other people were all as pleased as he was himself, and merely tried to hide that pleasure by pretending to be busy with other interests. In every word and gesture he saw allusions to his happiness. He often surprised those he met by his significantly happy looks and smiles, which seemed to express a secret understanding between him and them. And when he realized that people might not be aware of his happiness, he pitied them with his whole heart, and felt a desire somehow to explain to them that all that occupied them was a mere frivolous trifle unworthy of attention. When it was suggested to him that he should enter the civil service, or when the war or any general political affairs were discussed on the assumption that everybody's welfare depended on this or that issue of events, he would listen with a mild and pitying smile and surprise people by his strange comments. But at this time he saw everybody, both those who, as he imagined, understood the real meaning of life, that is, what he was feeling, and those unfortunates who evidently did not understand it, in the bright light of the emotion that shone within himself and at once, without any effort, he saw in everyone he met everything that was good and worthy of being loved. When dealing with the affairs and papers of his dead wife, her memory aroused in him no feeling but pity that she had not known the bliss he now knew. Prince Vasily, who, having obtained a new post and some fresh decorations, was particularly proud at this time, seemed to him a pathetic, kindly old man much to be pitied. Often in afterlife, Pierre recalled this period of blissful insanity. All the views he formed of men and circumstances at this time remained true for him always. He not only did not renounce them subsequently, but when he was in doubt or inwardly at variance, he referred to the views he held at this time of his madness and they always proved correct. "'I may have appeared strange and queer then,' he thought, 
but I was not so mad as I seemed. On the contrary, I was then wiser and had more insight than at any other time, and understood all that is worth understanding in life, because, because I was happy. Pierre's insanity consisted in not waiting, as he used to do, to discover personal attributes which he termed good qualities in people before loving them. His heart was now overflowing with love and by loving people without cause he discovered indubitable causes for loving them. End of Book 15, Chapter 19「Book 15, Chapter 20 Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 15, Chapter 20 After Pierre's departure that first evening, when Natasha had said to Princess Mary with a gaily mocking smile, "'He looks just—yes, just as if he had come out of a Russian bath, in a short coat and with his hair cropped.' Something hidden and unknown to herself but irrepressible awoke in Natasha's soul. Everything—her face, walk, look and voice—was suddenly altered. To her own surprise a power of life and hope of happiness rose to the surface and demanded satisfaction. From that evening she seemed to have forgotten all that had happened to her. She no longer complained of her position, did not say a word about the past, and no longer feared to make happy plans for the future. She spoke a little of Pierre, but when Princess Mary mentioned him a long extinguished light once more kindled in her eyes and her lips curved with a strange smile. The change that took place in Natasha at first surprised Princess Mary, but when she understood its meaning it grieved her. "'Can she have loved my brother so little as to be able to forget him so soon?' she thought when she reflected on the change. But when she was with Natasha she was not vexed with her and did not reproach her. The reawakened power of life that had seized Natasha was so evidently irrepressible and unexpected by her that in her presence Princess Mary felt that she had no right to reproach her even in her heart. Natasha gave herself up so fully and frankly to this new feeling that she did not try to hide the fact that she was no longer sad but bright and cheerful. When Princess Mary returned to her room after her nocturnal talk with Pierre, Natasha met her on the threshold. "'He has spoken, yes?' He has spoken," she repeated, and a joyful yet pathetic expression which seemed to beg forgiveness for her joy settled on Natasha's face. I wanted to listen at the door, but I knew you would tell me. Understandable and touching as the look with which Natasha gazed at her seemed to Princess Mary, as sorry as she was to see her agitation, these words pained her for a moment. She remembered her brother and his love. But what's to be done? She can't help it," thought the princess. And with a sad and rather stern look she told Natasha all that Pierre had said. On hearing that he was going to Petersburg Natasha was astounded. "'To Petersburg?' she repeated as if unable to understand. But noticing the grieved expression on Princess Mary's face she guessed the reason of that sadness and suddenly began to cry. "'Mary,' said she, "'tell me what I should do. I am afraid of being bad. Whatever you tell me, I will do. Tell me.' "'You love him?' "'Yes,' whispered Natasha. "'Then why are you crying?' "'I am happy for your sake,' said Princess Mary, who, because of those tears, quite forgave Natasha's joy. "'It won't be just yet. Some day.' Think what fun it will be when I am his wife and you marry Nicholas. Natasha, I have asked you not to speak of that. Let us talk about you." They were silent a while. "'But why go to Petersburg?' Natasha suddenly asked, and hastily replied to her own question. "'But no, no, he must. Yes, Mary, he must.' End of Book 15, Chapter 20 
First Epilogue, Chapter 1, of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, 1813-1820 to 1820. Chapter 1 Seven years have passed. The storm-tossed sea of European history had subsided within its shores and seemed to have become calm, but the mysterious forces that move humanity, mysterious because the laws of their motion are unknown to us, continue to operate. Though the surface of the sea of history seemed motionless, the movement of humanity went on as unceasingly as the flow of time. Various groups of people formed and dissolved. The coming formation and dissolution of kingdoms and displacement of peoples was in course of preparation. The sea of history was not driven spasmodically from shore to shore as previously. It was seething in its depths. Historic figures were not borne by the waves from one shore to another as before, they now seemed to rotate on one spot. The historical figures at the head of armies, who formerly reflected the movement of the masses by ordering wars, campaigns, and battles, now reflected the restless movement by political and diplomatic combinations, laws, and treaties. The historians call this activity of the historical figures the reaction. In dealing with this period, they sternly condemn the historical personages, who, in their opinion, caused what they describe as the reaction. All the well-known people of that period, from Alexander and Napoleon to Madame de Stael, Photius, Schelling, Fichte, Chateaubriand, and the rest, pass before their stern judgment seat and are acquitted or condemned, according to whether they conduce to progress or to reaction. According to their accounts, a reaction took place at that time in Russia also, and the chief culprit was Alexander I, the same man who, according to them, was the chief cause of the liberal movement at the commencement of his reign, being the savior of Russia. There is no one in Russian literature now, from schoolboy essayist to learned historian, who does not throw his little stone at Alexander for things he did wrong at this period of his reign. He ought to have acted in this way and in that way. In this case he did well, and in that case badly. He behaved admirably at the beginning of his reign and during 1812, but acted badly by giving a constitution to Poland, forming the Holy Alliance, entrusting power to Erechtheev, favoring Golitsyn and his mysticism, and afterwards Shishkov and Photius. He also acted badly by concerning himself with the active army and disbanding the Semenov regiment. It would have taken a dozen pages to enumerate all the reproaches the historians address to him, based on their knowledge of what is good for humanity. What do these reproaches mean? Do not the very actions for which the historians praise Alexander I, the liberal attempts at the beginning of his reign, his struggle with Napoleon, the firmness he displayed in 1812 and the campaign of 1813, flow from the same sources? the circumstances of his birth, education, and life, that made his personality what it was and from which the actions for which they blame him, the Holy Alliance, the restoration of Poland, and the reaction of 1820 and later, also flowed? In what does the substance of those reproaches lie? It lies in the fact that an historical character like Alexander I, standing on the highest possible pinnacle of human power with the blinding light of history focused upon him, a character exposed to those strongest of all influences, the intrigues, flattery, and self-deception inseparable from power, a character who at every moment of his life felt a responsibility for all that was happening in Europe, and not a fictitious but a live character, who like every man had his personal habits, passions, and impulses toward goodness, beauty, and truth. That this character, though not lacking in virtue, the historians do not accuse him of that, had not the same conception of the welfare of humanity fifty years ago as a present-day professor who, from his youth upwards, has been occupied with learning, that is, with books and lectures and with taking notes from them. But even if we assume that fifty years ago Alexander I was mistaken in his view of what was good for the people, 
we must inevitably assume that the historian who judges Alexander will also, after the lapse of some time, turn out to be mistaken in his view of what is good for humanity. This assumption is all the more natural and inevitable, because, watching the movement of history, we see that every year, and with each new writer, opinion as to what is good for mankind changes. So that what once seemed good, ten years later seems bad and vice versa. And what is more, we find at one and the same time quite contradictory views as to what is bad and what is good in history. Some people regard giving a constitution to Poland and forming the Holy Alliance as praiseworthy in Alexander, while others regard it as blameworthy. The activity of Alexander or of Napoleon cannot be called useful or harmful, for it is impossible to say for what it was useful or harmful. If that activity displeases somebody, this is only because it does not agree with his limited understanding of what is good. Whether the preservation of my father's house in Moscow, or the glory of the Russian arms, or the prosperity of the Petersburg and other universities, or the freedom of Poland, or the greatness of Russia, or the balance of power in Europe, or a certain kind of European culture called progress appear to me to be good or bad, I must admit that, besides these things, the action of every historic character has other more general purposes inaccessible to me. But let us assume that what is called science can harmonize all contradictions, and possesses an unchanging standard of good and bad by which to try historic characters and events. Let us say that Alexander could have done everything differently. Let us say that with guidance from those who blame him, and who profess to know the ultimate aim of the movement of humanity, he might have arranged matters according to the program his present accusers would have given him, of nationality, freedom, equality, and progress. These, I think, cover the ground. Let us assume that this program was possible, and had then been formulated, and that Alexander had acted on it. What would then have become of the activity of all those who opposed the tendency that then prevailed in the government, an activity that in the opinion of the historians was good and beneficent? Their activity would not have existed. There would have been no life. There would have been nothing. If we admit that human life can be ruled by reason, the possibility of life is destroyed. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 1《1st Epilogue, Chapter 2, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 2 If we assume, as the historians do, that great men lead humanity to the attainment of certain ends, the greatness of Russia or of France, the balance of power in Europe, the diffusion of the ideas of the revolution, general progress, or anything else, then it is impossible to explain the facts of history without introducing the conceptions of chance and genius. If the aim of the European wars at the beginning of the nineteenth century had been the aggrandizement of Russia, that aim might have been accomplished without all the preceding wars and without the invasion. If the aim was the aggrandizement of France, that might have been attained without the revolution and without the empire. If the aim was the dissemination of ideas, the printing press could have accomplished that much better than warfare. If the aim was the progress of civilization, it is easy to see that there are other ways of diffusing civilization more expedient than by the destruction of wealth and of human lives. Why did it happen in this and not some other way? Because it happened so. Chance created the situation, genius utilized it, says history. But what is chance? What is genius? The words chance and genius do not denote any really existing thing, and therefore cannot be defined. These words only denote a certain stage of understanding of phenomena. I do not know why a certain event occurs, I think that I cannot know it. So I do not try to know it, and I talk about chance. I see a force producing effects beyond the scope of ordinary human agencies. I do not understand why this occurs, 
and I talk of genius. To a herd of rams, the ram the herdsman drives each evening into a special enclosure to feed and that becomes twice as fat as the others, must seem to be a genius. And it must appear an astonishing conjunction of genius with a whole series of extraordinary chances that this ram, who instead of getting into the general fold every evening, goes into a special enclosure where there are oats, this very ram, swelling with fat, is killed for meat. But the rams need only cease to suppose that all that happens to them happens solely for the attainment of their sheepish aims. They need only admit that what happens to them may also have purposes beyond their ken, and they will at once perceive a unity and coherence in what happened to the ram that was fattened. Even if they do not know for what purpose they are fattened, they will at least know that all that happened to the ram did not happen accidentally, and will no longer need the conceptions of chance or genius. Only by renouncing our claim to discern a purpose immediately intelligible to us, and admitting the ultimate purpose to be beyond our ken, may we discern the sequence of experiences in the lives of historic characters, and perceive the cause of the effect they produce, incommensurable with ordinary human capabilities, and then the words chance and genius become superfluous. We need only confess that we do not know the purpose of the European convulsions, and that we know only the facts, that is, the murders, first in France, then in Italy, in Africa, in Prussia, in Austria, in Spain, and in Russia, and that the movements from the west to the east and from the east to the west form the essence and purpose of these events, and not only shall we have no need to see exceptional ability and genius in Napoleon and Alexander, but we shall be unable to consider them to be anything but like other men, and we shall not be obliged to have recourse to chance for an explanation of those small events which made these people what they were, but it will be clear that all those small events were inevitable. By discarding a claim to knowledge of the ultimate purpose, we shall clearly perceive that just as one cannot imagine a blossom or seed for any single plant better suited to it than those it produces, so it is impossible to imagine any two people more completely adapted down to the smallest detail for the purpose they had to fulfill than Napoleon and Alexander with all their antecedents. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 2《First Epilogue Chapter 3 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — First Epilogue Chapter 3 The fundamental and essential significance of the European events of the beginning of the nineteenth century lies in the movement of the mass of the European peoples from west to east, and afterwards from east to west. The commencement of that movement was the movement from west to east. For the peoples of the west to be able to make their warlike movement to Moscow, it was necessary, one, that they should form themselves into a military group of a size able to endure a collision with the warlike military group of the east, two, that they should abandon all established traditions and customs, and three, that during their military movement they should have at their head a man who could justify to himself and to them the deceptions, robberies, and murders which would have to be committed during that movement. And beginning with the French Revolution, the old inadequately large group was destroyed, as well as the old habits and traditions, and step by step a group was formed of larger dimensions with new customs and traditions and a man was produced who would stand at the head of the coming movement and bear the responsibility for all that had to be done. A man without convictions, without habits, without traditions, without a name, and not even a Frenchman, emerges by what seem the strangest chances from among all the seething French parties, and without joining any one of them is borne forward to a prominent position. The ignorance of his colleagues, the weakness and insignificance of his opponents, the frankness of his falsehoods, and the dazzling and self-confident limitations of this man raise him to the head of the army. The brilliant qualities of the soldiers of the army sent to Italy, his opponents' reluctance to fight, 
and his own childish audacity and self-confidence secure him military fame. Innumerable so-called chances accompany him everywhere. The disfavor into which he falls with the rulers of France turns to his advantage. His attempts to avoid his predestined path are unsuccessful. He is not received into the Russian service, and the appointment he seeks in Turkey comes to nothing. During the war in Italy, he is several times on the verge of destruction, and each time is saved in an unexpected manner. Owing to various diplomatic considerations, the Russian armies, just those which might have destroyed his prestige, do not appear upon the scene till he is no longer there. On his return from Italy, he finds the government in Paris in a process of dissolution, in which all those who are in it are inevitably wiped out and destroyed and, by chance, an escape from this dangerous position presents itself in the form of an aimless and senseless expedition to Africa. Again, so-called chance accompanies him. Impregnable Malta surrenders without a shot. His most reckless schemes are crowned with success. The enemy's fleet, which subsequently did not let a single boat pass, allows his entire army to elude it. In Africa, a whole series of outrages are committed against the almost unarmed inhabitants. And the men who commit these crimes, especially their leader, assure themselves that this is admirable, this is glory, it resembles Caesar and Alexander the Great and is therefore good. This ideal of glory and grandeur, which consists not merely in considering nothing wrong that one does, but in priding oneself on every crime one commits, ascribing to it an incomprehensible supernatural significance. That ideal, destined to guide this man and his associates, has scope for its development in Africa. Whatever he does succeeds. The plague does not touch him. The cruelty of murdering prisoners is not imputed to him as a fault. His childishly rash, uncalled-for, and ignoble departure from Africa, leaving his comrades in distress, is set down to his credit, and again the enemy's fleet twice lets him slip past. When, intoxicated by the crimes he has committed so successfully, he reaches Paris, the dissolution of the Republican government, which a year earlier might have ruined him, has reached its extreme limit, and his presence there now as a newcomer free from party entanglements can only serve to exalt him, and though he himself has no plan, he is quite ready for his new role. He had no plan, he was afraid of everything, but the party snatched at him and demanded his participation. He alone, with his ideal of glory and grandeur developed in Italy and Egypt, his insane self-adulation, his boldness in crime and frankness in lying, he alone could justify what had to be done. He is needed for the place that awaits him and so almost apart from his will and despite his indecision, his lack of a plan and all his mistakes, he is drawn into a conspiracy that aims at seizing power and the conspiracy is crowned with success. He is pushed into a meeting of the legislature. In alarm he wishes to flee, considering himself lost. He pretends to fall into a swoon and says senseless things that should have ruined him. But the once proud and shrewd rulers of France, feeling that their part is played out, are even more bewildered than he, and do not say the words they should have said to destroy him and retain their power. Chance, millions of chances give him power, and all the men, as if by agreement, cooperate to confirm that power. Chance forms the characters of the rulers of France, who submit to him. Chance forms the character of Paul I of Russia, who recognizes his government. Chance contrives a plot against him, which not only fails to harm him, but confirms his power. Chance puts the Duke d'Anguien in his hands and unexpectedly causes him to kill him, thereby convincing the mob more forcibly than in any other way that he had the right since he had the might. Chance contrives that though he directs all his efforts to prepare an expedition against England, which would inevitably have ruined him, he never carries out that intention, but unexpectedly falls upon Mack and the Austrians, who surrender without a battle. 
chance and genius give him the victory at Austerlitz. And by chance all men, not only the French but all Europe, except England which does not take part in the events about to happen, despite their former horror and detestation of his crimes, now recognize his authority, the title he has given himself, and his ideal of grandeur and glory, which seems excellent and reasonable to them all. As if measuring themselves and preparing for the coming movement, the Western forces pushed toward the East several times in 1805, 1806, 1807, and 1809, gaining strength and growing. In 1811 the group of people that had formed in France unites into one group with the peoples of Central Europe. The strength of the justification of the man who stands at the head of the movement grows with the increased size of the group. During the ten-year preparatory period this man had formed relations with all the crowned heads of Europe. The discredited rulers of the world can oppose no reasonable ideal to the insensate Napoleonic ideal of glory and grandeur. One after another they hasten to display their insignificance before him. The King of Prussia sends his wife to seek the great man's mercy. The Emperor of Austria considers it a favor that this man receives a daughter of the Caesars into his bed. The Pope, the guardian of all that the nations hold sacred, utilizes religion for the aggrandizement of the great man. It is not Napoleon who prepares himself for the accomplishment of his role, so much as all those round him who prepare him to take on himself the whole responsibility for what is happening and has to happen. There is no step, no crime, or petty fraud he commits which in the mouths of those around him is not at once represented as a great deed. The most suitable fete the Germans can devise for him is a celebration of Jena and Auerstadt. Not only is he great, but so are his ancestors, his brothers, his stepsons, and his brothers-in-law. Everything is done to deprive him of the remains of his reason and to prepare him for his terrible part. And when he is ready, so too are the forces. The invasion pushes eastward and reaches its final goal, Moscow. That city is taken. The Russian army suffers heavier losses than the opposing armies had suffered in the former war from Austerlitz to Wagram. But suddenly, instead of those chances and that genius which hitherto had so consistently led him by an uninterrupted series of successes to the predestined goal, an innumerable sequence of inverse chances occur from the cold in his head at Borodino to the sparks which set Moscow on fire and the frosts, and instead of genius, stupidity and immeasurable baseness become evident. The invaders flee, turn back, flee again, and all the chances are now not for Napoleon but always against him. A counter-movement is then accomplished from east to west with a remarkable resemblance to the preceding movement from west to east. Attempted drives from east to west, similar to the contrary movements in 1805, 1807, and 1809, precede the great western movement. There is the same coalescence into a group of enormous dimensions, the same adhesion of the people of Central Europe to the movement, the same hesitation midway, and the same increasing rapidity as the goal is approached. Paris, the ultimate goal, is reached. The Napoleonic government and army are destroyed. Napoleon himself is no longer of any account. All his actions are evidently pitiful and mean, but again an inexplicable chance occurs. The Allies detest Napoleon, whom they regard as the cause of their sufferings. Deprived of power and authority, his crimes and his craft exposed, he should have appeared to them what he appeared ten years previously and one year later an outlawed brigand. But by some strange chance no one perceives this. His part is not yet ended. The man who ten years before and a year later was considered an outlawed brigand is sent to an island two days' sail from France, which for some reason is presented to him as his dominion, and guards are given to him and millions of money are paid him. End of First Epilogue Chapter 3《First Epilogue Chapter 4 of War and Peace 
Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 4 The flood of nations begins to subside into its normal channels. The waves of the great movement abate, and on the calm surface eddies are formed in which float the diplomatists, who imagine that they have caused the floods to abate. But the smooth sea again suddenly becomes disturbed. The diplomatists think that their disagreements are the cause of this fresh pressure of natural forces. They anticipate war between their sovereigns. The position seems to them insoluble. But the wave they feel to be rising does not come from the quarter they expect. It rises again from the same point as before, Paris. The last backwash of the movement from the west occurs, a backwash which serves to solve the apparently insuperable diplomatic difficulties and ends the military movement of that period of history. The man who had devastated France returns to France alone, without any conspiracy and without soldiers. Any guard might arrest him, but by strange chance no one does so and all rapturously greet the man they cursed the day before and will curse again a month later. This man is still needed to justify the final collective act. That act is performed. The last role is played. The actor is bidden to disrobe and wash off his powder and paint. He will not be wanted any more. And some years pass during which he plays a pitiful comedy to himself in solitude on his island justifying his actions by intrigues and lies when the justification is no longer needed, and displaying to the whole world what it was that people had mistaken for strength as long as an unseen hand directed his actions. The manager, having brought the drama to a close and stripped the actor, shows him to us. See what you believed in. This is he. Do you now see that it was not he but I who moved you? But, dazed by the force of the movement, it was long before people understood this. Still greater coherence and inevitability is seen in the life of Alexander I, the man who stood at the head of the counter-movement from east to west. What was needed for him, who, overshadowing others, stood at the head of that movement from east to west? What was needed was a sense of justice and a sympathy with European affairs, but a remote sympathy not dulled by petty interests. A moral superiority over those sovereigns of the day who cooperated with him, a mild and attractive personality, and a personal grievance against Napoleon. And all this was found in Alexander I. All this had been prepared by innumerable so-called chances in his life, his education, his early liberalism, the advisers who surrounded him, and by Austerlitz and Tilsit and Erfurt. During the National War he was inactive because he was not needed. But as soon as the necessity for a general European war presented itself, he appeared in his place at the given moment, and, uniting the nations of Europe, led them to the goal. The goal was reached. After the final war of 1815, Alexander possesses all possible power. How does he use it? Alexander I, the pacifier of Europe, the man who from his early years had striven only for his people's welfare, the originator of the liberal innovations in his fatherland. Now that he seemed to possess the utmost power and therefore to have the possibility of bringing about the welfare of his peoples, at the time when Napoleon in exile was drawing up childish and mendacious plans of how he would have made mankind happy had he retained power, Alexander I, having fulfilled his mission and feeling the hand of God upon him, suddenly recognizes the insignificance of that supposed power, turns away from it, and gives it into the hands of contemptible men whom he despises, saying only, Not unto us, not unto us, but unto thy name. I, too, am a man like the rest of you. Let me live like a man, and think of my soul and of God." As the sun and each atom of ether is a sphere complete in itself, and yet at the same time only a part of a whole too immense for man to comprehend, 
so each individual has within himself his own aims, and yet has them to serve a general purpose incomprehensible to man. A bee settling on a flower has stung a child, and the child is afraid of bees and declares that bees exist to sting people. A poet admires the bee sucking from the chalice of a flower and says it exists to suck the fragrance of flowers. A beekeeper, seeing the bee collect pollen from flowers and carry it to the hive, says that it exists to gather honey. Another beekeeper, who has studied the life of the hive more closely, says that the bee gathers pollen dust to feed the young bees and rear a queen, and that it exists to perpetuate its race. A botanist notices that the bee flying with the pollen of a male flower to a pistol fertilizes the latter, and sees in this the purpose of the bee's existence. Another, observing the migration of plants, notices that the bee helps in this work, and may say that in this lies the purpose of the bee. But the ultimate purpose of the bee is not exhausted by the first, the second, or any of the processes the human mind can discern. The higher the human intellect rises in the discovery of these purposes, the more obvious it becomes that the ultimate purpose is beyond our comprehension. All that is accessible to man is the relation of the life of the bee to other manifestations of life. And so it is with the purpose of historic characters and nations. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 4『First Epilogue, Chapter 5, of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • First Epilogue, Chapter 5 Natasha's wedding to Bazukov, which took place in 1813, was the last happy event in the family of the old Rostovs. Count Ilya Rostov died that same year and, as always happens, after the father's death the family group broke up. The events of the previous year, the burning of Moscow and the flight from it, the death of Prince Andrew, Natasha's despair, Petya's death and the old countess' grief fell blow after blow on the old count's head. He seemed to be unable to understand the meaning of all these events, and bowed his old head in a spiritual sense as if expecting and inviting further blows which would finish him. He seemed now frightened and distraught, and now unnaturally animated and enterprising. The arrangements for Natasha's marriage occupied him for a while. He ordered dinners and suppers, and obviously tried to appear cheerful, but his cheerfulness was not infectious as it used to be. On the contrary, it evoked the compassion of those who knew and liked him. When Pierre and his wife had left, he grew very quiet and began to complain of depression. A few days later he fell ill and took to his bed. He realized from the first that he would not get up again, despite the doctor's encouragement. The countess passed a fortnight in an armchair by his pillow without undressing. Every time she gave him his medicine he sobbed and silently kissed her hand. On his last day, sobbing, he asked her and his absent son to forgive him for having dissipated their property, that being the chief fault of which he was conscious. After receiving communion and unction he quietly died, and next day a throng of acquaintances who came to pay their last respects to the deceased filled the house rented by the Rostovs. All these acquaintances, who had so often dined and danced at his house and had so often laughed at him, now said, with a common feeling of self-reproach and emotion, as if justifying themselves, "'Well, whatever he may have been, he was a most worthy man. You don't meet such men nowadays.' and which of us has not weaknesses of his own?" It was just when the Count's affairs had become so involved that it was impossible to say what would happen if he lived another year that he unexpectedly died. Nicholas was with the Russian army in Paris when the news of his father's death reached him. He at once resigned his commission, and without waiting for it to be accepted took leave of absence and went to Moscow. The state of the Count's affairs became quite obvious a month after his death, surprising everyone by the immense total of small debts the existence of which no one had suspected. The debts amounted to double the value of the property. 
Friends and relations advised Nicholas to decline the inheritance. But he regarded such a refusal as a slur on his father's memory, which he held sacred, and therefore would not hear of refusing and accepted the inheritance together with the obligation to pay the debts. The creditors who had so long been silent, restrained by a vague but powerful influence exerted on them while he lived by the Count's careless good nature, all proceeded to enforce their claims at once. As always happens in such cases, rivalry sprang up as to which should get paid first, and those who, like Matenka, held promissory notes given them as presents, now became the most exacting of the creditors. Nicholas was allowed no respite and no peace, and those who had seemed to pity the old man, the cause of their losses, if they were losses, now remorselessly pursued the young heir who had voluntarily undertaken the debts and was obviously not guilty of contracting them. Not one of the plans Nicholas tried succeeded. The estate was sold by auction for half its value, and half the debts still remained unpaid. Nicholas accepted thirty thousand roubles offered him by his brother-in-law Bazukov to pay off debts he regarded as genuinely due for value received. And to avoid being in prison for the remainder, as the creditors threatened, he re-entered the government service. He could not rejoin the army, where he would have been made a colonel at the next vacancy, for his mother now clung to him as her one hold on life, and so, despite his reluctance to remain in Moscow, among people who had known him before, and despite his abhorrence of the civil service, he accepted a post in Moscow in that service, doffed the uniform of which he was so fond, and moved with his mother and Sonia to a small house on the Sivtsev Rajok. Natasha and Pierre were living in Petersburg at the time and had no clear idea of Nicholas' circumstances. Having borrowed money from his brother-in-law, Nicholas tried to hide his wretched condition from him. His position was the more difficult because with his salary of twelve hundred roubles he had not only to keep himself, his mother and Sonia, but had to shield his mother from the knowledge of their poverty. The Countess could not conceive of life without the luxurious conditions she had been used to from childhood, and, unable to realize how hard it was for her son, kept demanding now a carriage, which they did not keep, to send for a friend, now some expensive article of food for herself, or wine for her son, or money to buy a present as a surprise for Natasha or Sonia, or for Nicholas himself. Sonia kept house, attended on her aunt, read to her, put up with her whims and secret ill-will, and helped Nicholas to conceal their poverty from the old countess. Nicholas felt himself irredeemably indebted to Sonia for all she was doing for his mother, and greatly admired her patience and devotion, but tried to keep aloof from her. He seemed in his heart to reproach her for being too perfect, and because there was nothing to reproach her with. She had all that people are valued for, but little that could have made him love her. He felt that the more he valued her, the less he loved her. He had taken her at her word when she wrote giving him his freedom, and now behaved as if all that had passed between them had been long forgotten and could never in any case be renewed. Nicholas' position became worse and worse. The idea of putting something aside out of his salary proved a dream. Not only did he not save anything, but to comply with his mother's demands he even incurred some small debts. He could see no way out of this situation. The idea of marrying some rich woman, which was suggested to him by his female relations, was repugnant to him. The other way out, his mother's death, never entered his head. He wished for nothing and hoped for nothing, and deep in his heart experienced a gloomy and stern satisfaction in an uncomplaining endurance of his position. He tried to avoid his old acquaintances with their commiseration and offensive offers of assistance. He avoided all distraction and recreation, and even at home did nothing but play cards with his mother, pace silently up and down the room, and smoke one pipe after another. He seemed carefully to cherish within himself the gloomy mood which alone enabled him to endure his position. End of First Epilogue Chapter 5《First Epilogue》Chapter 6 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, 
Translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 6 At the beginning of winter Princess Mary came to Moscow. From reports current in town she learned how the Rostovs were situated, and how the son has sacrificed himself for his mother, as people were saying. "'I never expected anything else of him,' said Princess Mary to herself, feeling a joyous sense of her love for him. Remembering her friendly relations with all the Rostovs which had made her almost a member of the family, she thought it her duty to go to see them. But remembering her relations with Nicholas and Veronezh, she was shy about doing so. Making a great effort, she did, however, go to call on them a few weeks after her arrival in Moscow. Nicholas was the first to meet her, as the Countess' room could only be reached through his. But instead of being greeted with pleasure as she had expected, at his first glance at her his face assumed a cold, stiff, proud expression she had not seen on it before. He inquired about her health, led the way to his mother, and having sat there for five minutes, left the room. When the princess came out of the countess' room Nicholas met her again, and with marked solemnity and stiffness accompanied her to the anteroom. To her remarks about his mother's health he made no reply. "'What's that to you? Leave me in peace,' his look seemed to say. "'Why does she come prowling here? What does she want?' I can't bear these ladies and all these civilities," said he aloud in Sonia's presence, evidently unable to repress his vexation after the princess' carriage had disappeared. "'Oh, Nicholas, how can you talk like that?' cried Sonia, hardly able to conceal her delight. "'She is so kind, and Mama is so fond of her.' Nicholas did not reply, and tried to avoid speaking of the princess any more but after her visit the old countess spoke of her several times a day. She sang her praises, insisted that her son must call on her, expressed a wish to see her often, but yet always became ill-humoured when she began to talk about her. Nicholas tried to keep silence when his mother spoke of the princess, but his silence irritated her. "'She is a very admirable and excellent young woman,' said she, "'and you must go and call on her.' You would at least be seeing somebody, and I think it must be dull for you only seeing us." "'But I don't in the least want to, Mama." "'You used to want to, and now you don't. Really, I don't understand you, my dear. One day you are dull, and the next you refuse to see anyone." "'But I never said I was dull.' "'Why, you said yourself you don't want even to see her. She is a very admirable young woman, and you always liked her. But now, suddenly, you have got some notion or other in your head. You hide everything from me." "'Not at all, Mama." "'If I were asking you to do something disagreeable now, but I only ask you to return a call. One would think mere politeness required it. Well, I have asked you, and now I won't interfere any more since you have secrets from your mother." "'Well, then, I'll go if you wish it.' "'It doesn't matter to me. I only wish it for your sake." Nicholas sighed, bit his moustache, and laid out the cards for a patience, trying to divert his mother's attention to another topic. The same conversation was repeated next day, and the day after, and the day after that. After her visit to the Rostovs and her unexpectedly chilly reception by Nicholas, Princess Mary confessed to herself that she had been right in not wishing to be the first to call. I expected nothing else," she told herself, calling her pride to her aid. I have nothing to do with him, and I only wanted to see the old lady, who is always kind to me and to whom I am under many obligations. But she could not pacify herself with these reflections. A feeling akin to remorse troubled her when she thought of her visit. Though she had firmly resolved not to call on the Rostovs again and to forget the whole matter, she felt herself all the time in an awkward position. And when she asked herself what distressed her, she had to admit that it was her relation to Rostov. His cold, polite manner did not express his feeling for her, she knew that, but it concealed something, and until she could discover what that something was, she felt that she could not be at ease. 
One day in midwinter, when sitting in the schoolroom attending to her nephew's lessons, she was informed that Rostov had called. With a firm resolution not to betray herself and not show her agitation, she sent for Mademoiselle Bourienne and went with her to the drawing-room. Her first glance at Nicholas's face told her that he had only come to fulfill the demands of politeness, and she firmly resolved to maintain the tone in which he addressed her. They spoke of the Countess' health, of their mutual friends, of the latest war news, and when the ten minutes required by propriety had elapsed after which a visitor may rise, Nicholas got up to say good-bye. With Mademoiselle Bourienne's help, the Princess had maintained the conversation very well, but at the very last moment, just when he rose, she was so tired of talking of what did not interest her, and her mind was so full of the question why she alone was granted so little happiness in life, that in a fit of absent-mindedness she sat still, her luminous eyes gazing fixedly before her, not noticing that he had risen. Nicholas glanced at her, and wishing to appear not to notice her abstraction, made some remark to Mademoiselle Bourienne, and then again looked at the princess. She still sat motionless, with a look of suffering on her gentle face. He suddenly felt sorry for her, and was vaguely conscious that he might be the cause of the sadness her face expressed. He wished to help her and say something pleasant, but could think of nothing to say. "'Good-bye, princess,' said he. She started, flushed, and sighed deeply. "'Oh, I beg your pardon.' she said, as if waking up. "'Are you going already, Count? Well, then, good-bye. Oh, but the cushion for the Countess!' "'Wait a moment, I'll fetch it,' said Mademoiselle Bourienne, and she left the room. They both sat silent, with an occasional glance at one another. "'Yes, Princess,' said Nicholas at last, with a sad smile. "'It doesn't seem long ago since we first met at Bogacharovo. But how much water has flowed since then! In what distress we all seem to be then! Yet I would give much to bring back that time. But there's no bringing it back." Princess Mary gazed intently into his eyes with her own luminous ones as he said this. She seemed to be trying to fathom the hidden meaning of his words which would explain his feeling for her. "'Yes, yes,' said she but you have no reason to regret the past, Count. As I understand your present life, I think you will always recall it with satisfaction, because the self-sacrifice that fills it now. I cannot accept your praise. He interrupted her hurriedly. On the contrary, I continually reproach myself. But this is not at all an interesting or cheerful subject. His face again resumed its former stiff and cold expression but the princess had caught a glimpse of the man she had known and loved, and it was to him that she now spoke. "'I thought you would allow me to tell you this,' she said. "'I had come so near to you, and to all your family, that I thought you would not consider my sympathy misplaced, but I was mistaken.' And suddenly her voice trembled. "'I don't know why,' she continued, recovering herself, "'but you used to be different.' and there are a thousand reasons why, laying special emphasis on the why. Thank you, Princess, he said softly. Sometimes it is hard. So that's why, that's why, a voice whispered in Princess Mary's soul. No, it was not only that gay, kind and frank look, not only that handsome exterior that I loved in him. I divined his noble, resolute, self-sacrificing spirit, too," she said to herself. Yes, he is poor now, and I am rich. Yes, that's the only reason. Yes, were it not for that. And remembering his former tenderness, and looking now at his kind, sorrowful face, she suddenly understood the cause of his coldness. But why, Count, why? she almost cried unconsciously moving closer to him. "'Why? Tell me! You must tell me!' He was silent. "'I don't understand your why, Count,' she continued. "'But it's hard for me. I confess it. For some reason you wish to deprive me of our former friendship, and that hurts me. 
there were tears in her eyes and in her voice. "'I have had so little happiness in life that every loss is hard for me to bear. Excuse me, good-bye.' And suddenly she began to cry and was hurrying from the room. "'Princess, for God's sake!' he exclaimed, trying to stop her. "'Princess!' She turned round. For a few seconds they gazed silently into one another's eyes, and what had seemed impossible and remote suddenly became possible, inevitable, and very near. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 6《First Epilogue Chapter 7 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《First Epilogue Chapter 7 》In the winter of 1813 Nicholas married Princess Mary and moved to Bald Hills with his wife, his mother, and Sonia. Within four years he had paid off all his remaining debts without selling any of his wife's property, and having received a small inheritance on the death of a cousin, he paid his debt to Pierre as well. In another three years, by 1820, he had so managed his affairs that he was able to buy a small estate adjoining Bald Hills, and was negotiating to buy back Otradno, that being his pet dream. Having started farming from necessity, he soon grew so devoted to it that it became his favorite and almost his sole occupation. Nicholas was a plain farmer. He did not like innovations, especially the English ones then coming into vogue. He laughed at theoretical treatises on estate management, disliked factories, the raising of expensive products, and the buying of expensive seed-corn, and did not make a hobby of any particular part of the work on his estate. He always had before his mind's eye the estate as a whole, and not any particular part of it. The chief thing in his eyes was not the nitrogen in the soil, nor the oxygen in the air, nor manures, nor special ploughs, but that most important agent by which nitrogen, oxygen, manure, and plough were made effective, the peasant laborer. When Nicholas first began farming and began to understand its different branches, it was the serf who especially attracted his attention. The peasant seemed to him not merely a tool, but also a judge of farming and an end in himself. At first he watched the serfs, trying to understand their aims and what they considered good and bad, and only pretended to direct them and give orders while in reality learning from them their methods, their manner of speech, and their judgment of what was good and bad. Only when he had understood the peasants' tastes and aspirations, had learned to talk their language, to grasp the hidden meaning of their words, and felt akin to them did he begin boldly to manage his serfs, that is, to perform toward them the duties demanded of him. And Nicholas' management produced very brilliant results. Guided by some gift of insight, on taking up the management of the estates, he at once unerringly appointed as bailiff, village elder, and delegate, the very men the serfs would themselves have chosen had they had the right to choose, and these posts never changed hands. Before analyzing the properties of manure, before entering into the debit and credit, as he ironically called it, he found out how many cattle the peasants had and increased the number by all possible means. He kept the peasant families together in the largest groups possible, not allowing the family groups to divide into separate households. He was hard alike on the lazy, the depraved, and the weak, and tried to get them expelled from the commune. He was very careful of the sowing and reaping of the peasants' hay and corn as of his own, and few landowners had their crops sown and harvested so early and so well, or got so good a return as did Nicholas. He disliked having anything to do with the domestic serfs, the drones as he called them and everyone said he spoiled them by his laxity. When a decision had to be taken regarding a domestic serf, especially if one had to be punished, he always felt undecided and consulted everybody in the house. But when it was possible to have a domestic serf conscripted instead of a land worker, he did so without the least hesitation. He never felt any hesitation in dealing with the peasants. 
he knew that his every decision would be approved by them all with very few exceptions. He did not allow himself either to be hard on or punish a man, or to make things easy for or reward anyone, merely because he felt inclined to do so. He could not have said by what standard he judged what he should or should not do, but the standard was quite firm and definite in his own mind. Often, speaking with vexation of some failure or irregularity, he would say, "'What can one do with our Russian peasants?' and imagined that he could not bear them. Yet he loved our Russian peasants and their way of life with his whole soul, and for that very reason had understood and assimilated the one way and manner of farming which produced good results. Countess Mary was jealous of this passion of her husband's, and regretted that she could not share it. But she could not understand the joys and vexations he derived from that world, to her so remote and alien. She could not understand why he was so particularly animated and happy, when, after getting up at daybreak and spending the whole morning in the fields or on the threshing-floor, he returned from the sowing or mowing or reaping to have tea with her. She did not understand why he spoke with such admiration and delight of the farming of the thrifty and well-to-do peasant Matthew Ermitian, who with his family had carded corn all night, or of the fact that his, Nicholas Sheaves, were already stacked before anyone else had his harvest in. She did not understand why he stepped out from the window to the veranda and smiled under his moustache and winked so joyfully when warm steady rain began to fall on the dry and thirsty shoots of the young oats. Or why, when the wind carried away a threatening cloud during the hay harvest, he would return from the barn, flushed, sunburned, and perspiring, with a smell of wormwood and gentian in his hair, and gleefully rubbing his hands, would say, "'Well, one more day, and my grain and the peasants will all be under cover.' Still less did she understand why he, kind-hearted and always ready to anticipate her wishes, should become almost desperate when she brought him a petition from some peasant men or women who had appealed to her to be excused some work. Why he, that kind Nicholas, should obstinately refuse her, angrily asking her not to interfere in what was not her business. She felt he had a world apart, which he loved passionately and which had laws she had not fathomed. Sometimes, when trying to understand him, she spoke of the good work he was doing for his serfs, he would be vexed and reply, "'Not in the least. It never entered my head, and I wouldn't do that for their good. That's all poetry and old wives' talk, all that doing good to one's neighbor. What I want is that our children should not have to go begging.' I must put our affairs in order while I am alive, that's all. And to do that, order and strictness are essential. That's all about it," said he, clenching his vigorous fist. And fairness, of course," he added. For if the peasant is naked and hungry and has only one miserable horse, he can do no good either for himself or for me. And all Nicholas did was fruitful probably just because he refused to allow himself to think that he was doing good to others for virtue's sake. His means increased rapidly. Serfs from neighboring estates came to beg him to buy them, and long after his death the memory of his administration was devoutly preserved among the serfs. He was a master. The peasant's affairs first, and then his own. Of course he was not to be trifled with either. In a word, he was a real master. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 7《First Epilogue, Chapter 8 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 8 one matter connected with his management sometimes worried Nicholas, and that was his quick temper together with his old hussar habit of making free use of his fists. At first he saw nothing reprehensible in this, but in the second year of his marriage his view of that form of punishment suddenly changed. 
Once in the summer he had sent for the village elder from Bogacharovo, a man who had succeeded to the post when Drawn died and who was accused of dishonesty and various irregularities. Nicholas went out into the porch to question him, and immediately after the elder had given a few replies, the sound of cries and blows were heard. On returning to lunch, Nicholas went up to his wife, who sat with her head bent low over her embroidery frame, and as usual began to tell her what he had been doing that morning. Among other things he spoke of the Bogacharovo elder. Countess Mary turned red and then pale, but continued to sit with head bowed and lips compressed and gave her husband no reply. "'Such an insolent scoundrel!' he cried, growing hot again at the mere recollection of him. If he had told me he was drunk and did not see— But what is the matter with you, Mary? he suddenly asked. Countess Mary raised her head and tried to speak, but hastily looked down again and her lips puckered. Why, whatever is the matter, my dearest? The looks of the plain Countess Mary always improved when she was in tears. She never cried from pain or vexation, but always from sorrow or pity and when she wept her radiant eyes acquired an irresistible charm. The moment Nicholas took her hand she could no longer restrain herself and began to cry. "'Nicholas, I saw it. He was to blame. But why did you—' "'Nicholas!' And she covered her face with her hands. Nicholas said nothing. He flushed crimson, left her side, and paced up and down the room. He understood what she was weeping about, but could not in his heart at once agree with her that what he had regarded from childhood as quite an everyday event was wrong. "'Is it just sentimentality, old wives' tales, or is she right?' he asked himself. Before he had solved that point, he glanced again at her face filled with love and pain, and he suddenly realized that she was right, and that he had long been sinning against himself. Mary, he said softly, going up to her, it will never happen again. I give you my word, never, he repeated in a trembling voice like a boy asking for forgiveness. The tears flowed faster still from the Countess's eyes. She took his hand and kissed it. Nicholas, when did you break your cameo? she asked to change the subject looking at his finger on which he wore a ring with a cameo of Le Cohen's head. Today it was the same affair. Oh, Mary, don't remind me of it. And again he flushed. I give you my word of honor, it shan't occur again. And let this always be a reminder to me. And he pointed to the broken ring. After that, when, in discussions with his village elders or stewards, the blood rushed to his face and his fists began to clench, Nicholas would turn the broken ring on his finger and would drop his eyes before the man who was making him angry. But he did forget himself once or twice within a twelve-month, and then he would go and confess to his wife, and would again promise that this should really be the very last time. "'Mary, you must despise me,' he would say. I deserve it. You should go. Go away at once if you don't feel strong enough to control yourself," she would reply sadly, trying to comfort her husband. Among the gentry of the province Nicholas was respected but not liked. He did not concern himself with the interests of his own class, and consequently some thought him proud and others thought him stupid. The whole summer, from spring sowing to harvest, he was busy with the work on his farm. In autumn he gave himself up to hunting with some business-like seriousness, leaving home for a month or even two with his hunt. In winter he visited his other villages or spent his time reading. The books he read were chiefly historical, and on these he spent a certain sum every year. He was collecting, as he said, a serious library and he made it a rule to read through all the books he bought. He would sit in his study with a grave air, reading, a task he first imposed upon himself as a duty, but which afterwards became a habit affording him a special kind of pleasure and a consciousness of being occupied with serious matters. In winter, except for business excursions, 
he spent most of his time at home making himself one with his family and entering into all the details of his children's relations with their mother. The harmony between him and his wife grew closer and closer, and he daily discovered fresh spiritual treasures in her. From the time of his marriage Sonia had lived in his house. Before that Nicholas had told his wife all that had passed between himself and Sonia, blaming himself and commending her. He had asked Princess Mary to be gentle and kind to his cousin. She thoroughly realized the wrong he had done Sonia, felt herself to blame toward her, and imagined that her wealth had influenced Nicholas' choice. She could not find fault with Sonia in any way, and tried to be fond of her, but often felt ill-will toward her which she could not overcome. Once she had a talk with her friend Natasha about Sonia and about her own injustice toward her. "'You know,' said Natasha, "'you have read the Gospels a great deal. There is a passage in them that just fits Sonia.' "'What?' asked Countess Mary, surprised. "'To him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath shall not be taken away. You remember? She is the one that hath not. Why, I don't know. Perhaps she lacks egotism, I don't know, but from her is taken away, and everything has been taken away. Sometimes I am dreadfully sorry for her. Formerly I very much wanted Nicholas to marry her, but I always had a sort of presentiment that it would not come off. She is a sterile flower, you know, like some strawberry blossoms. Sometimes I am sorry for her, and sometimes I think she doesn't feel it as you or I would." Though Countess Mary told Natasha that those words in the Gospel must be understood differently, yet looking at Sonia she agreed with Natasha's explanation. It really seemed that Sonia did not feel her position trying, and had grown quite reconciled to her lot as a sterile flower. She seemed to be fond not so much of individuals as of the family as a whole. Like a cat she had attached herself not to the people but to the home. She waited on the old countess, petted and spoiled the children, was always ready to render the small services for which she had a gift, and all this was unconsciously accepted from her with insufficient gratitude. The country seat at Bald Hills had been rebuilt, though not on the same scale as under the old prince. The buildings, begun under straitened circumstances, were more than simple. The immense house on the old stone foundations was of wood plastered only inside. It had bare deal floors and was furnished with very simple hard sofas, armchairs, tables, and chairs, made by their own surf carpenters out of their own birchwood. The house was spacious and had rooms for the house serfs and apartments for visitors. Whole families of the Rostovs and Bolkonsky's relations sometimes came to Bald Hills with sixteen horses and dozens of servants and stayed for months. Besides that, four times a year, on the name days and birthdays of the hosts, as many as a hundred visitors would gather there for a day or two. The rest of the year life pursued its unbroken routine with its ordinary occupations, and its breakfasts, lunches, dinners, and suppers provided out of the produce of the estate. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 8First Epilogue, Chapter 9, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 9 It was the eve of St. Nicholas, the 5th of December, 1820. Natasha had been staying at her brother's with her husband and children since early autumn. Pierre had gone to Petersburg on business of his own for three weeks, as he said, but had remained there nearly seven weeks and was expected back every minute. Besides the Bazukov family, Nicholas' old friend, the retired General Vasily Dmitrich Denisov, was staying with the Rostovs this 5th of December. On the 6th, which was his name day, when the house would be full of visitors, Nicholas knew he would have to exchange his tartar tunic for a tailcoat and put on narrow boots with pointed toes, and drive to the new church he had built, and then receive visitors who would come to congratulate him, offer them refreshments, and talk about the elections of the nobility. 
but he considered himself entitled to spend the eve of that day in his usual way. He examined the bailiff's accounts of the village in Riazan, which belonged to his wife's nephew, wrote two business letters, and walked over to the granaries, cattle-yards and stables before dinner. Having taken precautions against the general drunkenness to be expected on the morrow because it was a great saint's day, he returned to dinner, and without having time for a private talk with his wife, sat down at the long table laid for twenty persons, at which the whole household had assembled. At that table were his mother, his mother's old lady companion Belova, his wife, their three children with their governess and tutor, his wife's nephew with his tutor, Sonia, Denisov, Natasha, her three children, their governess, and old Michael Ivanovitch, the late prince's architect, who was living on in retirement at Bald Hills. Countess Mary sat at the other end of the table. When her husband took his place, she concluded, from the rapid manner in which after taking up his table-napkin he pushed back the tumbler and wine-glass standing before him, that he was out of humour as was sometimes the case when he came into dinner straight from the farm, especially before the soup. Countess Mary well knew that mood of his, and when she herself was in a good frame of mind, quietly waited till he had had his soup, and then began to talk to him and make him admit that there was no cause for his ill-humour. But today she quite forgot that, and was hurt that he should be angry with her without any reason, and she felt unhappy. She asked him where he had been. He replied. She again inquired whether everything was going well on the farm. Her unnatural tone made him wince unpleasantly, and he replied hastily. Then I'm not mistaken, thought Countess Mary. Why is he cross with me? She concluded from his tone that he was vexed with her, and wished to end the conversation. She knew her remarks sounded unnatural but could not refrain from asking some more questions. Thanks to Denisov, the conversation at table soon became general and lively, and she did not talk to her husband. When they left the table and went as usual to thank the old countess, Countess Mary held out her hand and kissed her husband, and asked him why he was angry with her. "'You always have such strange fancies. I didn't even think of being angry,' he replied but the word always seemed to her to imply, yes, I am angry, but I won't tell you why. Nicholas and his wife lived together so happily that even Sonia and the old countess, who felt jealous and would have liked them to disagree, could find nothing to reproach them with. But even they had their moments of antagonism. Occasionally, and it was always just after they had been happiest together, they suddenly had a feeling of estrangement and hostility, which occurred most frequently during Countess Mary's pregnancies, and this was such a time. "'Well, messieurs and madame,' said Nicholas loudly, and with apparent cheerfulness, it seemed to Countess Mary that he did it on purpose to vex her, "'I have been on my feet since six this morning. Tomorrow I shall have to suffer, so today I'll go and rest.' And without a word to his wife he went to the little sitting-room and lay down on the sofa. That's always the way, thought Countess Mary. He talks to everyone except me. I see. I see that I am repulsive to him, especially when I am in this condition. She looked down at her expanded figure, and in the glass at her pale, sallow, emaciated face in which her eyes now looked larger than ever. And everything annoyed her. Denisov's shouting and laughter, Natasha's talk, and especially a quick glance Sonia gave her. Sonia was always the first excuse Countess Mary found for feeling irritated. Having sat a while with her visitors without understanding anything of what they were saying, she softly left the room and went to the nursery. The children were playing at going to Moscow in a carriage made of chairs and invited her to go with them. She sat down and played with them a little, but the thought of her husband and his unreasonable crossness worried her. She got up and, walking on tiptoe with difficulty, went to the small sitting-room. "'Perhaps he is not asleep. I'll have an explanation with him,' she said to herself. Little Andrew, her eldest boy, imitating his mother, followed her on tiptoe. She did not notice him. "'Mary, dear, I think he is asleep. He was so tired,' said Sonia, meeting her in the large sitting-room, 
it seemed to Countess Mary that she crossed her path everywhere. Andrew may wake him. Countess Mary looked round, saw little Andrew following her, felt that Sonia was right, and for that very reason flushed and with evident difficulty refrained from saying something harsh. She made no reply, but to avoid obeying Sonia beckoned to Andrew to follow her quietly and went to the door. Sonia went away by another door. From the room in which Nicholas was sleeping came the sound of his even breathing, every slightest tone of which was familiar to his wife. As she listened to it, she saw before her his smooth, handsome forehead, his mustache, and his whole face, as she had so often seen it in the stillness of the night when he slept. Nicholas suddenly moved and cleared his throat. And at that moment little Andrew shouted from outside the door, "'Papa! Mama's standing here!' Countess Mary turned pale with fright and made signs to the boy. He grew silent, and quiet ensued for a moment, terrible to Countess Mary. She knew how Nicholas disliked being waked. Then through the door she heard Nicholas clearing his throat again and stirring, and his voice said crossly, "'I can't get a moment's peace. Mary, is that you? Why did you bring him here?' "'I only came in to look and did not notice. Forgive me.' Nicholas coughed and said no more. Countess Mary moved away from the door and took the boy back to the nursery. Five minutes later little black-eyed three-year-old Natasha, her father's pet, having learned from her brother that Papa was asleep and Mama was in the sitting-room, ran to her father unobserved by her mother. The dark-eyed little girl boldly opened the creaking door, went up to the sofa with energetic steps of her sturdy little legs and having examined the position of her father, who was asleep with his back to her, rose on tiptoe and kissed the hand which lay under his head. Nicholas turned with a tender smile on his face. "'Natasha! Natasha!' came Countess Mary's frightened whisper from the door. "'Papa wants to sleep.' "'No, Mama, he doesn't want to sleep,' said little Natasha, with conviction. "'He's laughing.' Nicholas lowered his legs, rose, and took his daughter in his arms. "'Come in, Mary,' he said to his wife. She went in and sat down by her husband. "'I did not notice him following me,' she said timidly. "'I just looked in.' Holding his little girl with one arm, Nicholas glanced at his wife, and seeing her guilty expression, put his other arm around her and kissed her hair. "'May I kiss Mama?" he asked Natasha. Natasha smiled bashfully. Again, she commanded, pointing with a peremptory gesture to the spot where Nicholas had placed the kiss. I don't know why you think I am cross, said Nicholas, replying to the question he knew was in his wife's mind. You have no idea how unhappy, how lonely I feel when you are like that. It always seems to me... Mary, don't talk nonsense. You ought to be ashamed of yourself," he said gaily. It seems to be that you can't love me, that I am so plain, always, and now, in this con— Oh, how absurd you are! It is not beauty that endears, it's love that makes us see beauty. It is only Malvinas and women of that kind who are loved for their beauty. But do I love my wife? I don't love her, but I don't know how to put it. Without you, or when something comes between us like this, I seem lost and can't do anything. Now do I love my finger? I don't love it, but just try to cut it off. I am not like that myself, but I understand. So you're not angry with me? Awfully angry, he said, smiling and getting up and smoothing his hair he began to pace the room. "'Do you know, Mary, what I've been thinking?' he began, immediately thinking aloud in his wife's presence, now that they had made it up. He did not ask if she was ready to listen to him. He did not care. A thought had occurred to him, and so it belonged to her also. He told her of his intention to persuade Pierre to stay with them till spring. Countess Mary listened till he had finished, made some remark, and in her turn began thinking aloud. Her thoughts were about the children. "'You can see the woman in her already,' 
she said in French, pointing to little Natasha. "'You reproach us women with being illogical. Here is our logic. I say, Papa wants to sleep, but she says, no, he's laughing. And she was right,' said Countess Mary with a happy smile. "'Yes, yes.' and Nicholas, taking his little daughter in his strong hand, lifted her high, placed her on his shoulder, held her by the legs, and paced the room with her. There was an expression of carefree happiness on the faces of both father and daughter. "'But, you know, you may be unfair. You are too fond of this one,' his wife whispered in French. "'Yes, but what am I to do? I try not to show.' At that moment they heard the sound of the door pulley and footsteps in the hall and anteroom as if someone had arrived. "'Somebody has come.' "'I am sure it is Pierre. I will go and see,' said Countess Mary, and left the room. In her absence Nicholas allowed himself to give his little daughter a gallop round the room. Out of breath he took the laughing child quickly from his shoulder and pressed her to his heart. His capers reminded him of dancing and looking at the child's round happy little face, he thought of what she would be like when he was an old man, taking her into society and dancing the mazurka with her, as his old father had danced Daniel Cooper with his daughter. "'It is he! It is he, Nicholas!' said Countess Mary, re-entering the room a few minutes later. "'Now our Natasha has come to life. You should have seen her ecstasy, and how he caught it for having stayed away so long. Well, come along now, quick, quick. It's time you two are parted," she added, looking smilingly at the little girl who clung to her father. Nicholas went out holding the child by the hand. Countess Mary remained in the sitting-room. "'I should never, never have believed that one could be so happy,' she whispered to herself. A smile lit up her face, but at the same time she sighed and her deep eyes expressed a quiet sadness as though she felt, through her happiness, that there is another sort of happiness unattainable in this life, and of which she involuntarily thought at that instant. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 9《First Epilogue, Chapter 10 of War and Peace, Volume 4 by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 10 Natasha had married in the early spring of 1813, and in 1820 already had three daughters besides a son for whom she had longed and whom she was now nursing. She had grown stouter and broader so that it was difficult to recognize in this robust, motherly woman the slim, lively Natasha of former days. Her features were more defined and had a calm, soft, and serene expression. In her face there was none of the ever-glowing animation that had formerly burned there and constituted its charm. Now her face and body were often all that one saw, and her soul was not visible at all. All that struck the eye was a strong, handsome, and fertile woman. The old fire very rarely kindled in her face now. That happened only when, as was the case that day, her husband returned home, or a sick child was convalescent, or when she and Countess Mary spoke of Prince Andrew. She never mentioned him to her husband, who, she imagined, was jealous of Prince Andrew's memory, or on the rare occasions when something happened to induce her to sing a practice she had quite abandoned since her marriage. At the rare moments when the old fire did kindle in her handsome, fully developed body, she was even more attractive than in former days. Since their marriage, Natasha and her husband had lived in Moscow, in Petersburg, on their estate near Moscow, or with her mother, that is to say, in Nicholas' house. The young Countess Bezukhova was not often seen in society and those who met her there were not pleased with her, and found her neither attractive nor amiable. Not that Natasha liked solitude. She did not know whether she liked it or not. She even thought that she did not. But with her pregnancies, her confinements, the nursing of her children, and sharing every moment of her husband's life, she had demands on her time which could be satisfied only by renouncing society. 
All who had known Natasha before her marriage wondered at the change in her as at something extraordinary. Only the old countess with her maternal instinct had realized that all Natasha's outbursts had been due to her need of children and a husband, as she herself had once exclaimed at a Trodno, not so much in fun as in earnest. And her mother was now surprised at the surprise expressed by those who had never understood Natasha, and she kept saying that she had always known that Natasha would make an exemplary wife and mother. Only she lets her love of her husband and children overflow all bounds, said the countess, so that it even becomes absurd. Natasha did not follow the golden rule advocated by clever folk, especially by the French, which says that a girl should not let herself go when she marries, should not neglect her accomplishments, should be even more careful of her appearance than when she was unmarried, and should fascinate her husband as much as she did before he became her husband. Natasha, on the contrary, had at once abandoned all her witchery, of which her singing had been an unusually powerful part. She gave it up just because it was so powerfully seductive. She took no pains with her manners, or with delicacy of speech, or with her toilette, or to show herself to her husband in her most becoming attitudes, or to avoid inconveniencing him by being too exacting. She acted in contradiction to all those rules. She felt that the allurements instinct had formerly taught her to use would now be merely ridiculous in the eyes of her husband, to whom she had from the first moment given herself up entirely, that is, with her whole soul, leaving no corner of it hidden from him. She felt that her unity with her husband was not maintained by the poetic feelings that had attracted him to her, but by something else, indefinite but firm as the bond between her own body and soul to fluff out her curls, put on fashionable dresses, and sing romantic songs to fascinate her husband, would have seemed as strange as to adorn herself to attract herself. To adorn herself or others might perhaps have been agreeable, she did not know, but she had no time at all for it. The chief reason for devoting no time either to singing, to dress, or to choosing her words was that she really had no time to spare for these things. We know that man has the faculty of becoming completely absorbed in a subject, however trivial it may be, and that there is no subject so trivial that it will not grow to infinite proportions if one's entire attention is devoted to it. The subject which wholly engrossed Natasha's attention was her family, that is, her husband, whom she had to keep so that he should belong entirely to her and to the home, and the children whom she had to bear, bring into the world, nurse, and bring up. And the deeper she penetrated, not with her mind only, but with her whole soul, her whole being, into the subject that absorbed her, the larger did that subject grow, and the weaker and more inadequate did her powers appear, so that she concentrated them wholly on that one thing, and yet was unable to accomplish all that she considered necessary. There were then, as now, conversations and discussions about women's rights, the relations of husband and wife, and their freedom and rights, though these themes were not yet termed questions as they are now. But these topics were not merely uninteresting to Natasha, she positively did not understand them. These questions, then as now, existed only for those who see nothing in marriage but the pleasure married people get from one another that is, only the beginnings of marriage and not its whole significance which lies in the family. Discussions and questions of that kind, which are like the questions of how to get the greatest gratification from one's dinner, did not then and do not now exist for those for whom the purpose of a dinner is the nourishment it affords, and the purpose of marriage is the family. If the purpose of dinner is to nourish the body, a man who eats two dinners at once may perhaps get more enjoyment, but will not attain his purpose, for his stomach will not digest the two dinners. If the purpose of marriage is the family, the person who wishes to have many wives or husbands may perhaps obtain much pleasure, but in that case will not have a family. If the purpose of food is nourishment and the purpose of marriage is the family, the whole question resolves itself into not eating more than one can digest, and not having more wives or husbands than are needed for the family, that is, one wife or one husband. 
Natasha needed a husband. A husband was given her, and he gave her a family. And she not only saw no need of any other or better husband, but as all the powers of her soul were intent on serving that husband and family, she could not imagine and saw no interest in imagining how it would be if things were different. Natasha did not care for society in general, but prized the more the society of her relatives, Countess Mary, and her brother, her mother, and Sonia. She valued the company of those to whom she could come striding disheveled from the nursery in her dressing-gown, and with joyful face show a yellow instead of a green stain on baby's napkin, and from whom she could hear reassuring words to the effect that baby was much better. To such an extent had Natasha let herself go, that the way she dressed and did her hair, her ill-chosen words and her jealousy, she was jealous of Sonia, of the governess, and of every woman, pretty or plain, were habitual subjects of jest to those about her. The general opinion was that Pierre was under his wife's thumb, which was really true. From the very first days of their married life, Natasha had announced her demands. Pierre was greatly surprised by his wife's view, to him a perfectly novel one, that every moment of his life belonged to her and to the family. His wife's demands astonished him, but they also flattered him, and he submitted to them. Pierre's subjection consisted in the fact that he not only dared not flirt with, but dared not even speak smilingly to any other woman, did not dare dine at the club as a pastime, did not dare spend money on a whim, and did not dare absent himself for any length of time except on business, in which his wife included his intellectual pursuits, which she did not in the least understand, but to which she attributed great importance. To make up for this, at home Pierre had the right to regulate his life and that of the whole family exactly as he chose. At home Natasha placed herself in the position of a slave to her husband, and the whole household went on tiptoe when he was occupied, that is, was reading or writing in his study. Pierre had but to show a partiality for anything to get just what he liked done always. He had only to express a wish and Natasha would jump up and run to fulfill it. The entire household was governed according to Pierre's supposed orders, that is, by his wishes which Natasha tried to guess. Their way of life and place of residence, their acquaintances and ties, Natasha's occupations, the children's upbringing, were all selected not merely with regard to Pierre's expressed wishes, but to what Natasha, from the thoughts he expressed in conversation, supposed his wishes to be. And she deduced the essentials of his wishes quite correctly, and having once arrived at them, clung to them tenaciously. When Pierre himself wanted to change his mind, she would fight him with his own weapons. Thus, in a time of trouble ever memorable to him after the birth of their first child who was delicate, when they had to change the wet nurse three times and Natasha fell ill from despair, Pierre one day told her of Rousseau's view, with which he quite agreed, that to have a wet nurse is unnatural and harmful. When her next baby was born, despite the opposition of her mother, the doctors, and even of her husband himself, who were all vigorously opposed to her nursing her baby herself, a thing then unheard of and considered injurious, she insisted on having her own way, and after that nursed all her babies herself. It very often happened that in a moment of irritation husband and wife would have a dispute, but long afterwards Pierre, to his surprise and delight, would find in his wife's ideas and actions the very thought against which she had argued, but divested of everything superfluous that in the excitement of the dispute he had added when expressing his opinion. After seven years of marriage, Pierre had the joyous and firm consciousness that he was not a bad man, and he felt this because he saw himself reflected in his wife. He felt that the good and bad within himself inextricably mingled and overlapping. But only what was really good in him was reflected in his wife, all that was not quite good was rejected. And this was not the result of logical reasoning, but was a direct and mysterious reflection. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 10
First Epilogue, Chapter 11, of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 11 Two months previously, when Pierre was already staying with the Rostovs, he had received a letter from Prince Theodore, asking him to come to Petersburg to confer on some important questions that were being discussed there by a society of which Pierre was one of the principal founders. On reading that letter, she always read her husband's letters, Natasha herself suggested that he should go to Petersburg, though she would feel his absence very acutely. She attributed immense importance to all her husband's intellectual and abstract interests, though she did not understand them, and she always dreaded being a hindrance to him in such matters. To Pierre's timid look of inquiry, after reading the letter, she replied by asking him to go, but to fix a definite date for his return. He was given four weeks' leave of absence. Ever since that leave of absence had expired, more than a fortnight before, Natasha had been in a constant state of alarm, depression, and irritability. Denisov, now a general on the retired list and much dissatisfied with the present state of affairs, had arrived during that fortnight. He looked at Natasha with sorrow and surprise, as at a bad likeness of a person once dear. A dull, dejected look, random replies, and talk about the nursery was all he saw and heard from his former enchantress. Natasha was sad and irritable all that time, especially when her mother, her brother, Sonia, or Countess Mary, in their efforts to console her, tried to excuse Pierre and suggested reasons for his delay in returning. "'It's all nonsense, all rubbish, those discussions which lead to nothing and all those idiotic societies.' Natasha declared of the very affairs in the immense importance of which she firmly believed. And she would go to the nursery to nurse Petya, her only boy. No one else could tell her anything so comforting or so reasonable as this little three-month-old creature when he lay at her breast, and she was conscious of the movement of his lips and the snuffling of his little nose. That creature said, "'You are angry. You are jealous.' You would like to pay him out, you are afraid, but here am I, and I am he." And that was unanswerable. It was more than true. During that fortnight of anxiety Natasha resorted to the baby for comfort so often, and fussed over him so much, that she overfed him and he fell ill. She was terrified by his illness, and yet that was just what she needed. While attending to him, she bore the anxiety about her husband more easily. She was nursing her boy when the sound of Pierre's sleigh was heard at the front door, and the old nurse, knowing how to please her mistress, entered the room inaudibly but hurriedly and with a beaming face. "'Has he come?' Natasha asked quickly in a whisper, afraid to move lest she should rouse the dozing baby. "'He's come, ma'am,' whispered the nurse. The blood rushed to Natasha's face and her feet involuntarily moved, but she could not jump up and run out. The baby again opened his eyes and looked at her. "'You're here?' he seemed to be saying, and again lazily smacked his lips. Cautiously withdrawing her breast, Natasha rocked him a little, handed him to the nurse, and went with rapid steps toward the door. But at the door she stopped, as if her conscience reproached her for having in her joy left the child too soon, and she glanced round. The nurse with raised elbows was lifting the infant over the rail of his cot. "'Go, ma'am, don't worry, go,' she whispered, smiling, with the kind of familiarity that grows up between a nurse and her mistress. Natasha ran with light footsteps to the anteroom. Denisov, who had come out of the study into the dancing-room with his pipe, now for the first time recognized the old Natasha. A flood of brilliant, joyful light poured from her transfigured face. "'He's come!' she exclaimed as she ran past, and Denisov felt that he too was delighted that Pierre, whom he did not much care for, had returned. On reaching the vestibule, Natasha saw a tall figure in a fur coat unwinding his scarf. "'It's he! It's really he! He has come!' she said to herself and rushing at him, embraced him, pressed his head to her breast, 
and then pushed him back and gazed at his ruddy, happy face, covered with hoar-frost. Yes, it is he, happy and contented. Then, all at once, she remembered the tortures of suspense she had experienced for the last fortnight, and the joy that had lit up her face vanished. She frowned and overwhelmed Pierre with a torrent of reproaches and angry words. "'Yes, it's all very well for you. You are pleased, you've had a good time. But what about me? You might at least have shown consideration for the children.' "'I am nursing, and my milk was spoiled. Petya was at death's door. But you were enjoying yourself. Yes, enjoying!' Pierre knew he was not to blame for he could not have come sooner. He knew this outburst was unseemly and would blow over in a minute or two. Above all, he knew that he himself was bright and happy. He wanted to smile, but dared not even think of doing so. He made a piteous, frightened face and bent down. "'I could not, on my honor. But how is Petya?' "'All right now. Come along. I wonder you're not ashamed. If only you could see what I was like without you, how I suffered! You are well? Come, come, she said, not letting go of his arm, and they went to their rooms. When Nicholas and his wife came to look for Pierre, he was in the nursery holding his baby son, who was again awake, on his huge right palm and dandling him. A blissful bright smile was fixed on the baby's broad face with its toothless open mouth. The storm was long since over, and there was bright, joyous sunshine on Natasha's face as she gazed tenderly at her husband and child. "'And have you talked everything well over with Prince Theodore?' she asked. "'Yes, capitally.' "'You see, he holds it up.' She met the baby's head. "'But how he did frighten me! You've seen the princess? Is it true she's in love with that—' Yes, just fancy." At that moment Nicholas and Countess Mary came in. Pierre with the baby on his hand stooped, kissed them, and replied to their inquiries. But in spite of much that was interesting and had to be discussed, the baby with the little cap on its unsteady head evidently absorbed all his attention. "'How sweet!' said Countess Mary, looking at and playing with the baby. "'Now, Nicholas, she added, turning to her husband, I can't understand how it is you don't see the charm of these delicious marvels. I don't and can't, replied Nicholas, looking coldly at the baby. A lump of flesh. Come along, Pierre. And yet he's such an affectionate father, said Countess Mary, vindicating her husband. But only after they are a year old or so. Now Pierre nurses them splendidly said Natasha. He says his hand is just made for a baby's seat. Just look. Only not for this!" Pierre suddenly exclaimed with a laugh, and shifting the baby, he gave him to the nurse. End of First Epilogue Chapter 11《Of War and Peace》Volume 4 by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 12 As in every large household, there were at Bald Hills several perfectly distinct worlds which merged into one harmonious whole, though each retained its own peculiarities and made concessions to the others. Every event, joyful or sad, that took place in that house was important to all these worlds, but each had its own special reasons to rejoice or grieve over that occurrence independently of the others. For instance, Pierre's return was a joyful and important event and they all felt it to be so. The servants, the most reliable judges of their masters because they judged not by their conversation or expressions of feeling, but by their acts and way of life were glad of Pierre's return, because they knew that when he was there, Count Nicholas would cease going every day to attend to the estate, and would be in better spirits and temper, 
and also because they would all receive handsome presents for the holidays. The children and their governesses were glad of Pierre's return because no one else drew them into the social life of the household as he did. He alone could play on the clavichord that Ecossay, his only piece, to which, as he said, all possible dances could be danced, and they felt sure he had brought presents for them all. Young Nicholas, now a slim lad of fifteen, delicate and intelligent, with curly light-brown hair and beautiful eyes, was delighted because Uncle Pierre, as he called him, was the object of his rapturous and passionate affection. No one had instilled into him this love for Pierre, whom he saw only occasionally. Countess Mary, who had brought him up, had done her utmost to make him love her husband as she loved him, and little Nicholas did love his uncle, but loved him with just a shade of contempt. Pierre, however, he adored. He did not want to be a hussar or a knight of St. George like his uncle Nicholas. He wanted to be learned, wise and kind like Pierre. In Pierre's presence his face always shone with pleasure, and he flushed and was breathless when Pierre spoke to him. He did not miss a single word he uttered, and would afterwards, with de Salle or by himself, recall and reconsider the meaning of everything Pierre had said. Pierre's past life and his unhappiness prior to 1812, of which young Nicholas had formed a vague poetic picture from some words he had overheard, his adventures in Moscow, his captivity, Platon Karateyev, of whom he had heard from Pierre, his love for Natasha, of whom the lad was also particularly fond, and especially Pierre's friendship with the father whom Nicholas could not remember, all this made Pierre in his eyes a hero and a saint. From broken remarks about Natasha and his father, from the emotion with which Pierre spoke of that dead father, and from the careful, reverent tenderness with which Natasha spoke of him, the boy, who was only just beginning to guess what love is, derived the notion that his father had loved Natasha, and when dying had left her to his friend. But the father, whom the boy did not remember, appeared to him a divinity who could not be pictured, and of whom he never thought without a swelling heart and tears of sadness and rapture. So the boy also was happy that Pierre had arrived. The guests welcomed Pierre because he always helped to enliven and unite any company he was in. The grown-up members of the family, not to mention his wife, were pleased to have back a friend whose presence made life run more smoothly and peacefully. The old ladies were pleased with the presents he brought them, and especially that Natasha would now be herself again. Pierre felt the different outlooks of these various worlds, and made haste to satisfy all their expectations. Though the most absent-minded and forgetful of men, Pierre, with the aid of a list his wife drew up, had now bought everything, not forgetting his mother and brother-in-law's commissions, nor the dress material for a present to Belova, nor toys for his wife's nephews. In the early days of his marriage, it had seemed strange to him that his wife should expect him not to forget to procure all the things he undertook to buy, and he had been taken aback by her serious annoyance when on his first trip he forgot everything. But in time he grew used to this demand. Knowing that Natasha asked nothing for herself, and gave him commissions for others only when he himself had offered to undertake them, he now found an unexpected and childlike pleasure in this purchase of presents for everyone in the house, and never forgot anything. If he now incurred Natasha's censure, it was only for buying too many and too expensive things. To her other defects, as most people thought them, but which to Pierre were qualities, of untidiness and neglect of herself, she now added stinginess. From the time that Pierre began life as a family man on a footing entailing heavy expenditure, he had noticed to his surprise that he spent only half as much as before, and that his affairs, which had been in disorder of late chiefly because of his first wife's debts, had begun to improve. Life was cheaper because it was circumscribed. That most expensive luxury, the kind of life that can be changed at any moment, was no longer his, nor did he wish for it. He felt that his way of life had now been settled once for all till death, 
and that to change it was not in his power, and so that way of life proved economical. With a merry smiling face, Pierre was sorting his purchases. "'What do you think of this?' said he, unrolling a piece of stuff like a shopman. Natasha, who was sitting opposite to him with her eldest daughter on her lap, turned her sparkling eyes swiftly from her husband to the things he showed her. "'That's for Belova? Excellent!' She felt the quality of the material. It was a rouble and arshin, I suppose. Pierre told her the price. Too dear, Natasha remarked. How pleased the children will be, and Mama too. Only you need not have bought me this, she added, unable to suppress a smile as she gazed admiringly at a gold comb set with pearls, of a kind then just coming into fashion. Adele tempted me. She kept on telling me to buy it," returned Pierre. "'When am I to wear it?' and Natasha stuck it in her coil of hair. "'When I take little Masha into society? Perhaps they will be fashionable again by then. Well, let's go now.' And collecting the presents they went first to the nursery and then to the old countess' rooms. The countess was sitting with her companion, Belova, playing grand patience as usual when Pierre and Natasha came into the drawing-room with parcels under their arms. The countess was now over sixty, was quite grey, and wore a cap with a frill that surrounded her face. Her face had shriveled, her upper lip had sunk in, and her eyes were dim. After the deaths of her son and husband in such rapid succession, she felt herself a being accidentally forgotten in this world, and left without aim or object for her existence. She ate, drank, slept, or kept awake, but did not live. Life gave her no new impressions. She wanted nothing from life but tranquillity, and that tranquillity only death could give her. But until death came she had to go on living, that is, to use her vital forces. A peculiarity one sees in very young children and very old people was particularly evident in her. Her life had no external aims, only a need to exercise her various functions and inclinations was apparent. She had to eat, sleep, think, speak, weep, work, give vent to her anger and so on, merely because she had a stomach, a brain, muscles, nerves, and a liver. She did these things not under any external impulse, as people in the full vigor of life do, when behind the purpose for which they strive that of exercising their functions remains unnoticed. She talked only because she physically needed to exercise her tongue and lungs. She cried as a child does, because her nose had to be cleared and so on. What for people in their full vigor is an aim was for her, evidently, merely a pretext. Thus in the morning, especially if she had eaten anything rich the day before, she felt a need of being angry, and would choose as the handiest pretext Belova's deafness. She would begin to say something to her in a low tone from the other end of the room. "'It seems a little warmer today, my dear,' she would murmur. And when Belova replied, "'Oh, yes, they've come,' she would mutter angrily, "'Oh, Lord, how stupid and deaf she is!' Another pretext would be her snuff, which would seem too dry, or too damp, or not rubbed fine enough. After these fits of irritability her face would grow yellow, and her maids knew by infallible symptoms when Belova would again be deaf, the snuff damp, and the countess face yellow. Just as she needed to work off her spleen, so she had sometimes to exercise her still existing faculty of thinking, and the pretext for that was a game of patience. When she needed to cry, the deceased Count would be the pretext. When she wanted to be agitated, Nicholas and his health would be the pretext, and when she felt a need to speak spitefully, the pretext would be Countess Mary. When her vocal organs needed exercise, which was usually toward seven o'clock when she had had an after-dinner rest in a darkened room, the pretext would be the retelling of the same stories over and over again to the same audience. The old lady's condition was understood by the whole household, though no one ever spoke of it, and they all made every possible effort to satisfy her needs. 
only by a rare glance exchanged with a sad smile between Nicholas, Pierre, Natasha, and Countess Mary, was the common understanding of her condition expressed. But those glances expressed something more. They said that she had played her part in life, that what they now saw was not her whole self, that we must all become like her, and that they were glad to yield to her, to restrain themselves for this once precious being formerly as full of life as themselves, but now so much to be pitied. "'Memento mori,' said these glances. Only the really heartless, the stupid ones of that household, and the little children failed to understand this and avoided her. End of First Epilogue Chapter 12First Epilogue, Chapter 13, of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 13 When Pierre and his wife entered the drawing-room, the Countess was one of her customary states in which she needed the mental exertion of playing patience, and so though by force of habit she greeted him with the word she always used when Pierre or her son returned after an absence. "'High time, my dear, high time! We were all weary of waiting for you. Well, thank God!' and received her presence with another customary remark. "'It's not the gift that's precious, my dear, but that you give it to me, an old woman.' Yet it was evident that she was not pleased by Pierre's arrival at that moment when it diverted her attention from the unfinished game. She finished her game of patience, and only then examined the presents. They consisted of a box for cards, of splendid workmanship, a bright blue Sevres teacup with shepherdesses depicted on it and with a lid, and a gold snuff-box with the Count's portrait on the lid which Pierre had had done by a miniaturist in Petersburg. The Countess had long wished for such a box, but as she did not want to cry just then, she glanced indifferently at the portrait and gave her attention chiefly to the box for cards. "'Thank you, my dear. You have cheered me up,' said she as she always did. "'But best of all, you have brought yourself back, for I never saw anything like it. You ought to give your wife a scolding. What are we to do with her?' She is like a mad woman when you are away. Doesn't see anything, doesn't remember anything." She went on repeating her usual phrases. "'Look, Anna Tibofievna," she added to her companion, "'see what a box for cards my son has brought us!' Belova admired the presence, and was delighted with her dress material. Though Pierre, Natasha, Nicholas, Countess Mary, and Denisov had much to talk about that they could not discuss before the old countess, not that anything was hidden from her, but because she had dropped so far behindhand in many things that had they begun to converse in her presence, they would have had to answer inopportune questions and to repeat what they had already told her many times, that so-and-so was dead and so-and-so was married, which she would again be unable to remember. Yet they sat at tea round the samovar in the drawing-room from habit, and Pierre answered the Countess' questions as to whether Prince Vasily had aged, and whether Countess Mary Alexeyevna had sent greetings, and still thought of them, and other matters that interested no one, and to which she herself was indifferent. Conversation of this kind, interesting to no one, yet unavoidable, continued all through tea-time. All the grown-up members of the family were assembled near the round tea-table at which Sonia presided beside the samovar. The children with their tutors and governesses had had tea and their voices were audible from the next room. At tea all sat in their accustomed places, Nicholas beside the stove at a small table where his tea was handed to him, Milka, the old grey borzoi bitch, daughter of the first Milka, with a quite grey face and large black eyes that seemed more prominent than ever lay on the armchair beside him. Denisov, whose curly hair, mustache, and whiskers had turned half grey, sat beside the Countess Mary with his general's tunic unbuttoned. Pierre sat between his wife and the old Countess. He spoke of what he knew might interest the old lady, and that she could understand. 
he told her of external social events, and of the people who had formed the circle of her contemporaries, and had once been a real, living, and distinct group, but who were now for the most part scattered about the world and, like herself, were garnering the last ears of the harvest they had sown in earlier years. But to the old countess those contemporaries of hers seemed to be the only serious and real society. Natasha saw by Pierre's animation that his visit had been interesting, and that he had much to tell them, but dare not say it before the old countess. Denisov, not being a member of the family, did not understand Pierre's caution, and being, as a malcontent, much interested in what was occurring in Petersburg, kept urging Pierre to tell them about what had happened in the Semenov's regiment, then about Erekcheyev, and then about the Bible Society. Once or twice Pierre was carried away and began to speak of these things, but Nicholas and Natasha always brought him back to the health of Prince Ivan and Countess Mary Alexeyevna. "'Well, and all this idiocy, Gosner and Tatawinova? Denisov asked. "'Is that really still going on?' "'Going on?' Pierre exclaimed. "'Why, more than ever! The Bible Society is the whole government now!' "'What is that, mon cher ami? asked the Countess, who had finished her tea and evidently needed a pretext for being angry after her meal. "'What are you saying about the government? I don't understand.' "'Well, you know, mamma," Nicholas interposed, knowing how to translate things into his mother's language, "'Prince Alexander Golitsyn has founded a society, and in consequence has great influence, they say.' Arakcheyev and Golitsyn, incautiously remarked Pierre, are now the whole government. And what a government! They see treason everywhere and are afraid of everything. Well, and how is Prince Alexander to blame? He is a most estimable man. I used to meet him at Mary Antonovna's, said the countess in an offended tone, and still more offended that they all remained silent, she went on. Nowadays everyone finds fault a gospel society. Well, and what harm is there in that?" And she rose, everybody else got up too, and with a severe expression sailed back to her table in the sitting-room. The melancholy silence that followed was broken by the sounds of the children's voices and laughter from the next room. Evidently some jolly excitement was going on there. "'Finished! Finished!' little Natasha's gleeful yell rose above them all. Pierre exchanged glances with Countess Mary and Nicholas, Natasha he never lost sight of, and smiled happily. "'That's delightful music,' said he. "'It means that Anna Makarovna has finished her stocking,' said Countess Mary. "'Oh, I'll go and see,' said Pierre, jumping up. "'You know,' he added, stopping at the door, "'why I'm especially fond of that music.' It is always the first thing that tells me all is well. When I was driving here today, the nearer I got to the house, the more anxious I grew. As I entered the anteroom, I heard Andrusha's peals of laughter, and that meant all was well. I know, I know that feeling, said Nicholas, but I mustn't go there. Those stockings are to be a surprise for me. Pierre went to the children, and the shouting and laughter grew still louder. Come, Anna Makarovna, Pierre's voice was heard saying. Come here into the middle of the room, and at the word of command, one, two, and when I say three, you stand here, and you in my arms. Well, now, one, two, said Pierre, and a silence followed. Three, and a rapturously breathless cry of children's voices filled the room. Two, two, they shouted. This meant two stockings which, by a secret process known only to herself, Anna Makarovna used to knit at the same time on the same needles, and which, when they were ready, she always triumphantly drew one out of the other in the children's presence. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 13First Epilogue, Chapter 14 of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 14 Soon after this, the children came in to say good night. They kissed everyone, the tutors and governesses made their bows, and they went out. Only young Nicholas and his tutor remained. De Salle whispered to the boy to come downstairs. No, Monsieur de Salle, I will ask my aunt to let me stay, replied Nicholas Bolkonsky, also in a whisper. Ma tante, please let me stay, said he, going up to his aunt. His face expressed entreaty, agitation, and ecstasy. Countess Mary glanced at him and turned to Pierre. When you are here, he can't tear himself away, she said. I will bring him to you directly, Monsieur de Salle. Good night said Pierre, giving his hand to the Swiss tutor, and he turned to young Nicholas with a smile. "'You and I haven't seen anything of one another yet. How like he is growing, Mary!' he added, addressing Countess Mary. "'Like my father?' asked the boy, flushing crimson and looking up at Pierre with bright, ecstatic eyes. Pierre nodded, and went on with what he had been saying when the children had interrupted. Countess Mary sat down doing woolwork. Natasha did not take her eyes off her husband. Nicholas and Denisov rose, asked for their pipes, smoked, went to fetch more tea from Sonia, who sat weary but resolute at the samovar, and questioned Pierre. The curly-headed, delicate boy sat with shining eyes, unnoticed in a corner, starting every now and then and muttering something to himself and evidently experiencing a new and powerful emotion as he turned his curly head, with his thin neck exposed by his turned-down collar, toward the place where Pierre sat. The conversation turned on the contemporary gossip about those in power, in which most people see the chief interest of home politics. Denisov, dissatisfied with the government on account of his own disappointments in the service, heard with pleasure of the things done in Petersburg which seemed to him stupid, and made forcible and sharp comments on what Pierre told them. "'One used to have to be a German. Now one must dance with Tatawanova and Madame Kudner and Weed Eckertshausen and the Bwethwin. Oh, they should let that fine fellow Bonaparte loose. He'd knock all this nonsense out of them. Fancy giving the command of the Semenov regiment to a fellow like that Schwartz!' he cried. Nicholas, though free from Denisov's readiness to find fault with everything, also thought that discussion of the government was a very serious and weighty matter, and the fact that A had been appointed minister of this, and B governor-general of that, and that the emperor had said so-and-so, and his minister so-and-so, seemed to him very important. And so he thought it necessary to take an interest in these things and to question Pierre. The questions put by these two kept the conversation from changing its ordinary character of gossip about the higher government circles. But Natasha, knowing all her husband's ways and ideas, saw that he had long been wishing but had been unable to divert the conversation to another channel, and express his own deeply felt idea for the sake of which he had gone to Petersburg to consult with his new friend Prince Theodore, and she helped him by asking how his affairs with Prince Theodore had gone. "'What was it about?' asked Nicholas. "'Always the same thing,' said Pierre, looking round at his listeners. "'Everybody sees that things are going so badly that they cannot be allowed to go on so, and that it is the duty of all decent men to counteract it as far as they can.' "'What can decent men do?' Nicholas inquired, frowning slightly. "'What can be done?' "'Why, this.' "'Come into my study,' said Nicholas. Natasha, who had long expected to be fetched to nurse her baby, now heard the nurse calling her and went to the nursery. Countess Mary followed her. The men went into the study, and little Nicholas Bolkonsky followed them, unnoticed by his uncle, and sat down at the writing-table in a shady corner by the window. "'Well, what would you do?' asked Denisov. "'Always some fantastic schemes,' said Nicholas. "'Why this?' began Pierre, not sitting down but pacing the room, sometimes stopping short, gesticulating, and lisping. The position in Petersburg is this. The emperor does not look into anything. He has abandoned himself altogether to this mysticism. Pierre could not tolerate mysticism in anyone now. 
he seeks only for peace, and only these people, sans foi ni loi, without faith or law, can give it him. People who recklessly hack at and strangle everything, Magnitsky, Arakcheyev, and Tutiquanti. You will agree that if you did not look after your estates yourself, but only wanted a quiet life, the harsher your steward was, the more readily your object might be attained," he said to Nicholas. "'Well, what does that lead up to?' said Nicholas. "'Well, everything is going to ruin. Robbery in the law courts, in the army nothing but flogging, drilling, and military settlements. The people are tortured, enlightenment is suppressed. All that is young and honest is crushed. Everyone sees that this cannot go on. Everything is strained to such a degree that it will certainly break," said Pierre, as those who examine the actions of any government have always said since governments began. I told them just one thing in Petersburg. Told whom? Well, you know whom," said Pierre, with a meaning glance from under his brows. Prince Theodore and all those. To encourage culture and philanthropy is all very well, of course. The aim is excellent but in the present circumstances something else is needed." At that moment Nicholas noticed the presence of his nephew. His face darkened and he went up to the boy. "'Why are you here?' "'Why, let him be,' said Pierre, taking Nicholas by the arm and continuing. "'That is not enough,' I told them. Something else is needed. When you stand expecting the overstrained string to snap at any moment, when everyone is expecting the inevitable catastrophe, as many as possible must join hands as closely as they can to withstand the general calamity. Everything that is young and strong is being enticed away and depraved. One is lured by women, another by honors, a third by ambition or money, and they go over to that camp. No independent men, such as you or I, are left. What I say is, widen the scope of our society. Let the mot d'ordre be not virtue alone, but independence and action as well." Nicholas, who had left his nephew, irritably pushed up an armchair, sat down in it, and listened to Pierre, coughing discontentedly and frowning more and more. "'But action with what aim?' he cried. "'And what position will you adopt toward the government?' "'Why, the position of assistance. The society need not be secret if the government allows it. Not merely is it not hostile to government, but it is a society of true conservatives, a society of gentlemen in the full meaning of that word. It is only to prevent some Pugachev or other from killing my children and yours, and Erechea from sending me off to some military settlement. We join hands only for the public welfare and the general safety. Yes but it's a secret society, and therefore a hostile and harmful one which can only cause harm. Why? Did the Tugendbund which saved Europe? They did not even venture to suggest that Russia had saved Europe. Do any harm? The Tugendbund is an alliance of virtue. It is love, mutual help. It is what Christ preached on the cross. Natasha, who had come in during the conversation, looked joyfully at her husband. It was not what he was saying that pleased her. That did not even interest her, for it seemed to her that was all extremely simple and that she had known it for a long time. It seemed so to her because she knew that it sprang from Pierre's whole soul. But it was his animated and enthusiastic appearance that made her glad. The boy with the thin neck stretching out from the turned-down collar, whom everyone had forgotten, gazed at Pierre with even greater and more rapturous joy. Every word of Pierre's burned into his heart, and with a nervous movement of his fingers he unconsciously broke the sealing wax and quill pens his hands came upon on his uncle's table. It is not at all what you suppose, but that is what the German Tugendbund was, and what I am proposing. No, my friend. The Tugendbund is all very well for the sausage eaters, but I don't understand it and can't even pronounce it," interposed Anisov in a loud and resolute voice. I agree that everything here is rotten and horrible, but the Tugendbund I don't understand. If we're not satisfied, let us have a bunt of our own. That's all right. 
Je suis votre homme. I'm your man. Pierre smiled. Natasha began to laugh, but Nicholas knitted his brow still more and began proving to Pierre that there was no prospect of any great change, and that all the danger he spoke of existed only in his imagination. Pierre maintained the contrary, and as his mental faculties were greater and more resourceful, Nicholas felt himself cornered. This made him still angrier, for he was fully convinced, not by reasoning, but by something within him stronger than reason, of the justice of his opinion. "'I will tell you this,' he said, rising and trying with nervously twitching fingers to prop up his pipe in a corner, but finally abandoning the attempt. "'I can't prove it to you. You say that everything here is rotten and that an overthrow is coming. I don't see it. But you also say that our oath of allegiance is a conditional matter, and to that I reply, You are my best friend, as you know, but if you formed a secret society and began working against the government, be it what it may, I know it is my duty to obey the government. And if Eric Cheyev ordered me to lead a squadron against you and cut you down, I should not hesitate an instant, but should do it. And you may argue about that as you like. An awkward silence followed these words. Natasha was the first to speak, defending her husband and attacking her brother. Her defense was weak and inapt, but she attained her object. The conversation was resumed, and no longer in the unpleasantly hostile tone of Nicholas's last remark. When they all got up to go in to supper, little Nicholas Bolkonsky went up to Pierre, pale and with shining, radiant eyes. "'Uncle Pierre, you—' "'No. If Papa were alive, would he agree with you?' he asked. And Pierre suddenly realized what a special, independent, complex and powerful process of thought and feeling must have been going on in this boy during that conversation. And remembering all he had said, he regretted that the lad should have heard him. He had, however, to give him an answer. "'Yes, I think so.' he said reluctantly, and left the study. The lad looked down, and seemed now for the first time to notice what he had done to the things on the table. He flushed and went up to Nicholas. "'Uncle, forgive me. I did that... unintentionally,' he said, pointing to the broken ceiling wax and pens. Nicholas started angrily. "'All right, all right,' he said, throwing the bits under the table." and, evidently suppressing his vexation with difficulty, he turned away from the boy. "'You ought not to have been here at all,' he said. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 14《First Epilogue, Chapter 15, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Epilogue, Chapter 15 The conversation at supper was not about politics or societies, but turned upon the subject Nicholas liked best, recollections of 1812. Denisov started these, and Pierre was particularly agreeable and amusing about them. The family separated on the most friendly terms. After supper, Nicholas, having undressed in his study and given instructions to the steward who had been waiting for him, went to the bedroom in his dressing-gown, where he found his wife still at her table writing. "'What are you writing, Mary?' Nicholas asked. Countess Mary blushed. She was afraid that what she was writing would not be understood or approved by her husband. She had wanted to conceal what she was writing from him but at the same time was glad he had surprised her at it, and that she would now have to tell him. "'A diary, Nicholas,' she replied, handing him a blue exercise book filled with her firm, bold writing. "'A diary?' Nicholas repeated with a shade of irony, and he took up the book. It was in French. "'December 4. Today, when Andrusha, her eldest boy, woke up, he did not wish to dress, and Mademoiselle Louise sent for me. He was naughty and obstinate. I tried threats, but he only grew angrier. Then I took the matter in hand. 
I left him alone and began with nurse's help to get the other children up, telling him that I did not love him. For a long time he was silent, as if astonished. Then he jumped out of bed, ran to me in his shirt, and sobbed so that I could not calm him for a long time. It was plain that what troubled him most was that he had grieved me. Afterwards, in the evening, when I gave him his ticket, he again began crying piteously and kissing me. One can do anything with him by tenderness. "'What is a ticket?' Nicholas inquired. I have begun giving the elder ones marks every evening, showing how they have behaved." Nicholas looked into the radiant eyes that were gazing at him, and continued to turn over the pages and read. In the diary was set down everything in the children's lives that seemed noteworthy to their mother as showing their characters, or suggesting general reflections on educational methods. They were, for the most part, quite insignificant trifles but did not seem so to the mother or to the father either, now that he read this diary about his children for the first time. Under the date five was entered, Mitya was naughty at table. Papa said he was to have no pudding. He had none, but looked so unhappily and greedily at the others while they were eating. I think that punishment by depriving children of sweets only develops their greediness. Must tell Nicholas this. Nicholas put down the book and looked at his wife. The radiant eyes gazed at him questioningly. Would he approve or disapprove of her diary? There could be no doubt not only of his approval, but also of his admiration for his wife. Perhaps it need not be done so pedantically, thought Nicholas, or even done at all, but this untiring, continual spiritual effort of which the sole aim was the children's moral welfare delighted him. Had Nicholas been able to analyze his feelings, he would have found that his steady, tender, and proud love of his wife rested on his feeling of wonder at her spirituality and at the lofty moral world, almost beyond his reach in which she had her being. He was proud of her intelligence and goodness, recognized his own insignificance beside her in the spiritual world and rejoiced all the more that she with such a soul not only belonged to him but was part of himself. "'I quite, quite approve, my dearest,' said he with a significant look, and after a short pause he added, "'And I behaved badly today. You weren't in the study. We began disputing, Pierre and I, and I lost my temper. But he is impossible. Such a child!' I don't know what would become of him if Natasha didn't keep him in hand. Have you any idea why he went to Petersburg? They have formed— Yes, I know, said Countess Mary. Natasha told me. Well, then, you know, Nicholas went on, growing hot at the mere recollection of their discussion, he wanted to convince me that it is every honest man's duty to go against the government, and that the oath of allegiance and duty— I am sorry you weren't there. They all fell on me, Denisov and Natasha. Natasha is absurd. How she rules over him. And yet there need only be a discussion, and she has no words of her own, but only repeats his sayings," added Nicholas, yielding to that irresistible inclination which tempts us to judge those nearest and dearest to us. He forgot that what he was saying about Natasha could have been applied word for word to himself in relation to his wife. "'Yes, I have noticed that,' said Countess Mary. "'When I told him that duty and the oath were above everything, he started proving goodness knows what. A pity you were not there. What would you have said?' "'As I see it, you are quite right, and I told Natasha so.' Pierre says everybody is suffering, tortured, and being corrupted, and that it is our duty to help our neighbor. Of course he is right there," said Countess Mary. But he forgets that we have other duties nearer to us, duties indicated to us by God Himself, and that though we might expose ourselves to risks, we must not risk our children. Yes, that's it. That's just what I said to him," put in Nicholas who fancied he really had said it. But they insisted on their own view, love of one's neighbor and Christianity, and all this in the presence of young Nicholas, 
who had gone into my study and broke all my things. "'Ah, Nicholas, do you know I am often troubled about little Nicholas?' said Countess Mary. "'He is such an exceptional boy. I am afraid I neglect him in favor of my own. We all have children and relations, while he has no one. He is constantly alone with his thoughts.' Well, I don't think you need reproach yourself on his account. All that the fondest mother could do for her son you have done and are doing for him, and of course I am glad of it. He is a fine lad, a fine lad. This evening he listened to Pierre in a sort of trance, and fancy, as we were going into supper I looked and he had broken everything on my table to bits, and he told me of it himself at once. I never knew him to tell an untruth. A fine lad, a fine lad," repeated Nicholas, who at heart was not fond of Nicholas Bolkonsky, but was always anxious to recognize that he was a fine lad. "'Still, I am not the same as his own mother,' said Countess Mary. "'I feel I am not the same, and it troubles me. A wonderful boy, but I am dreadfully afraid for him. It would be good for him to have a companion's. Well, it won't be for long. Next summer I'll take him to Petersburg," said Nicholas. Yes, Pierre always was a dreamer and always will be," he continued, returning to the talk in the study which had evidently disturbed him. Well, what business is it of mine what goes on there, whether Arakcheyev is bad and all that? What business was it of mine when I married and was so deep in debt that I was threatened with prison? and had a mother who could not see or understand it. And then there are you and the children and our affairs. Is it for my own pleasure that I am at the farm or in the office from morning to night? No, but I know I must work to comfort my mother, to repay you, and not to leave the children such beggars as I was." Countess Mary wanted to tell him that man does not live by bread alone, and that he attached too much importance to these matters but she knew she must not say this, and that it would be useless to do so. She only took his hand and kissed it. He took this as a sign of approval and a confirmation of his thoughts, and after a few minutes' reflection continued to think aloud. "'You know, Mary, today Elias Mitrofanitch—this was his overseer— came back from the Atambov estate and told me they are already offering eighty thousand roubles for the forest and with an eager face Nicholas began to speak of the possibility of repurchasing Otradno before long, and added, "'Another ten years of life, and I shall leave the children in an excellent position.'" Countess Mary listened to her husband and understood all that he told her. She knew that when he thought aloud in this way he would sometimes ask her what he had been saying, and be vexed if he noticed that she had been thinking about something else but she had to force herself to attend, for what he was saying did not interest her at all. She looked at him and did not think, but felt about something different. She felt a submissive tender love for this man, who would never understand all that she understood, and this seemed to make her love for him still stronger, and added a touch of passionate tenderness. Besides this feeling which absorbed her altogether and hindered her from following the details of her husband's plans, thoughts that had no connection with what he was saying flitted through her mind. She thought of her nephew. Her husband's account of the boy's agitation while Pierre was speaking struck her forcibly, and various traits of his gentle, sensitive character recurred to her mind. And while thinking of her nephew, she thought also of her own children. She did not compare them with him, but compared her feeling for them with her feeling for him, and felt with regret that there was something lacking in her feeling for young Nicholas. Sometimes it seemed to her that this difference arose from the difference in their ages, but she felt herself to blame toward him and promised in her heart to do better and to accomplish the impossible, in this life to love her husband, her children, little Nicholas, and all her neighbors, as Christ loved mankind. Countess Mary's soul always strove toward the infinite, the eternal, and the absolute, and could therefore never be at peace. 
a stern expression of the lofty secret suffering of a soul burdened by the body appeared on her face. Nicholas gazed at her. Oh, God, what will become of us if she dies, as I always fear when her face is like that? thought he, and placing himself before the icon, he began to say his evening prayers. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 15《First Epilogue, Chapter 16, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — First Epilogue, Chapter 16 Natasha and Pierre, left alone, also began to talk as only a husband and wife can talk, that is, with extraordinary clearness and rapidity understanding and expressing each other's thoughts in ways contrary to all rules of logic, without premises, deductions, or conclusions, and in a quite peculiar way. Natasha was so used to this kind of talk with her husband that for her it was the surest sign of something being wrong between them if Pierre followed a line of logical reasoning. When he began proving anything, or talking argumentatively and calmly, and she, led on by his example, began to do the same, she knew that they were on the verge of a quarrel. From the moment they were alone, and Natasha came up to him with wide-open, happy eyes, and quickly seizing his head pressed it to her bosom, saying, "'Now you are all mine, mine! You won't escape!' From that moment this conversation began, contrary to all the laws of logic and contrary to them because quite different subjects were talked about at one and the same time. This simultaneous discussion of many topics did not prevent a clear understanding, but on the contrary, was the surest sign that they fully understood one another. Just as in a dream, when all is uncertain, unreasoning, and contradictory, except the feeling that guides the dream, so in this intercourse, contrary to all laws of reason, the words themselves were not consecutive and clear, but only the feeling that prompted them. Natasha spoke to Pierre about her brother's life and doings, of how she had suffered and lacked life during his own absence, and of how she was fonder than ever of Mary, and how Mary was in every way better than herself. In saying this, Natasha was sincere in acknowledging Mary's superiority, but at the same time, by saying it, she made a demand on Pierre that he should, all the same, prefer her to Mary and to all other women and that now, especially after having seen many women in Petersburg, he should tell her so afresh. Pierre, answering Natasha's words, told her how intolerable it had been for him to meet ladies at dinners and balls in Petersburg. "'I have quite lost the knack of talking to ladies,' he said. "'It was simply dull. Besides, I was very busy.' Natasha looked intently at him and went on. Mary is so splendid, she said. How she understands children! It is as if she saw straight into their souls. Yesterday, for instance, Mitya was naughty. How like his father he is! Pierre interjected. Natasha knew why he mentioned Mitya's likeness to Nicholas. The recollection of his dispute with his brother in law was unpleasant, and he wanted to know what Natasha thought of it. Nicholas has the weakness of never agreeing with anything not generally accepted. But I understand that you value what opens up a fresh line," said she, repeating words Pierre had once uttered. No, the chief point is that to Nicholas ideas and discussions are an amusement, almost a pastime," said Pierre. For instance, he is collecting a library and has made it a rule not to buy a new book till he has read what he had already bought. Sismondi and Rousseau and Montesquieu," he added with a smile. "'You know how much I—' He began to soften down what he had said, but Natasha interrupted him to show that this was unnecessary. "'So you say ideas are an amusement to him?' "'Yes, and for me nothing else is serious. All the time in Petersburg I saw everyone as in a dream. When I am taken up by a thought, all else is mere amusement.' Ah, uh, I'm so sorry I wasn't there when you met the children," said Natasha. 
Which was most delighted? Lisa, I'm sure." Yes, Pierre replied, and went on with what was in his mind. Nicholas says we ought not to think. But I can't help it. Besides, when I was in Petersburg, I felt, I can say this to you, that the whole affair would go to pieces without me. Everyone was pulling his own way. But I succeeded in uniting them all. And then my idea so clear and simple. You see, I don't say that we ought to oppose this and that. We may be mistaken. What I say is, join hands, you who love the right, and let there be but one banner, that of active virtue. Prince Sergei is a fine fellow and clever. Natasha would have had no doubt as to the greatness of Pierre's idea, but one thing disconcerted her. Can a man so important and necessary to society be also my husband? How did this happen? She wished to express this doubt to him. Now, who could decide whether he is really cleverer than all the others? She asked herself, and passed in review all those whom Pierre most respected. Judging by what he had said, there was no one he had respected so highly as Platon Karatayev. Do you know what I am thinking about? she asked. About Platon Karatayev. Would he have approved of you now, do you think? Pierre was not at all surprised at this question. He understood his wife's line of thought. Platon Karatayev? he repeated and pondered evidently sincerely trying to imagine Karatayev's opinion on the subject. He would not have understood. Yet perhaps he would. I love you awfully, Natasha suddenly said, awfully, awfully. No, he would not have approved, said Pierre after reflection. What he would have approved of is our family life. He was always so anxious to find seemliness, happiness, and peace in everything, and I should have been proud to let him see us. There, now, you talk of my absence, but you wouldn't believe what a special feeling I have for you after a separation. Yes, I should think, Natasha began. No, it's not that. I never leave off loving you, and one couldn't love more, but this is something special. Yes. Of course. He did not finish, because their eyes meeting said the rest. What nonsense it is, Natasha suddenly exclaimed, about honeymoons, and that the greatest happiness is at first. On the contrary, now is the best of all. If only you did not go away. Do you remember how we quarreled? And it was always my fault, always mine. And what we quarreled about? I don't even remember." "'Always about the same thing,' said Pierre with a smile. "'Jella, don't say it. I can't bear it,' Natasha cried, and her eyes glittered coldly and vindictively. "'Did you see her?' she added after a pause. "'No, and if I had, I shouldn't have recognized her.' They were silent for a while. "'Oh, do you know?' While you were talking in the study, I was looking at you," Natasha began, evidently anxious to disperse the cloud that had come over them. "'You are as like him as two peas, like the boy,' she met her little son. "'Oh, it's time to go to him. The milk's come. But I'm sorry to leave you.' They were silent for a few seconds. Then suddenly, turning to one another at the same time, they both began to speak. Pierre began with self-satisfaction and enthusiasm, Natasha with a quiet, happy smile. Having interrupted one another, they both stopped to let the other continue. No, what did you say? Go on, go on. No, you go on. I was talking nonsense, said Natasha. Pierre finished what he had begun. It was the sequel to his complacent reflections on his success in Petersburg. At that moment it seemed to him that he was chosen to give a new direction to the whole of Russian society and to the whole world. I only wish to say that ideas that have great results are always simple ones. My whole idea is that if vicious people are united and constitute a power, then honest folk must do the same. Now that's simple enough. Yes. 
And what were you going to say? I, only nonsense. But all the same. Oh, nothing, only a trifle, said Natasha, smiling still more brightly. I only wanted to tell you about Petya. Today Nurse was coming to take him from me, and he laughed, shut his eyes, and clung to me. I'm sure he thought he was hiding. Awfully sweet. There now, he's crying. Well, good-bye. And she left the room. Meanwhile, downstairs in young Nicholas Bolkonsky's bedroom, a little lamp was burning as usual. The boy was afraid of the dark, and they could not cure him of it. Salle slept propped up on four pillows, and his Roman nose emitted sounds of rhythmic snoring. Little Nicholas, who had just waked up in a cold perspiration, sat up in bed and gazed before him with wide-open eyes. He had awaked from a terrible dream. He had dreamed that he and Uncle Pierre, wearing helmets such as were depicted in his Plutarch, were leading a huge army. The army was made up of white slanting lines that filled the air, like the cobwebs that float about in autumn and which de Salle called Les Filles de la Vierge. In front was glory, which was similar to those threads but rather thicker. He and Pierre were borne along lightly and joyously, nearer and nearer to their goal. Suddenly the threads that moved them began to slacken and become entangled, and it grew difficult to move, and Uncle Nicholas stood before them in a stern and threatening attitude. "'Have you done this?' he said, pointing to some broken sealing-wax and pens. "'I loved you, but I have orders from Eric Cheyev, and will kill the first of you who moves forward.' Little Nicholas turned to look at Pierre, but Pierre was no longer there. In his place was his father, Prince Andrew. And his father had neither shape nor form, but he existed. And when little Nicholas perceived him, he grew faint with love.' He felt himself powerless, limp, and formless. His father caressed and pitied him. But Uncle Nicholas came nearer and nearer to them. Terror seized young Nicholas, and he awoke. "'My father,' he thought. Though there were two good portraits of Prince Andrew in the house, Nicholas never imagined him in human form. "'My father has been with me and caressed me. He approved of me and of Uncle Pierre. Whatever he may tell me, I will do it. Musius Scavola burned his hand. Why should not the same sort of thing happen to me? I know they want me to learn, and I will learn. But some day I shall have finished learning, and then I will do something. I only pray God that something may happen to me such as happened to Plutarch's men, and I will act as they did. I will do better. Everyone shall know me, love me, and be delighted with me and suddenly his bosom heaved with sobs, and he began to cry. "'Are you ill?' he heard de Salle's voice asking. "'No,' answered Nicholas, and lay back on his pillow. "'He is good and kind, and I am fond of him,' he thought of de Salle. "'But Uncle Pierre! Oh, what a wonderful man he is! And my father? Oh, father, father! Yes!' I will do something with which even he would be satisfied. End of First Epilogue, Chapter 16《Second Epilogue, Chapter 1 Of War in Peace, Volume 4 by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Epilogue, Chapter 1 History is the life of nations and of humanity. To seize and put into words, to describe directly the life of humanity or even of a single nation, appears impossible. The ancient historians all employed one and the same method to describe and seize the apparent elusive, the life of a people. They described the activity of individuals who ruled the people, and regarded the activity of those men as representing the activity of the whole nation. The question, how did individuals make nations act as they wished, and by what was the will of these individuals themselves guided, the ancients met by recognizing a divinity which subjected the nations to the will of a chosen man, 
and guided the will of that chosen man so as to accomplish ends that were predestined. For the agents these questions were solved by a belief in the direct participation of the deity in human affairs. Modern history, in theory, rejects both these principles. It would seem that having rejected the belief of the ancients in man's subjection to the deity, and in a predetermined aim toward which nations are led, modern history should study not the manifestations of power, but the causes that produce it. But modern history has not done this. Having, in theory, rejected the view held by the ancients, it still follows them in practice. Instead of men endowed with divine authority and directly guided by the will of God, modern history has given us either heroes endowed with extraordinary superhuman capacities, or simply men of various kinds, from monarchs to journalists who lead the masses. Instead of the formerly divinely appointed aims of the Jewish, Greek, or Roman nations, which ancient historians regarded as representing the progress of humanity, Modern history has postulated its own aims, the welfare of the French, German, or English people, or, in its highest abstraction, the welfare and civilization of humanity in general, by which is usually meant that of the peoples occupying a small northwesterly portion of a large continent. Modern history has rejected the beliefs of the ancients without replacing them by a new conception and the logic of the situation has obliged the historians, after they had apparently rejected the divine authority of the kings and the fate of the ancients, to reach the same conclusion by another road, that is, to recognize, one, nations guided by individual men, and, two, the existence of a known aim to which these nations and humanity at large are tending. At the basis of the works of all the modern historians from Gibbon to Buckle, despite their seeming disagreements and the apparent novelty of their outlooks, lie those two old unavoidable assumptions. In the first place, the historian describes the activity of individuals who, in his opinion, have directed humanity. One historian considers only monarchs, generals, and ministers as being such men, while another includes also orators, learned men, reformers, philosophers, and poets. Secondly, it is assumed that the goal toward which humanity is being led is known to the historians. To one of them this goal is the greatness of the Roman, Spanish, or French realm. To another it is liberty, equality, and a certain kind of civilization of a small corner of the world called Europe. In 1789 a ferment arises in Paris. It grows, spreads, and is expressed by a movement of peoples from west to east. Several times it moves eastward and collides with a counter-movement from the east westward. In 1812 it reaches its extreme limit, Moscow, and then, with remarkable symmetry, a counter-movement occurs from east to west, attracting to it, as the first movement had done, the nations of Middle Europe. The counter-movement reaches the starting point of the first movement in the west, Paris, and subsides. During that twenty-year period, an immense number of fields were left untilled, houses were burned, trade changed its direction, millions of men migrated, were impoverished, or were enriched, and millions of Christian men professing the law of love of their fellows slew one another. What does all this mean? Why did it happen? What made those people burn houses and slay their fellow men? What were the causes of these events? What force made men act so? These are the instinctive, plain, and most legitimate questions humanity asks itself when it encounters the monuments and tradition of that period. For a reply to these questions, the common sense of mankind turns to the science of history, whose aim is to enable nations and humanity to know themselves. If history had retained the conception of the ancients, it would have said that God, to reward or punish his people, gave Napoleon power and directed his will to the fulfillment of the divine ends, and that reply would have been clear and complete. One might believe or disbelieve in the divine significance of Napoleon, but for anyone believing in it there would have been nothing unintelligible in the history of that period, 
nor would there have been any contradictions. But modern history cannot give that reply. Science does not admit the conception of the ancients as to the direct participation of the deity in human affairs, and therefore history ought to give other answers. Modern history, replying to these questions, says, You want to know what this movement means, what caused it, and what force produced these events? Then listen. Louis the Fourteenth was a very proud and self-confident man. He had such and such mistresses, and such and such ministers, and he ruled France badly. His descendants were weak men, and they too ruled France badly. And they had such and such favorites, and such and such mistresses. Moreover, certain men wrote some books at that time. At the end of the eighteenth century, there were a couple of dozen men in Paris who began to talk about all men being free and equal. This caused people all over France to begin to slash and drown one another. They killed the king and many other people. At that time there was in France a man of genius, Napoleon. He conquered everybody everywhere, that is, he killed many people because he was a great genius. And for some reason he went to kill Africans, and killed them so well and was so cunning and wise that when he returned to France he ordered everybody to obey him, and they all obeyed him. Having become an emperor, he again went out to kill people in Italy, Austria, and Prussia. And there, too, he killed a great many. In Russia there was an emperor, Alexander, who decided to restore order in Europe and therefore fought against Napoleon. In 1807 he suddenly made friends with him, but in 1811 they again quarreled and again began killing many people. Napoleon led six hundred thousand men into Russia and captured Moscow. Then he suddenly ran away from Moscow, and the Emperor Alexander, helped by the advice of Stein and others, united Europe to arm against the disturber of its peace. All Napoleon's allies suddenly became his enemies, and their forces advanced against the fresh forces he raised. The Allies defeated Napoleon, entered Paris, forced Napoleon to abdicate, and sent him to the island of Elba, not depriving him of the title of Emperor, and showing him every respect, though five years before and one year later they all regarded him as an outlaw and a brigand. Then Louis the Eighteenth who till then had been the laughing-stock both of the French and the Allies, began to reign. And Napoleon, shedding tears before his old guards, renounced the throne and went into exile. Then the skillful statesmen and diplomatists, especially Talleyrand, who managed to sit down in a particular chair before anyone else and thereby extended the frontiers of France, talked in Vienna and by these conversations made the nations happy or unhappy. Suddenly the diplomatists and monarchs nearly quarreled, and were on the point of again ordering their armies to kill one another, but just then Napoleon arrived in France with a battalion, and the French, who had been hating him, immediately all submitted to him. But the allied monarchs were angry at this, and went to fight the French once more and they defeated the genius Napoleon, and suddenly recognizing him as a brigand, sent him to the island of St. Helena. And the exile, separated from the beloved France so dear to his heart, died a lingering death on that rock, and bequeathed his great deeds to posterity. But in Europe a reaction occurred, and the sovereigns once again all began to oppress their subjects. It would be a mistake to think that this is ironic a caricature of the historical accounts. On the contrary, it is a very mild expression of the contradictory replies, not meeting the questions, which all the historians give, from the compilers of memoirs and the histories of separate states, to the writers of general histories and the new histories of the culture of that period. The strangeness and absurdity of these replies arise from the fact that modern history, like a deaf man, answers questions no one has asked. If the purpose of history be to give a description of the movement of humanity and of the peoples, the first question, in the absence of a reply to which all the rest will be incomprehensible, is, what is the power that moves peoples? 
To this, modern history laboriously replies either that Napoleon was a great genius, or that Louis the Fourteenth was very proud, or that certain writers wrote certain books. All that may be so, and mankind is ready to agree with it, but it is not what was asked. All that would be interesting if we recognized a divine power based on itself, and always consistently directing its nations through Napoleons, Louis, and writers, but we do not acknowledge such a power, and therefore, before speaking about Napoleons, Louis, and authors, we ought to be shown the connection existing between these men and the movement of the nations. If instead of a divine power, some other force has appeared, it should be explained in what this new force consists, for the whole interest of history lies precisely in that force. History seems to assume that this force is self-evident and known to everyone. But in spite of every desire to regard it as known, anyone reading many historical works cannot help doubting whether this new force, so variously understood by the historians themselves, is really quite well known to everybody. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 1《Second Epilogue, Chapter 2, of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Second Epilogue, Chapter 2 What Force Moves the Nations? Biographical historians and historians of separate nations understand this force as a power inherent in heroes and rulers. In their narration, events occur solely by the will of a Napoleon and Alexander, or in general, of the persons they describe. The answers given by this kind of historian to the question of what force causes events to happen are satisfactory only as long as there is but one historian to each event. As soon as historians of different nationalities and tendencies begin to describe the same event, the replies they give immediately lose all meaning for this force is understood by them all, not only differently, but often in quite contradictory ways. One historian says that an event was produced by Napoleon's power, another that it was produced by Alexander's, a third that it was due to the power of some other person. Besides this, historians of that kind contradict each other even in their statement as to the force on which the authority of some particular person was based. Thiers, a Bonapartist, says that Napoleon's power was based on his virtue and genius. Lanfray, a Republican, says it was based on his trickery and deception of the people. So the historians of this class, by mutually destroying one another's positions, destroy the understanding of the force which produces events, and furnish no reply to history's essential question. Writers of universal history who deal with all the nations, seem to recognize how erroneous is the specialist historian's view of the force which produces events. They do not recognize it as a power inherent in heroes and rulers, but as the resultant of a multiplicity of variously directed forces. In describing a war or the subjugation of a people, a general historian looks for the cause of the event not in the power of one man, but in the interaction of many persons connected with the event. According to this view, the power of historical personages, represented as the product of many forces, can no longer, it would seem, be regarded as a force that itself produces events. Yet in most cases, universal historians still employ the conception of power as a force that itself produces events, and treat it as their cause. In their exposition, an historical character is first the product of his time, and his power only the resultant of various forces, and then his power is itself a force producing events. Gervinus, Schlosser, and others, for instance, at one time proved Napoleon to be a product of the Revolution, of the ideas of 1789 and so forth, and at another plainly say that the campaign of 1812 and other things they do not like were simply the product of Napoleon's misdirected will, and that the very ideas of 1789 were arrested in their development by Napoleon's caprice. The ideas of the revolution and the general temper of the age produced Napoleon's power, 
but Napoleon's power suppressed the ideas of the revolution and the general temper of the age. This curious contradiction is not accidental. Not only does it occur at every step, but the universal historian's accounts are all made up of a chain of such contradictions. This contradiction occurs because, after entering the field of analysis, the universal historians stop halfway. To find component forces equal to the composite or resultant force, the sum of the components must equal the resultant. This condition is never observed by the universal historians, and so to explain the resultant forces they are obliged to admit, in addition to the insufficient components, another unexplained force affecting the resultant action. Specialist historians describing the campaign of 1813, or the restoration of the Bourbons, plainly assert that these events were produced by the will of Alexander. But the universal historian Gervinus, refuting this opinion of the specialist historian, tries to prove that the campaign of 1813 and the restoration of the Bourbons were due to other things beside Alexander's will, such as the activity of Stein, Metternich, Madame de Stael, Talleyrand, Fichte, Chateaubriand, and others. The historian evidently decomposes Alexander's power into the components, Talleyrand, Chateaubriand, and the rest. But the sum of the components, that is, the interactions of Chateaubriand, Talleyrand, Madame de Stael, and the others, evidently does not equal the resultant, namely, the phenomenon of millions of Frenchmen submitting to the Bourbons. That Chateaubriand, Madame de Stael, and others spoke certain words to one another only affected their mutual relations, but does not account for the submission of millions. And therefore, to explain how, from these relations of theirs, the submission of millions of people resulted, that is, how component forces equal to one A gave a resultant equal to a thousand times A, the historian is again obliged to fall back on power, the force he had denied, and to recognize it as the resultant of the forces, that is, he has to admit an unexplained force acting on the resultant. And that is just what the universal historians do, and consequently they not only contradict the specialist historians, but contradict themselves. Peasants, having no clear idea of the cause of rain, say, according to whether they want rain or fine weather, the wind has blown the clouds away, or the wind has brought up the clouds. And in the same way, the universal historians sometimes, when it pleases them and fits in with their theory, say that power is the result of events, and sometimes, when they want to prove something else, say that power produces events. A third class of historians, the so-called historians of culture, following the path laid down by the universal historians, who sometimes accept writers and ladies as forces producing events, again take that force to be something quite different. They see it in what is called culture, in mental activity. The historians of culture are quite consistent in regard to their progenitors, the writers of universal histories. For if historical events may be explained by the fact that certain persons treated one another in such and such ways, why not explain them by the fact that such and such people wrote such and such books? Of the immense number of indications accompanying every vital phenomenon, these historians select the indication of intellectual activity and say that this indication is the cause. But despite their endeavors to prove that the cause of events lies in intellectual activity, only by a great stretch can one admit that there is any connection between intellectual activity and the movement of peoples, and in no case can one admit that intellectual activity controls people's actions, for that view is not confirmed by such facts as the very cruel murders of the French Revolution resulting from the doctrine of the equality of man, or from the very cruel wars and executions resulting from the preaching of love. But even admitting as correct all the cunningly devised arguments with which these histories are filled, admitting that nations are governed by some undefined force called an idea, history's essential question still remains unanswered. And to the former power of monarchs, and to the influence of advisers and other people introduced by the universal historians, another newer force, the idea, is added, the connection of which with the masses needs explanation. It is possible to understand that Napoleon had power, and so events occurred. 
With some effort, one may even conceive that Napoleon, together with other influences, was the cause of an event. But how a book, La Contrat Social, had the effect of making Frenchmen begin to drown one another cannot be understood without an explanation of the causal nexus of this new force with the event. Undoubtedly, some relation exists between all who live contemporaneously, and so it is possible to find some connection between the intellectual activity of men and their historical movements, just as such a connection may be found between the movements of humanity and commerce, handicraft, gardening, or anything else you please. But why intellectual activity is considered by the historians of culture to be the cause or expression of the whole historical movement is hard to understand. Only the following considerations can have led the historians to such a conclusion. 1. That history is written by learned men, and so it is natural and agreeable for them to think that the activity of their class supplies the basis of the movement of all humanity, just as a similar belief is natural and agreeable to traders, agriculturists, and soldiers. If they do not express it, that is merely because traders and soldiers do not write history and two, that spiritual activity, enlightenment, civilization, culture, ideas, are all indistinct, indefinite conceptions, under whose banner it is very easy to use words having a still less definite meaning, and which can therefore be readily introduced into any theory. But not to speak of the intrinsic quality of histories of this kind, which may possibly even be of use to someone for something, the histories of culture, to which all general histories tend more and more to approximate, are significant from the fact that, after seriously and minutely examining various religious, philosophic, and political doctrines as causes of events, as soon as they have to describe an actual historic event, such as the campaign of 1812, for instance, they involuntarily describe it as resulting from an exercise of power, and say plainly that that was the result of Napoleon's will. Speaking so, the historians of culture involuntarily contradict themselves, and show that the new force they have devised does not account for what happens in history, and that history can only be explained by introducing a power which they apparently do not recognize. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 2《Second Epilogue, Chapter 3, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Second Epilogue, Chapter 3 A locomotive is moving. Someone asks, What moves it? A peasant says the devil moves it. Another man says the locomotive moves because its wheels go round. A third asserts that the cause of its movement lies in the smoke which the wind carries away. The peasant is irrefutable. He has devised a complete explanation. To refute him, someone would have to prove to him that there is no devil. Or another peasant would have to explain to him that it is not the devil, but a German who moves the locomotive. Only then, as a result of the contradiction, will they see that they are both wrong but the man who says that the movement of the wheels is the cause refutes himself, for having once begun to analyze, he ought to go on and explain further why the wheels go round. And till he has reached the ultimate cause of the movement of the locomotive in the pressure of the steam in the boiler, he has no right to stop in his search for the cause. The man who explains the movement of the locomotive by the smoke that is carried back has noticed that the wheels do not supply an explanation, and has taken the first sign that occurs to him, and in his turn has offered that as an explanation. The only conception that can explain the movement of the locomotive is that of a force commensurate with the movement observed. The only conception that can explain the movement of the peoples is that of some force commensurate with the whole movement of the peoples. Yet, to supply this conception, various historians take forces of different kinds, all of which are incommensurate with the movement observed. Some see it as a force directly inherent in heroes, as the peasant does the devil in the locomotive, 
others as a force resulting from several other forces, like the movement of the wheels, others again as an intellectual influence, like the smoke that is blown away. So long as histories are written of separate individuals, whether Caesars, Alexanders, Luthers, or Voltaires, and not the histories of all, absolutely all those who take part in an event, it is quite impossible to describe the movement of humanity without the conception of a force compelling men to direct their activity toward a certain end. And the only such conception known to historians is that of power. This conception is the one handle by means of which the material of history, as at present expounded, can be dealt with, and anyone who breaks that handle off, as Buckle did, without finding some other method of treating historical material, merely deprives himself of the one possible way of dealing with it. The necessity of the conception of power as an explanation of historical events is best demonstrated by the universal historians and historians of culture themselves, for they professedly reject that conception, but inevitably have recourse to it at every step. In dealing with humanity's inquiry, the science of history up to now is like money in circulation, paper money and coin. The biographies and special national histories are like paper money. They can be used and can circulate and fulfill their purpose without harm to anyone, and even advantageously, as long as no one asks what is the security behind them. You need only forget to ask how the will of heroes produces events, and such histories as Thiers will be interesting and instructive, and may perhaps even possess a tinge of poetry. But just as doubts of the real value of paper money arise, either because, being easy to make, too much of it gets made, or because people try to exchange it for gold, so also doubts concerning the real value of such histories arise, either because too many of them are written, or because, in his simplicity of heart, someone inquires, by what force did Napoleon do this? that is, wants to exchange the current paper money for the real gold of actual comprehension. The writers of universal histories and of the history of culture are like people who, recognizing the defects of paper money, decide to substitute it for money made of metal that has not the specific gravity of gold. It may indeed make jingling coin, but will do no more than that. Paper money may deceive the ignorant, but nobody is deceived by tokens of base metal that have no value but merely jingle. As gold is gold only if it is serviceable not merely for exchange but also for use, so universal historians will be valuable only when they can reply to history's essential question, what is power? The universal historians give contradictory replies to that question while the historians of culture evade it and answer something quite different. And, as counters of imitation gold can be used only among a group of people who agree to accept them as gold, or among those who do not know the nature of gold, so universal historians and historians of culture, not answering humanity's essential question, serve as currency for some purposes of their own only in universities and among the mass of readers who have a taste for what they call serious reading. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 3this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Epilogue, Chapter 4 Having abandoned the conception of the ancients as to the divine subjection of the will of a nation to some chosen man, and the subjection of that man's will to the deity, history cannot, without contradictions, take a single step till it has chosen one of two things, either a return to the former belief in the direct intervention of the deity in human affairs, or a definite explanation of the meaning of the force producing historical events and termed power. A return to the first is impossible. The belief has been destroyed, and so it is essential to explain what is meant by power. Napoleon ordered an army to be raised and go to war. 
We are so accustomed to that idea and have become so used to it that the question, why did six hundred thousand men go to fight when Napoleon uttered certain words, seems to us senseless. He had the power, and so what he ordered was done. This reply is quite satisfactory if we believe that the power was given him by God. But as soon as we do not admit that, it becomes essential to determine what is this power of one man over others. It cannot be the direct physical power of a strong man over a weak one, a domination based on the application or threat of physical force, like the power of Hercules. Nor can it be based on the effect of moral force, as in their simplicity some historians think who say that the leading figures in history are heroes, that is, men gifted with a special strength of soul and mind called genius. This power cannot be based on the predominance of moral strength, for, not to mention heroes such as Napoleon, about whose moral qualities opinions differ widely, history shows us that neither a Louis XI nor a Metternich, who ruled over millions of people, had any particular moral qualities, but on the contrary were generally morally weaker than any of the millions they ruled over. If the source of power lies neither in the physical nor in the moral qualities of him who possesses it, it must evidently be looked for elsewhere, in the relation to the people of the man who wields the power. And that is how power is understood by the science of jurisprudence, that exchange bank of history which offers to exchange history's understanding of power for true gold. Power is the collective will of the people transferred, by expressed or tacit consent, to their chosen rulers. In the domain of jurisprudence, which consists of discussions of how a state and power might be arranged were it possible for all that to be arranged, it is all very clear. But when applied to history, that definition of power needs explanation. The science of jurisprudence regards the state and power as the ancients regarded fire, namely, as something existing absolutely. But for history, the state and power are merely phenomena, just as for modern physics fire is not an element but a phenomenon. From this fundamental difference between the view held by history and that held by jurisprudence, it follows that jurisprudence can tell minutely how, in its opinion, power should be constituted, and what power, existing immutably outside time, is, but to history's questions about the meaning of the mutations of power in time it can answer nothing. If power be the collective will of the people transferred to their ruler, was Pugachev a representative of the will of the people? If not, then why was Napoleon I? Why was Napoleon III a criminal when he was taken prisoner at Boulogne, and why, later on, were those criminals whom he arrested? Do palace revolutions, in which sometimes only two or three people take part, transfer the will of the people to a new ruler? In international relations, is the will of the people also transferred to their conqueror? Was the will of the Confederation of the Rhine transferred to Napoleon in 1806? Was the will of the Russian people transferred to Napoleon in 1809, when our army, in alliance with the French, went to fight the Austrians? To these questions three answers are possible. Either to assume, one, that the will of the people is always unconditionally transferred to the ruler or rulers they have chosen, and that, therefore, every emergence of a new power, every struggle against the power once appointed, should be absolutely regarded as an infringement of the real power, or two, that the will of the people is transferred to the rulers conditionally, under definite and known conditions, and to show that all limitations, conflicts, and even destructions of power result from a non-observance by the rulers of the conditions under which their power was entrusted to them. Or three, that the will of the people is delegated to the rulers conditionally, but that the conditions are unknown and indefinite, and that the appearance of several authorities, their struggles and their falls, result solely from the greater or lesser fulfillment by the rulers of these unknown conditions on which the will of the people is transferred from some people to others. And these are the three ways in which the historians do explain the relation of the people to their rulers. Some historians, 
those biographical and specialist historians already referred to, in their simplicity, failing to understand the question of the meaning of power, seem to consider that the collective will of the people is unconditionally transferred to historical persons, and therefore, when describing some single state, they assume that particular power to be the one absolute and real power, and that any other force opposing this is not a power but a violation of power, mere violence. Their theory, suitable for primitive and peaceful periods of history, has the inconvenience, in application to complex and stormy periods in the life of nations, during which various powers arise simultaneously and struggle with one another, that a legitimist historian will prove that the National Convention, the Directory, and Bonaparte were mere infringers of the true power, while a Republican and a Bonapartist will prove the one that the Convention and the other that the Empire was the real power, and that all the others were violations of power. Evidently, the explanations furnished by these historians being mutually contradictory can only satisfy young children. Recognizing the falsity of this view of history, another set of historians say that power rests on a conditional delegation of the will of the people to their rulers, and that historical leaders have power only conditionally on carrying out the program that the will of the people has by tacit agreement prescribed to them. But what this program consists in, these historians do not say, or if they do, they continually contradict one another. Each historian, according to his view of what constitutes a nation's progress, looks for these conditions in the greatness, wealth, freedom, or enlightenment of citizens of France or some other country. But not to mention the historian's contradictions as to the nature of this program, or even admitting that some one general program of these conditions exists, the facts of history almost always contradict that theory. If the conditions under which power is entrusted consist in the wealth, freedom, and enlightenment of the people, how is it that Louis the Fourteenth and Yvonne the Terrible end their reigns tranquilly, while Louis the Sixteenth and Charles the First are executed by their people? To this question, historians reply that Louis the Fourteenth's activity, contrary to the program, reacted on Louis the Sixteenth. But why did it not react on Louis the Fourteenth or on Louis the Fifteenth? Why should it react just on Louis the Sixteenth? And what is the time limit for such reactions? To these questions there are and can be no answers. Equally little does this view explain why, for several centuries, the collective will is not withdrawn from certain rulers and their heirs, and then, suddenly during a period of fifty years, is transferred to the Convention, to the Directory, to Napoleon, to Alexander, to Louis the Eighteenth, to Napoleon again, to Charles the Tenth, to Louis Philippe, to a Republican government, and to Napoleon the Third. When explaining these rapid transfers of the people's will from one individual to another, especially in view of international relations, conquests, and alliances, the historians are obliged to admit that some of these transfers are not normal delegations of the people's will, but are accidents dependent on cunning, on mistakes, on craft, or on the weakness of a diplomatist, a ruler, or a party leader. So that the greater part of the events of history, civil wars, revolutions, and conquests, are presented by these historians not as the results of free transferences of the people's will, but as results of the ill-directed will of one or more individuals, that is, once again, as usurpations of power. And so these historians also see and admit historical events which are exceptions to the theory. These historians resemble a botanist, who, having noticed that some plants grow from seeds producing two cotyledons, should insist that all that grows does so by sprouting into two leaves, and that the palm, the mushroom, and even the oak, which blossom into full growth and no longer resemble two leaves, are deviations from the theory. Historians of the third class assume that the will of the people is transferred to historic personages conditionally, but that the conditions are unknown to us. They say that historical personages have power only because they fulfill the will of the people which has been delegated to them. But in that case, if the force that moves nations lies not in the historic leaders but in the nations themselves, 
what significance have those leaders? The leaders, these historians tell us, express the will of the people. The activity of the leaders represents the activity of the people. But in that case, the question arises whether all the activity of the leaders serves as an expression of the people's will, or only some part of it. If the whole activity of the leaders serves as the expression of the people's will, as some historians suppose, then all the details of the court scandals contained in the biographies of a Napoleon or a Catherine serve to express the life of the nation, which is evident nonsense. But if it is only some particular side of the activity of an historical leader which serves to express the people's life, as other so-called philosophical historians believe, then to determine which side of the activity of a leader expresses the nation's life, we have first of all to know in what the nation's life consists. Met by this difficulty, historians of that class devise some most obscure, impalpable, and general abstraction which can cover all conceivable occurrences, and declare this abstraction to be the aim of humanity's movement. The most usual generalizations adopted by almost all the historians are freedom, equality, enlightenment, progress, civilization, and culture. Postulating some generalization as the goal of the movement of humanity, the historians study the men of whom the greatest number of monuments have remained, kings, ministers, generals, authors, reformers, popes, and journalists, to the extent to which, in their opinion, these persons have promoted or hindered that abstraction. But, as it is in no way proved that the aim of humanity does consist in freedom, equality, enlightenment, or civilization, and as the connection of the people with the rulers and enlighteners of humanity is only based on the arbitrary assumption that the collective will of the people is always transferred to the men whom we have noticed, it happens that the activity of the millions who migrate, burn houses, abandon agriculture, and destroy one another, never is expressed in the account of the activity of some dozen people who did not burn houses, practice agriculture, or slay their fellow creatures. History proves this at every turn. Is the ferment of the peoples of the West at the end of the eighteenth century and their drive eastward explained by the activity of Louis the Fourteenth, Fifteenth, and Sixteenth, their mistresses and ministers, and by the lives of Napoleon, Rousseau, Diderot, Beaumarchais, and others? Is the movement of the Russian people eastward to Kazan and Siberia expressed by the details of the morbid character of Ivan the Terrible and by his correspondence with Kurbsky? Is the movement of the peoples of the time of the Crusades explained by the life and activity of the Godfreys and the Louise and their ladies? For us, that movement of the peoples from west to east, without leaders, with a crowd of vagrants, and with Peter the Hermit, remains incomprehensible. And yet more incomprehensible is the cessation of that movement when a rational and sacred aim for the Crusade, the deliverance of Jerusalem, had been clearly defined by historic leaders. Popes, kings, and knights incited the peoples to free the Holy Land. But the people did not go, for the unknown cause which had previously impelled them to go no longer existed. The history of the Godfreys and the Minnesingers can evidently not cover the life of the peoples. And the history of the Godfreys and the Menesingers has remained the history of the Godfreys and the Menesingers, but the history of the life of the peoples and their impulses has remained unknown. Still less does the history of authors and reformers explain to us the life of the peoples. The history of culture explains to us the impulses and conditions of life and thought of a writer or reformer. We learn that Luther had a hot temper and said such and such things. We learn that Rousseau was suspicious and wrote such and such books. But we do not learn why, after the Reformation, the peoples massacred one another nor why during the French Revolution they guillotined one another. If we unite both these kinds of history, as is done by the newest historians, we shall have the history of monarchs and writers, but not the history of the life of the peoples. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 4《Second Epilogue, Chapter 5 》of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Epilogue, Chapter 5 The life of the nations is not contained in the lives of a few men, for the connection between those men and the nations has not been found. The theory that this connection is based on the transference of the collective will of a people to certain historical personages is an hypothesis unconfirmed by the experience of history. The theory of the transference of the collective will of the people to historic persons may perhaps explain much in the domain of jurisprudence and be essential for its purposes, but in its application to history, as soon as revolutions, conquests, or civil wars occur, that is, as soon as history begins, that theory explains nothing. The theory seems irrefutable just because the act of transference of the people's will cannot be verified, for it never occurred. Whatever happens and whoever may stand at the head of affairs, the theory can always say that such and such a person took the lead because the collective will was transferred to him. The replies this theory gives to historical questions are like the replies of a man who, watching the movements of a herd of cattle, and paying no attention to the varying quality of the pasturage in different parts of the field, or to the drive of the herdsman, should attribute the direction the herd takes to what animal happens to be at its head. The herd goes in that direction because the animal in front leads it, and the collective will of all the other animals is vested in that leader. This is what historians of the first class say, those who assume the unconditional transference of the people's will. If the animals leading the herd change, this happens because the collective will of all the animals is transferred from one leader to another, according to whether the animal is or is not leading them in the direction selected by the whole herd. Such is the reply historians who assume that the collective will of the people is delegated to rulers under conditions which they regard as known. With this method of observation, it often happens that the observer, influenced by the direction he himself prefers, regards those as leaders who, owing to the people's change of direction, are no longer in front but on one side or even in the rear. If the animals in front are continually changing, and the direction of the whole herd is constantly altered. This is because, in order to follow a given direction, the animals transfer their will to the animals that have attracted our attention, and to study the movements of the herd we must watch the movements of all the prominent animals moving on all sides of the herd. So say the third class of historians who regard all historical persons, from monarchs to journalists, as the expression of their age. The theory of the transference of the will of the people to historic persons is merely a paraphrase, a restatement of the question in other words. What causes historical events? Power. What is power? Power is the collective will of the people transferred to one person. Under what condition is the will of the people delegated to one person? On condition that that person expresses the will of the whole people. That is, power is power. In other words, power is a word the meaning of which we do not understand. If the realm of human knowledge were confined to abstract reasoning, then, having subjected to criticism the explanation of power that juridical science gives us, humanity would conclude that power is merely a word and has no real existence. But to understand phenomena, Man has, besides abstract reasoning, experience by which he verifies his reflections. And experience tells us that power is not merely a word, but an actually existing phenomenon. Not to speak of the fact that no description of the collective activity of men can do without the conception of power, the existence of power is proved both by history and by observing contemporary events. Whenever an event occurs, a man appears, or men appear, by whose will the event seems to have taken place. Napoleon III issues a decree and the French go to Mexico. The King of Prussia and Bismarck issue decrees and an army enters Bohemia. Napoleon I issues a decree and an army enters Russia. Alexander I gives a command and the French submit to the Bourbons. Experience shows us that, whatever event occurs, it is always related to the will of one or of several men who have decreed it. The historians, in accord with the old habit of acknowledging divine intervention in human affairs, 
want to see the cause of events in the expression of the will of someone endowed with power, but that supposition is not confirmed either by reason or by experience. On the one side, reflection shows that the expression of a man's will, his words, are only part of the general activity expressed in an event, as, for instance, in a war or a revolution. And so, without assuming an incomprehensible supernatural force, a miracle, one cannot admit that words can be the immediate cause of the movements of millions of men. On the other hand, even if we admitted that words could be the cause of events, history shows that the expression of the will of historical personages does not in most cases produce any effect. That is to say, their commands are often not executed, and sometimes the very opposite of what they order occurs. Without admitting divine intervention in the affairs of humanity, we cannot regard power as the cause of events. Power, from the standpoint of experience, is merely the relation that exists between the expression of someone's will and the execution of that will by others. To explain the conditions of that relationship, we must first establish a conception of the expression of will, referring it to man and not to the deity. If the deity issues a command, expresses his will, as ancient history tells us, the expression of that will is independent of time, and is not caused by anything, for the divinity is not controlled by an event. But speaking of commands that are the expression of the will of men acting in time and in relation to one another, to explain the connection of commands with events we must restore, one, the condition of all that takes place, the continuity of movement in time both of the events and of the person who commands, and two, the inevitability of the connection between the person commanding and those who execute his command. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 5《Second Epilogue, Chapter 6, Of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Second Epilogue, Chapter 6 Only the expression of the will of the Deity, not dependent on time, can relate to a whole series of events occurring over a period of years or centuries and only the Deity, independent of everything, can by his sole will determine the direction of humanity's movement. But man acts in time and himself takes part in what occurs. Reinstating the first condition omitted, that of time, we see that no command can be executed without some preceding order having been given, rendering the execution of the last command possible. No command ever appears spontaneously or itself covers a whole series of occurrences. But each command follows from another, and never refers to a whole series of events, but always to one moment only of an event. When, for instance, we say that Napoleon ordered armies to go to war, we combine in one simultaneous expression a whole series of consecutive commands dependent on one another. Napoleon could not have commanded an invasion of Russia, and never did so. Today he ordered such and such papers to be written to Vienna, to Berlin, and to Petersburg. Tomorrow such and such decrees and orders to the army, the fleet, the commissariat, and so on and so on. Millions of commands, which formed a whole series corresponding to a series of events which brought the French armies into Russia. If throughout his reign Napoleon gave commands concerning an invasion of England, and expended on no other undertaking so much time and effort, and yet, during his whole reign, never once attempted to execute that design, but undertook an expedition into Russia, with which country he considered it desirable to be in alliance, a conviction he repeatedly expressed, this came about because his commands did not correspond to the course of events in the first case, but did so correspond in the latter. For an order to be certainly executed, it is necessary that a man should order what can be executed but to know what can and what cannot be executed is impossible, not only in the case of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, in which millions participated, but even in the simplest event, for in either case millions of obstacles may arise to prevent its execution. Every order executed is always one of an immense number unexecuted. 
all the impossible orders inconsistent with the course of events remain unexecuted. Only the possible ones get linked up with a consecutive series of commands corresponding to a series of events and are executed. Our false conception that an event is caused by a command which precedes it is due to the fact that when the event has taken place, and out of thousands of others those few commands which were consistent with that event have been executed, we forget about the others that were not executed because they could not be. Apart from that, the chief source of our error in this matter is due to the fact that, in the historical accounts, a whole series of innumerable, diverse, and petty events, such, for instance, as all those which led the French armies to Russia, is generalized into one event, in accord with the result produced by that series of events, and corresponding with this generalization, the whole series of commands is also generalized into a single expression of will. We say that Napoleon wished to invade Russia and invaded it. In reality, in all Napoleon's activity we never find anything resembling an expression of that wish, but find a series of orders, or expressions of his will, very variously and indefinitely directed. Amid a long series of unexecuted orders of Napoleon's one series, for the campaign of 1812, was carried out, not because those orders differed in any way from the other unexecuted orders, but because they coincided with the course of events that led the French army into Russia. Just as in stencil work, this or that figure comes out not because the color was laid on from this side or in that way, but because it was laid on from all sides over the figure cut in the stencil. So that examining the relation in time of the commands to the events, we find that a command can never be the cause of the event, but that a certain definite dependence exists between the two. To understand in what this dependence consists, it is necessary to reinstate another omitted condition of every command proceeding not from the deity but from a man, which is that the man who gives the command himself takes part in the event. This relation of the commander to those he commands is just what is called power. This relation consists in the following. For common action, people always unite in certain combinations, in which, regardless of the difference of the aim set for the common action, the relation between those taking part in it is always the same. Men uniting in these combinations always assume such relations toward one another that the larger number take a more direct share, and the smaller number a less direct share, in the collective action for which they have combined. Of all the combinations in which men unite for collective action, one of the most striking and definite examples is an army. Every army is composed of lower grades of the service, the rank and file, of whom there are always the greatest number. Of the next higher military rank, corporals and non-commissioned officers, of whom there are fewer, and of still higher officers, of whom there are still fewer, and so on to the highest military command which is concentrated in one person. A military organization may be quite correctly compared to a cone, of which the base with the largest diameter consists of the rank and file. The next higher and smaller section of the cone consists of the next higher grades of the army, and so on to the apex, the point of which will represent the commander-in-chief. The soldiers, of whom there are the most, form the lower section of the cone and its base. The soldier himself does the stabbing, hacking, burning, and pillaging, and always receives orders for these actions from men above him. He himself never gives an order. The non-commissioned officers, of whom there are fewer, perform the action itself less frequently than the soldiers, but they already give commands. An officer still less often acts directly himself, but commands still more frequently. A general does nothing but command the troops, indicates the objective, and hardly ever uses a weapon himself. The commander-in-chief never takes direct part in the action itself, but only gives general orders concerning the movement of the mass of the troops. A similar relation of people to one another is seen in every combination of men for common activity, in agriculture, trade, and every administration. And so, without particularly analyzing all the contiguous sections of a cone and of the ranks of an army, or the ranks and positions in any administrative or public business whatever, from the lowest to the highest, we see a law by which men, 
to take associated action, combined in such relations that the more directly they participate in performing the action, the less they can command, and the more numerous they are, while the less their direct participation in the action itself, the more they command, and the fewer of them there are. Rising in this way from the lowest ranks to the man at the top, who takes the least direct share in the action and directs his activity chiefly to commanding. This relation of the men who command to those they command is what constitutes the essence of the conception called power. Having restored the condition of time under which all events occur, we find that a command is executed only when it is related to a corresponding series of events. Restoring the essential condition of relation between those who command and those who execute, we find that, by the very nature of the case, those who command take the smallest part in the action itself, and that their activity is exclusively directed to commanding. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 6of War and Peace, Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Epilogue, Chapter 7 When an event is taking place, people express their opinions and wishes about it, and as the event results from the collective activity of many people, some one of the opinions or wishes expressed is sure to be fulfilled, if but approximately. When one of the opinions expressed is fulfilled, that opinion gets connected with the event as a command preceding it. Men are hauling a log. Each of them expresses his opinion as to how and where to haul it. They haul the log away, and it happens that this is done as one of them said. He ordered it. There we have command and power in their primary form. The man who worked most with his hands could not think so much about what he was doing, or reflect on or command what would result from the common activity, while the man who commanded more would evidently work less with his hands, on account of his greater verbal activity. When some larger concourse of men direct their activity to a common aim, there is a yet sharper division of those who, because their activity is given to directing and commanding, take less part in the direct work. When a man works alone, he always has a certain set of reflections which, as it seems to him, directed his past activity, justify his present activity, and guide him in planning his future actions. Just the same is done by a concourse of people, allowing those who do not take a direct part in the activity to devise considerations, justifications, and surmises concerning their collective activity. For reasons known or unknown to us, the French began to drown and kill one another. And, corresponding to the event, its justification appears in people's belief that this was necessary for the welfare of France, for liberty, and for equality. People ceased to kill one another, and this event was accompanied by its justification in the necessity for a centralization of power, resistance to Europe, and so on. Men went from the west to the east killing their fellow men and the event was accompanied by phrases about the glory of France, the baseness of England, and so on. History shows us that these justifications of the events have no common sense, and are all contradictory, as in the case of killing a man as the result of recognizing his rights, and the killing of millions in Russia for the humiliation of England. But these justifications have a very necessary significance in their own day. These justifications release those who produce the events from moral responsibility. These temporary aims are like the broom fixed in front of a locomotive to clear the snow from the rails in front. They clear the men's moral responsibilities from their path. Without such justification, there would be no reply to the simplest question that presents itself when examining each historical event. How is it that millions of men commit collective crimes, make war, commit murder, and so on? With the present complex forms of political and social life in Europe, can any event that is not prescribed, decreed, or ordered by monarchs, ministers, parliaments, or newspapers be imagined? Is there any collective action which cannot find its justification in political unity, in patriotism, in the balance of power, or in civilization? 
so that every event that occurs inevitably coincides with some expressed wish, and receiving a justification presents itself as the result of the will of one man or of several men. In whatever direction a ship moves, the flow of the waves it cuts will always be noticeable ahead of it. To those on board the ship, the movement of those waves will be the only perceptible motion. Only by watching closely, moment by moment, the movement of that flow and comparing it with the movement of the ship, do we convince ourselves that every bit of it is occasioned by the forward movement of the ship, and that we were led into error by the fact that we ourselves were imperceptibly moving. We see the same if we watch moment by moment the movement of historical characters, that is, re-establish the inevitable condition of all that occurs, the continuity of movement in time and do not lose sight of the essential connection of historical persons with the masses. When the ship moves in one direction, there is one and the same wave ahead of it. When it turns, frequently the wave ahead of it also turns frequently. But wherever it may turn, there always will be the wave anticipating its movement. Whatever happens, it always appears that just that event was foreseen and decreed. Wherever the ship may go, the rush of water which neither directs nor increases its movement foams ahead of it, and at a distance seems to us not merely to move of itself, but to govern the ship's movement also. Examining only those expressions of the will of historical persons which as commands were related to events, historians have assumed that the events depended on those commands. But examining the events themselves and the connection in which the historical person stood to the people, we have found that they and their orders were dependent on events. The incontestable proof of this deduction is that, however many commands were issued, the event does not take place unless there are other causes for it, but as soon as an event occurs, be it what it may, then out of all the continually expressed wishes of different people, some will always be found which by their meaning and their time of utterance are related as commands to the events. Arriving at this conclusion, we can reply directly and positively to those two essential questions of history. 1. What is power? 2. What force produces the movement of the nations? 1. Power is the relation of a given person to other individuals, in which the more this person expresses opinions, predictions, and justifications of the collective action that is performed, the less is his participation in that action. 2. The movement of nations is caused not by power, nor by intellectual activity, nor even by a combination of the two as historians have supposed, but by the activity of all the people who participate in the events, and who always combine in such a way that those taking the largest share in the event take on themselves the least responsibility and vice versa. Morally, the wielder of power appears to cause the event. Physically, it is those who submit to the power. But as the moral activity is inconceivable without the physical, the cause of the event is neither in the one nor in the other, but in the union of the two. Or, in other words, the conception of a cause is inapplicable to the phenomena we are examining. In the last analysis, we reach the circle of infinity, that final limit to which in every domain of thought man's reason arrives if it is not playing with the subject. Electricity produces heat heat produces electricity, atoms attract each other, and atoms repel one another. Speaking of the interaction of heat and electricity and of atoms, we cannot say why this occurs, and we say that it is so because it is inconceivable otherwise, because it must be so, and that it is a law. The same applies to historical events. Why war and revolution occur we do not know. We only know that, to produce the one or the other action, people combine in a certain formation in which they all take part, and we say that this is so because it is unthinkable otherwise, or in other words, that it is a law. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 7《Second Epilogue, Chapter 8 Of War and Peace Volume 4, by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Elmer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second Epilogue, Chapter 8
If history dealt only with external phenomena, the establishment of this simple and obvious law would suffice, and we should have finished our argument. But the law of history relates to man. A particle of matter cannot tell us that it does not feel the law of attraction or repulsion, and that that law is untrue. But man, who is the subject of our history, says plainly, I am free and am therefore not subject to the law. The presence of the problem of man's free will, though unexpressed, is felt at every step of history. All seriously thinking historians have involuntarily encountered this question. All the contradictions and obscurities of history and the false path historical science has followed are due solely to the lack of a solution of that question. If the will of every man were free, that is, if each man could act as he pleased, all history would be a series of disconnected incidents. If in a thousand years even one man in a million could act freely, that is, as he chose, it is evident that one single free act of that man's in violation of the laws governing human action would destroy the possibility of the existence of any laws for the whole of humanity. If there be a single law governing the actions of men, free will cannot exist, for then man's will is subject to that law. In this contradiction lies the problem of free will, which from most ancient times has occupied the best human minds, and from most ancient times has been presented in its whole tremendous significance. The problem is that, regarding man as a subject of observation from whatever point of view, theological, historical, ethical, or philosophic, we find a general law of necessity to which he, like all that exists, is subject. But regarding him from within ourselves, as what we are conscious of, we feel ourselves to be free. This consciousness is a source of self-cognition quite apart from and independent of reason. Through his reason man observes himself, but only through consciousness does he know himself. Apart from consciousness of self, no observation or application of reason is conceivable. To understand, observe, and draw conclusions, man must first of all be conscious of himself as living. A man is only conscious of himself as a living being by the fact that he wills, that is, is conscious of his volition. But his will, which forms the essence of his life, man recognizes and can but recognize as free. If, observing himself, man sees that his will is always directed by one and the same law, whether he observes the necessity of taking food, using his brain, or anything else, he cannot recognize this never-varying direction of his will otherwise than as a limitation of it. Were it not free, it could not be limited. A man's will seems to him to be limited just because he is not conscious of it except as free. You say, I am not free but I have lifted my hand and let it fall. Everyone understands that this illogical reply is an irrefutable demonstration of freedom. That reply is the expression of a consciousness that is not subject to reason. If the consciousness of freedom were not a separate and independent source of self-consciousness, it would be subject to reasoning and to experience. But in fact, such subjection does not exist and is inconceivable. A series of experiments and arguments proves to every man that he, as an object of observation, is subject to certain laws, and man submits to them and never resists the laws of gravity or impermeability once he has become acquainted with them. But the same series of experiments and arguments proves to him that the complete freedom of which he is conscious in himself is impossible and that his every action depends on his organization, his character, and the motives acting upon him. Yet man never submits to the deductions of these experiments and arguments. Having learned from experiment and argument that a stone falls downwards, a man indubitably believes this and always expects the law that he has learned to be fulfilled. But learning just as certainly that his will is subject to laws, he does not and cannot believe this. However often experiment and reasoning may show a man that, under the same conditions and with the same character, he will do the same thing as before, yet when under the same conditions and with the same character, he approaches for the thousandth time the action that always ends in the same way, 
he feels as certainly convinced as before the experiment that he can act as he pleases. Every man, savage or sage, however incontestably reason and experiment may prove to him that it is impossible to imagine two different courses of action in precisely the same conditions, feels that without this irrational conception, which constitutes the essence of freedom, he cannot imagine life. He feels that, however impossible it may be, it is so. For without this conception of freedom, not only would he be unable to understand life, but he would be unable to live for a single moment. He could not live because all man's efforts, all his impulses to life, are only efforts to increase freedom. Wealth and poverty, fame and obscurity, power and subordination, strength and weakness, health and disease, culture and ignorance, work and leisure, repletion and hunger, virtue and vice, are only greater or lesser degrees of freedom. A man having no freedom cannot be conceived of except as deprived of life. If the conception of freedom appears to reason to be a senseless contradiction, like the possibility of performing two actions at one and the same instant of time, or of an effect without a cause, that only proves that consciousness is not subject to reason. This unshakable, irrefutable consciousness of freedom, uncontrolled by experiment or argument, recognized by all thinkers and felt by everyone without exception, this consciousness, without which no conception of man is possible, constitutes the other side of the question. Man is the creation of an all-powerful, all-good, and all-seeing God. What is sin, the conception of which arises from the consciousness of man's freedom? That is a question for theology. The actions of men are subject to general immutable laws expressed in statistics. What is man's responsibility to society, the conception of which results from the conception of freedom? That is a question for jurisprudence. Man's actions proceed from his innate character and the motives acting upon him. What is conscience and the perception of right and wrong in actions that follows from the consciousness of freedom? That is a question for ethics. Man, in connection with the general life of humanity, appears subject to laws which determine that life. But the same man, apart from that connection, appears to be free. How should the past life of nations and of humanity be regarded? As the result of the free, or as the result of the constrained activity of man? That is a question for history. Only in our self-confident day of the popularization of knowledge, thanks to that most powerful engine of ignorance, the diffusion of printed matter, has the question of the freedom of will been put on a level on which the question itself cannot exist. In our time, the majority of the so-called advanced people, that is, the crowd of ignoramuses, have taken the work of the naturalists who deal with one side of the question for a solution of the whole problem. They say and write and print that the soul and freedom do not exist, for the life of man is expressed by muscular movements, and muscular movements are conditioned by the activity of the nerves. The soul and free will do not exist because at an unknown period of time we sprang from the apes. They say this, not at all suspecting that thousands of years ago, that same law of necessity, which with such ardor they are now trying to prove by physiology and comparative zoology, was not merely acknowledged by all the religions and all the thinkers, but has never been denied. They do not see that the role of the natural sciences in this matter is merely to serve as an instrument for the illumination of one side of it. For the fact that, from the point of view of observation, reason and the will are merely secretions of the brain, and that man following the general law may have developed from lower animals at some unknown period of time, only explains from a fresh side the truth admitted thousands of years ago by all the religious and philosophic theories, that, from the point of view of reason, man is subject to the law of necessity. But it does not advance by a hair's breadth the solution of the question, which has another, opposite side based on the consciousness of freedom. If men descended from the apes at an unknown period of time, that is as comprehensible as that they were made from a handful of earth at a certain period of time. In the first case, the unknown quantity is the time, in the second case it is the origin. 
and the question of how man's consciousness of freedom is to be reconciled with the law of necessity to which he is subject, cannot be solved by comparative physiology and zoology. For in a frog, a rabbit, or an ape, we can observe only the muscular nervous activity. But in man, we observe consciousness as well as the muscular and nervous activity. The naturalists and their followers, thinking they can solve this question, are like plasterers set to plaster one side of the walls of a church, who, availing themselves of the absence of the chief superintendent of the work, should, in an access of zeal, plaster over the windows, icons, woodwork, and still unbuttressed walls, and should be delighted that from their point of view as plasterers everything is now so smooth and regular. End of Second Epilogue, Chapter 8